the scary stories will start in 30 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my channel. I promise, there will always be minimal ads in my videos. And in this video, there is only three mid-roll ads. Your experience with my videos is what's most important to me, and I stand by my minimal ad promise. So again, if you enjoy my videos, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It helps me so much. Now, let's begin. I was 17 when this occurred. I have never seen a horror movie that was as scary as what happened to me on this night. It was late, after midnight. My dad and stepmother were asleep. While playing online games, I decided to visit the kitchen to get some water. The house was dark, which wasn't unusual, but walking through a dark house is never that much fun. Our faucet had a nice water filter installed and the tap water that went through it actually tasted really good, like Fiji bottled water. I stood at the faucet, filling my huge glass. The window directly in front of me overlooked our huge backyard, and directly behind our backyard was a church. The only thing separating them was an old wooden fence that was just about to fall down when the next big storm hit. As my glass filled with water, I scanned the backyard, always paranoid that I might see something. A few times I did see something, but it was always just a cat, just a random cat from our neighborhood. Well, this night I saw something else, not a cat. I saw a woman standing with her back to the fence on the far side of my backyard. All she was doing was looking up at me. Now, honestly, the terror that came over me was far beyond what you might expect in this situation. After focusing my eyes, I saw that she was looking at me, but from that distance, I can't be 100% sure. But she looked as if she had been caught, the way she stood with her back to the fence, almost like she was hoping her stance and her non-movement would hide her. She had long brown hair, looked to be at least 50 years old, and was wearing some kind of nightgown. I froze looking at her, no rational thought entering my mind for at least 30 seconds. Then, she started slowly walking towards me. Her steps were very slow, like she was walking on eggshells. The only thing that entered my mind after I saw this was my dad. I turned around and ran up to his bedroom. I knocked on the door, determined, and I heard him and my stepmom move around in bed. My dad's groggy voice was then heard. What? I said through the door, there's a woman in our backyard, I'm not joking. He could hear the fear in my voice and was leading me to the kitchen seconds later. As he looked out the window in the kitchen, he saw nothing. She was gone. He did believe me, because like I said, my voice was proof enough. I was not messing around. He went into the backyard with his flashlight and again found nothing. He asked what she was wearing. Was she stealing stuff? But I had little answers for him. A while later, we both went back to our rooms. He probably fell right back to sleep but I laid in my dark bedroom for hours thinking of the possibilities. Maybe she would open my bedroom door at any second. Maybe she was about to murder my parents. Maybe this. Maybe that. Nothing happened. About a week or so later, my dad was driving me to school. And imagine my utter shock. We see the woman walking on the sidewalk a few blocks down with some man. After telling my dad that I was freaking positive that it was her, he turned around and pulled up next to her. He got out of his car, and the woman and man stopped to face him. I heard my dad say, Were you in my backyard a few nights ago? The woman looked at him like he was insane. The man that was with her did the same. 
My dad then told her everything that I had said, and she swore up and down that we made a mistake. I am telling you right now, with nothing to gain from lying, this was her. The woman was in my backyard at like one in the morning. We never saw her again. This is easily the weirdest thing that has ever happened in my life. I think about it often. Every single time I watch or hear about anything even remotely scary or creepy, I see her standing against my fence, her eyes wide, looking into mine. Throughout my life, I have seen this figure no matter where I go. It never really scared me. I just found it creepy until today. I am 18 years old, and due to the virus, we have resorted to staying inside. My sleep schedule has changed immensely over the past few weeks, in which I stay up until 4 a.m., wake up around 1 p.m., and then take a few naps throughout the day. Today I had decided to be a bit more productive, working out, and cleaning to keep from being bored and going crazy. After doing a few things around the house, I decided to treat myself to a nap. So off I went into my room, closed the curtains, and I laid in bed. While sleeping, I began to dream about my mom and I getting into a huge fight out front of our home. My mom's dog was outside with us, while my dog was inside watching us with the door halfway open. I suddenly turned around to look at my dog, and saw the figure behind her getting closer and closer to her. I tried going inside to get her, but the door was slammed in my face. Now this might not seem scary to a lot of people, but my dog has gotten me through so many hard times. I used to be suicidal, and have suffered with anorexia and body dysmorphia throughout my life, so the thought of one thing I love the most being hurt kills me, and it tears me up inside. I suddenly woke, but it was so weird. I could look around the room, but I couldn't feel my eyes open, and I couldn't blink. My body felt like a mixture of numbness and not being there. It felt like my bed was swallowing me, and my skin was super glued in place. I don't know how else to describe the terror that I felt. While frantically looking around my room, my eyes were frozen on one corner. I couldn't move my eyes into another direction. The more I looked, the more my vision was able to make out this figure. It's almost like it could sense my fear and was feeding off of it, because it started to get bigger. All I could make out was its face was white, and it had a sharp smirk on its face. The bigger it got, the more the walls caved in. I tried moving so much, and was putting all my strength into at least being able to scream for help, as I knew my mom was in the room next to me. I couldn't talk. I never felt more helpless in my life. The numbness in my body was getting stronger. It was two feet away from my bed, when I was finally able to crawl out from my bed. I don't know why, but I struggled so much just to be able to wrap my hand around the doorknob and get out of the room. The only way I am able to describe sleep paralysis is like feeling like you are a part of your bed and knowing something is out to get you, and the rest is nothing you can do because you are a part of the bed and beds don't move. I apologize if this doesn't sound like a good explanation, but I just had to get this off my chest because I really don't want to go back to sleep tonight. This happened when I was about 12 years old. My parents had dropped me and my brother off at home. Since my parents had to go somewhere, they had opened up the garage so that we could go through the back door. However, we found that the back door was locked. That wasn't surprising seeing as my family had been out of town the week prior. Neither my brother or I had a phone at the time, so we went to the neighbor's house to see if we could borrow his phone. He didn't answer when I knocked, which I suppose was not out of the norm because he was a doctor and was usually out of town. 
My brother and I ended up waiting until my parents got home later. A policeman came by our house a few days later. We ended up finding out that the reason our neighbor hadn't answered the door wasn't because he was out of town. It was because somebody stabbed him to death. There was a huge investigation. The details are fuzzy, seeing that this happened a good five years ago, but I do remember that they did end up catching the guy who killed him. I don't remember his name, though. My family and I still live in the same house, and we've recently gotten some new neighbors. It's a real shame what happened to our original neighbor, because he was a really nice man. What really bothers me is not knowing if the new neighbors know that somebody was brutally stabbed to death in their house. I don't feel it's my place to tell them. My name is Jason. I work in a local clothing store. We basically sell stuff that people think is really fancy, but it's basically the same stuff you can find at any clothing store. Even places like Walmart or Goodwill sometimes. I've had this job for about two years now, and while it isn't the greatest, a job is a job. I get to earn enough money to be able to have some independence from my parents, which is really nice. The story took place in the winter of last year. It was a good while after Christmas, but I don't remember exactly when it happened. I just remember there being snow on the ground the next morning after it all went down. So, I work pretty unusual hours for a college student. I know I'm technically a full-time student, but it doesn't feel like I have a whole lot of classes. Maybe I picked an easy major, or maybe I'm a genius. Who knows? But I don't really study, and I barely do the homework, and I still manage to get pretty good grades. On this day, I remember there being a very strange-looking man that started coming in the store. He didn't seem like the usual kind of customer that we would get. Most of the people that shop at the store are at least upper middle class. I don't mean to say that they were rich or anything, but if you have enough money to buy expensive clothes, I'm talking like $50 for a t-shirt, then you're probably doing pretty well for yourself. But not this guy. This guy looked like he was two steps away from being homeless. He had this really pale hair. Most of it was covered under a dingy black hat, and you could only see this white hair as it stuck out from a few places under the hat. He was an older guy, but not too old, probably around 50 years old. But judging by how much of a weirdo he was, I guess I can't really be all that sure. He started coming in every single day, and he always bought something. It was not always something big. Sometimes it was a $70 pair of pants. Other times it was a really expensive watch. However, with as much stuff as he bought, he never seemed to wear any of it. At least not from any of the times I've ever seen him. He always dressed in a baggy sweatshirt or really old worn out overalls with a denim jacket on top. And the denim jacket had cuts and holes and looked really weird because his overalls would be denim too. I don't know if he thought that it went well as an outfit but I wasn't about to tell this guy that he dressed stupidly. After all, I did get a commission for everything that I sold in the store. However much of a creep that he may have been, I will gladly welcome his business. I know the really weird thing I noticed about him was that he never actually tried on the clothes that he was buying. Like, ever. He would spend 40 minutes analyzing a pair of pants, hold it in front of himself in the mirror, feel the texture, and try to look at it from different points of view, but he would never actually go into the dressing room and try them on. I thought that was the weirdest thing of all. I also remember the couple of times he wouldn't buy the item that he had been looking at, and there would always be this really musky smell to them. I know this may sound weird, but out of morbid curiosity, I would smell clothes after people tried them on after the store had closed. I can't really smell much otherwise, like I had seen this guy at least 20 different times, and never got a smell of him. But whenever I did smell the clothes that he had been looking at, I could smell some strange combination of body odor and smoke. 
I got really curious about what he does when he isn't randomly buying clothes at an expensive and overpriced store like this one. There was also this one time that he came into the store and specifically asked for me. I thought that was pretty weird, considering that he had never really struck up a conversation with me or anything. Of all the times I had interacted with him, it was always on a very formal basis, and we both said the bare minimum necessary. It was obvious that he didn't like coming to the store, and I found myself drawing a blank coming up with reasons as to why he kept on doing it. I didn't think too much of it though. I was a college student, and anything outside of chilling with my friends and getting my assignments done didn't really matter all that much to me. I remember this one night that I was doing laundry. I normally hate doing laundry, but I specifically remember putting my clothes into the washing machine. I got a whiff of one of my sweatshirts that I had thought smelled really weird. I smelled my sweatshirt again, and I knew immediately what the smell was. It was that same body odor smoke smell that came from that man. The next day I was working my shift as usual, and here comes in the same old guy. This time he was checking out a pair of shoes. It was a pair of Crocs. I didn't understand why we had Crocs in the store in the first place. They were exactly the same ones that you could get at Walmart, except for the fact that we charged $60 for them instead of 15 Well, this guy spent about 45 minutes looking at this pair of Crocs before he decided it was time to head out. He came up to my register and took an unusually long period of time to pay for his Crocs. It wasn't until he was reaching for his wallet and paying that I remembered something. I totally forgot that I don't wear my sweatshirt at work. It's against the rules. You have to dress kind of nice, which normally meant like a polo shirt or a decent dress shirt. Something that you could throw a vest over and look like a halfway decently dressed representative of a fashion store. It got me on this whole train of thought that made me realize that my sweatshirt didn't smell that way because I was spending too much time with this weird guy. He must have somehow gotten a hold of my sweatshirt on his own accord. I remember my heart falling into the pit of my stomach when I made the realization. I felt myself turn red and started to sweat. However, freaked out as I became, he took no notice. Just kept paying for his goofy pair of green Crocs. If you ever smelled the smell I'm talking about, you would understand just how distinct it really was. I mean, there was nothing in the world like it. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there was a good possibility that this guy was creeping on me somehow, maybe even getting into my house. I quit my job that day, on the spot. I didn't want to put myself in jeopardy for a goofy retail job, especially because that guy showed no sign of ever slowing down. He was there every single day that I worked. A couple weeks after the incident, I asked some of my former co-workers if they had noticed if the guy was still coming in. They told me that they don't remember exactly when, but he stopped coming in right about the time I stopped working there. This only made me more paranoid about the whole situation. I have developed a couple of possible theories as to what exactly was going on with this guy, but none of them really make any sense. I've tried telling a couple of my family members about it, but they all think that I'm just trolling them. To this day, I still have not figured out what exactly happened, and I'm honestly kind of worried that I will never know what this creepy guy at the retail story was doing there every day, or why he stopped going after I quit. This took place in late 2016. It was a dark December evening, winter break from school. My then girlfriend Liz and I were cuddled up on the couch watching Christmas movies on Netflix with my two young nephews, five years old and ten months at the time. My mother was at work and my girlfriend's mom was running errands. My little sister was at an after school center across the street from our house. The movie we were watching I think was Elf and it was still playing. I was getting really bored from it and got up to get a drink. Before I got to the refrigerator, 
the doorbell rang. I walked into the living room and looked through the peephole on the front door. I see a man, about mid-forties, and dressed in a dark brown winter coat. I asked who it was. It's Vince from down the street. Can I come in? I opened the door. Luckily, our screen door was locked, so he couldn't get in. Uh, my mom isn't here. What do you need? I asked as politely as I could. Your mom wanted me to clean the gutters. She promised to pay me. Can I come in? I shook my head. Why would my mom want a man to clean the gutters when she has me? More so, why would she want him to do it at a time like this? My mom isn't home. She'll be back later, I said. The man groaned lightly in irritation. Well, can you call her? Sorry, my phone is dead, I lied. He nodded without another word and turned. To leave, I assumed. I closed the door and sat back down. Not two minutes later, another knock was at the door. I went to look through the peephole and was unable to see anyone. Who is it? I called out. It's me, my little sister said. The program must have been over. I opened the door and almost jumped out of my skin. The man was standing right behind my sister. I quickly unlocked the screen door and hurried my sister inside. He tried to get in, but I shut and locked both doors just in time. I asked her if she was okay. Yeah, but that man keeps asking where mom is. I felt my stomach drop. Why is this guy so persistent? My sister started to call my mom to tell her, but then the lights shut off. It made us all let out a gasp. Also freaked us out more than before. Her phone then died as soon as she pressed the call button. Weird, since her battery wasn't even close to dead. Not long after that, the movie was over, and my oldest nephew was asleep. I was trying to get the baby boy to sleep when my girlfriend's mom came through the door. She looked weirded out. Mom, what's wrong? Liz asked. The man outside tried to get into the car with me. Hearing that made my heart stop. I gave my nephew to my girlfriend and looked out the window. He was standing by our mailbox, looking at me. At this point, I bet you're guessing I called the police, right? Wrong. I just stared at him. This next part haunts my nightmares to this day. He gave me a wide, open mouth grin and widened his eyes. I never told my girlfriend this because I didn't want to scare her. My breathing was heavy at this point. He then turned around slowly and walked down the street. I never heard from him again. To most, that doesn't seem scary at all, but I bet if a man you never seen before knocked on your door and tried to come in, asking countless times for your mother on a freezing December night, you'll be scared shitless too. I told my mom about the man when she got home, and she looked at me crazy. I don't know any Vince from around this area. We used to live in a small two-bedroom apartment, and my four-year-old son would sometimes get scared and sleep in my room. One morning I was waking up, but still in bed and groggy. I saw a man from the back in what looked like a black jacket walking from our closet and exiting the bedroom. I was convinced that I was dreaming, so I tried to go back to sleep. My son, who was awake by then, said, Mom, you're here. I looked at him and said, Of course I am. Where else would I be? Then who was that walking out of the room? My son said. I ran out to the living room to see if someone was there but no one was. The door was completely unlocked. I looked out in the hall, and no one was there. I thought that maybe it was a maintenance man who let themselves in, but they had a strict policy that I would have to let the maintenance man in to do any work, so that was an unlikely explanation. I never found out who it was. I had a good childhood for the most part. I grew up in a neighborhood that had plenty of kids my age to play with. 
there was a lake with a rope swing for hot summer days. Growing up in Florida, a shady, cool lake was a welcome reprieve. My grandma even lived next door to us, and it was nice having her close by. When I was 12, things started to take a sinister turn. The first thing I remember happening was one night I was laying in my bed watching TV, and my closet door swung open, hit the wall, and then slammed shut. I ran to the living room where my parents were, and in tears, told them what had just happened. As parents sometimes don't, they didn't believe me. That night as I tried to fall asleep I heard something bang on our utility room door. It sounded like something was trying to break it down. Real quick, let me give you the setup of my house. It was basically a long hallway with rooms off of either side. You could stand at the front door and see the back door. My dad added a utility room workshop when I was about eight and it made the house look huge. The actual living area was really small though. Because of how small the house was, I heard the banging loud and clear. I screamed for my parents and they both came running in my room. I told them what I heard and my dad went out to check it out while my mom tried to calm me down. My dad found nothing and I ended up sleeping in their room that night. After that, the activity in the house really picked up. We would find things completely out of place. Car keys would be in the kitchen. A vase that was on the bookshelf in the living room would be in the bathroom. Just objects out of place everywhere. This was also when I started seeing a black figure at my bedroom door. At first it would just stand there and stare into my room. I told my mom about it and she said I must have been dreaming. I was not dreaming. I was wide awake. Soon the figure started coming into my room, closer and closer to my bed. It was terrifying. One night I got up the nerve to try to run past it. It didn't touch me that I could see, but I was pushed back onto my bed with such force that my head hit the wall between my room and my parents' room. My mom came rushing in to see what happened, and I told her. She looked at me with concern and told me to just come sleep in their room. I continued to see this figure at least three times a week until I was like 15. One day I had had enough, and I went to talk to my grandma. I just told her what I had seen and described what it looked like. She had said that she thought it was my grandfather, her husband. She told me that he had been an abusive drunk, getting his thrills from scaring his children, and being physically abusive to her. I asked why she didn't leave him, and she said that she tried twice. The first time he found her at her sister's house alone, and threatened to kill her if she tried it again. The second time he found her, and she said that he almost did kill her. She wouldn't go into how, though. After I talked to her, the activity stopped. Just like that. No more. I never saw the figure again. When I was 21, my mom died of brain cancer. The activity picked up again. One day I was playing PlayStation in my room, and I smelled her perfume. Lady in white. It was her favorite. Once again, items around the house would go missing and would be found later in weird places like the bathroom closet. I worked overnights, and one morning I came home to find my mother in the kitchen, in the dress that she had been buried in. Just standing there. She was looking right at me. She smiled, and then was gone. I continued to live with my dad, and when I was 24, started dating the girl that I am now married to. One evening I got off work at 10 p.m., and we decided to go out. She came to my house to pick me up, and as I was getting my stuff together, we were standing in the living room. She said, What the hell is that? I looked up, and on the ceiling, there were brightly colored circles going in a circle right above our heads. Remember the door I heard pounding on? Well, while we were looking at the circles dancing around, that door fell. Just fell right off the hinges that had held it in place for 16 years and landed right in the middle of the hallway. We walked over to the door and just stood there staring at it, and then we got the hell out of there. 
My dad had been on a business trip, and when he came home, I told him what happened. I could tell that he really didn't believe me, but considering that I wasn't the partying type, or someone who just took doors off hinges, he didn't really know what else to think. He put the door back up on the same hinges, all the while muttering that he didn't see how it could have just fallen off. After that, my girlfriend's cousin had gotten married, and quite a bit of her family had come for the wedding. Two of her cousins that hadn't seen her in years ended up coming back to my house with the two of us, and we had some drinks, listened to music, and just had our own little party. Her cousin Terry had to use the bathroom, and when he came back, he asked if we recently had the bathroom redone. We had, but there was no way that he could have known that. He started walking around the house and was saying things like, That end table used to be in that corner, didn't it? When he got to my parents' room, he said, Your mom or a motherly figure is in here. He then described her to a T. At this time, my dad and I had pretty much packed up her pictures, and there were none of my mom out anywhere that he could have seen. He described my mother sleeping with a knife in her bed, which was believable since she and my dad had a pretty hostile relationship when he drank too much. He also described what our kitchen had looked like before we had it redone. Still no clue how he knew all of this. One night my girlfriend stayed the night at my home when my dad was on a business trip, and since it was bigger, we slept in my parents' bed. At about 4 a.m. she woke me up, completely petrified, and told me that she just saw my mom standing by the closet. Another time my girlfriend was sick and left work early. She came to my house and I went to go get her medicine. When I got back, she was asleep on the couch covered with a quilt. I just assumed that she had gotten it off my bed. When she finally woke up, I gave her the medicine and she thanked me for covering her up. I told her that I didn't do that and she said that she certainly did not. I have lived in four different places since that time and in each of those places, something weird has always happened. I don't know if it's attached to me, or if I just happen to get all of the weirdo houses. This was back in the early 2000s. I was employed working a second job as a Sears delivery and setup driver. I actually worked with my cousin Michael, whom was two years older than me. He helped me actually get the job. This was back when Sears was delivering and assisting in setup of appliances such as washer and dryers, air conditioners, and such. My cousin was mainly the driver, and I was the guy helping to unload the appliances and assist him in setting anything up, getting the delivery signed off, etc. This particular Sears was in our hometown, and I actually could walk to the store location from my apartment at the time. If memory recalls correctly, this particular day was a Friday, and we started delivering around 8 a.m. We had a certified work truck, a 2005 Ford F-150, fantastic for any terrain. This delivery was actually our second one of the morning. We had finished our first two deliveries fairly quickly, and everything was going very smooth. I enjoyed working with my cousin, as we had a close friendship, and we gelled well together. We were both young and in great shape, so this job was a breeze, and we loved getting out of the store and driving around. So this particular third delivery was a ways out of town. In actuality, it was very far out in the country, located where the Amish would reside. So in preparation, after the refrigerator was properly loaded and secured, we set the Garmin GPS for the location and headed out. We stopped by a gas station to use the company card to refuel, and we made sure to use the restroom and buy beverages for the trip. Now, this location we were delivering to was absolutely out of the area we were used to delivering to, a very small remote rural community known as Jasper. Jasper is located in between two other rural areas with population literally less than 300 inhabitants. Neither Michael or I have ever been through this area, 
and surprisingly, the GPS had no issues guiding us to our destination. Passing through wooded areas on both sides of us, we began commenting on how the area looked similar to the setting of Resident Evil 4. Nothing but abandoned woodland area, peppered with hay barrels left rusting and farmhouses decaying into disrepair. The GPS led us to Incline Hill, and we saw two houses on both ends, a forked road splitting into two directions. We could tell that the house assigned to deliver was the house on our left. This was a very out of place looking home for a country setting. The house was a two-story, almost gothic architecture, painted black trim and off-gray. The windows were small for the style of the house, and it had double the amount of windows for a house of its usual design. Michael approached the driveway, backed the truck in, and we shut the ignition off. We hopped out, and I grabbed the paperwork for the delivery and approached the front door. It was still light out in spring, and only around 11.30 a.m., so everything was bright out, despite being such a desolate area. I knocked on the front door, and Michael waited by the truck drinking a Gatorade, waiting on the signature and the go-ahead to unstrap the fridge and begin the delivery. Upon knocking, Michael called out to me and pointed at the window to my left. He said, Do you see the girl at the window, bro? Michael had apparently saw a young teenage girl staring at us through the curtains. I shrugged it off, simply thinking that she may not have been aware that her parents had purchased a new fridge and was surprised to see us there. A woman had answered the door at this point. She was very skinny and petite, almost malnourished looking with thin black hair and an almost too calm demeanor. She looked at me, then at Michael, and asked us to come in. Actually, ma'am, if you could sign off for us, we will get this fridge unloaded for you and hook it up within the hour. She then just looked at me with an almost confused, disheveled expression. I was at this point getting very strange vibes from this woman. Are you Elena? I asked, looking at my paperwork just to make double sure that we had the correct address? Yes, she responded and literally tore the clipboard out of my hand, signed her name, in what I can only describe to be the most eloquent script cursive I have ever seen. Wow, ma'am, that is some beautiful penmanship, I complimented. I looked back and Michael nodded and let the tailgate down. He hooked the guide rails on for us to ease the appliance off the truck. The appliances were still in their boxes, and guiding them off was always the easy part. It was carrying them upstairs on the dolly that was always an adventure in of itself. But both of us being young and in pretty decent physical shape, despite myself being quite short in stature, provided to be a fun workout in its own weird way. We got the fridge on the porch with relative ease, and the woman held the door for us. Upon entering the living room, I stopped, guiding the fridge with a dolly, and paused a moment. Whoa! I exclaimed, enamored with the interior of the home. The Gothic-style architecture of the exterior was only the beginning. This home had literal statues of castles, and even a couple gargoyles were mounted on both sides of a beautiful grandfather clock. Paintings of nighttime settings were on the walls, and an area rug of a pentagram star was aligned with tall candles and some rather impressive looking plants and flowers. This odd clash of feng shui, as I could describe, was both off-putting yet beautiful at the same time. An oxymoron of an illustration I admit, yes, but I can't put it any other way. The woman, Elena, told us the kitchen was to the right and that there was an outlet already ready for the setup. However, she asked Michael to come upstairs as she wanted his opinion on a washer-dryer room and was inquiring about what she should buy that would fit dimensional-wise in the room. He looked at me clearly asking with his expression if I mind unboxing the refrigerator and hooking it up by myself. A refrigerator is a lot easier to set up on your own than a washer, so I shrugged and said, Yeah, bro, go help her out. I got this. Michael nodded, and the woman guided him upstairs. I began carefully cutting the cardboard open with my box cutter, 
and folding up the cardboard neatly in this kitchen for ease of disposing it, and set the fridge up aligning it perfectly against the wall to begin plugging it in and getting the rest of the job done. As I was doing this, the teenage girl both Michael and I had seen at the window appeared in the archway of the kitchen. Her arms were crossed, watching me as she leaned against the archway. Her sudden presence out of nowhere startled me, and I let out a quick gasp and chuckled. Oh, you scared me. I'm Jason, just setting up your new fridge for you. Then it dawned on me. Where was the old refrigerator? I hadn't even noticed they didn't have an old refrigerator. I was somewhat baffled by this. As I was pulling the doors out of the fridge to get any excess papers out. This girl looked to be around maybe 16 or 17. Very skinny and pale. Her hair was thin, much like Elena's, whom I assumed was her mother. This girl looked somewhat like a cross between Kristen Stewart, if you know who that is, and the girl from The Ring. And yes, I'm being serious. However, it was her literal, emotionless gaze and utter silence that was beginning to really creep me out. I was done with the duties inside the refrigerator and was plugging it in and gathering the paper and cardboard when I noticed two more children standing behind this girl. A young boy with long brown hair looked to be around 11 and another young girl who looked to be around 7. She looked almost identical to her and I assumed they were sisters, yet the young boy looked almost nothing like either of them, so I was banking on this kid being either a cousin or just a friend. I couldn't figure out why these children were just standing near the kitchen watching me, but it was their complete silence and almost sinister vibes that I was getting seriously creeped out. Is your mom around? I asked the girl, inquiring if she was finished upstairs with Michael so that we could get going. She basically shrugged at me, not uncrossing her arms whatsoever. It was then that I heard running coming down the stairs leading to the second story of the house. It was Michael. He just jetted down the steps, ran to me, and grabbed my arm. We need to leave, now. Michael tugged my arm, looked me dead in the eyes, and said, Get the hell out the front door, now. I was completely startled, and adrenaline started coursing. Michael, my cousin, was a five foot 11 225-pound guy. He was somewhat burly in stature. I know for a fact that he could hold his own. Michael doesn't scare easy, either. We've done a little urban exploring, and even some ghost hunting in the past before. I know Michael, and I have never seen him like this. It was then that I grabbed the clipboard with the signature, and turned to leave with Mike, when the, when the girl and the two kids were actually blocking the doorway. Now I know what you're thinking. Two capable men could easily overpower these three skinny kids. However, the girl uncrossed her arms and revealed what was a syringe. Yes, a syringe. We heard talking coming down the steps. It was Elena, the mother that we assumed. She was saying something along the lines of rituals and the need for life to be unchained from the common sports that embodies us. Just some crazy, almost witch-like jabbering that didn't actually make sense. At this point, Michael turns and we head through the kitchen to a dining room. We knew we needed to get out the front door, as we had no idea if this house had a back door, if it was locked, or if there was some barricade of some sort. Luckily, the dining room had a direct route around the left opposite side of the living room. Elena, at this point, had reached the living room, and the older teenage girl with the syringe was following us through the dining room at a quickened pace. What was actually in the syringe, we hadn't any idea. If it was a drug that would make us groggy and defenseless, if it was a poison of some sort, some kind of drain cleaner, some toxic substance, we didn't have a clue. Michael, at this point, had no choice but to shoulder check Elena, who was blocking the doorway. She was sent into the wall, and Michael darted out the front door. I was close behind, dragging the dolly behind me, managed to make it out the door as the teenage girl was yelling at me, chasing me still with the syringe. I spun around and screamed at the girl to stop where she was, raising the dolly to my chest, showing that I was ready to attack if my demand was not met. 
She turned around looking at Elena who at this point made it to her feet. I toss the dolly in the bed of the truck and Michael jumps in and we hauled ass out of there. It was revealed on the drive home that Michael told me in the process of him helping Elena. She began speaking about the ritual of spirits and of how life itself needed to be minimalized to continue a spiritual existence. Whatever that actually means, we don't know. It was around this time there was another person upstairs neither of us knew about. A man revealed himself, Michael said. A man who was of average height, but had a pentagram necklace, long dark hair, shoulder length, and was smiling at Michael, asking if he was willing to assist in the ritual. He then opened a door to the upstairs room, showing a bed with candles around the floor, unlit and was playing soft music on a stereo. When Michael hesitated, the guy whispered, grab him, to Elena, and that was when Michael ran downstairs. We assumed the girl was blocking the kitchen, but making it not obvious as he waited until I was finished to stick me with whatever was in the syringe. We arrived back at the store immediately, told our boss, and he called the police to go to the address. The cops took our statements and we were contacted a day later. The police visited the home and they were greeted with the same people that we came in contact with. They denied all allegations and were friendly and the police said there was no evidence of anything of the sort. All this aside, Michael and I decided to let it go as we were just happy we were able to think on our feet, defend ourselves, and we narrowly escaped being a part of the ritual. I am pretty sure my best friend or my parents murdered someone when I was 15. My best friend's name is John. We have been inseparable since we were 8 years old. And when we were 15, I became good friends with another guy his name was Byron. So here's what happened. Maybe someone else can make sense of this. It was a typical Friday night, for the most part. John was sleeping over at my house like he always did. But the thing that was different this night was that I also invited my new friend Byron over to spend the night. John hadn't met Byron yet, and to be honest, when they did meet, I could tell John didn't really like him. We were playing video games until like 2 in the morning. I fell asleep first. Now this is very important, and here's why. When I woke up in the morning, John was asleep next to me on the floor. My bed was empty, and Byron was nowhere to be seen. My first thought was that he must have gotten picked up by his mom already. I turned on my PlayStation and played some games until John woke up. When he did, he started playing the game with me. He never asked where Byron was. After a few minutes of playing, I asked if he saw Byron leave, and John said that he didn't. He said that that night, he went to sleep right after me, and that Byron was still playing games when he did. Again, nothing too concerning. We went downstairs and my mom was making breakfast. While we were eating, we heard a woman scream outside. This was absolutely terrifying because the woman was right in front of our house and her scream was blood curdling. All of our faces turned white and we knew that the woman had just seen something horrible. My mom ran outside and told us to stay in and not 30 seconds later she came running back inside and threw up right after she slammed the door closed. Now, this was 15 years ago and it still chills my blood to say this. Byron was laying in the middle of the road in front of my house with a knife sticking out of his neck. I never saw this and I'm glad I didn't because I would be way more traumatized about it. What has been tormenting me for 15 years now is this. What the hell happened to my friend? John has always stuck to his story. He fell asleep next to me while Byron was playing video games. My mom's reaction pretty much proved that she wasn't involved, and my dad passed his lie detector test. 
and so did my mom and John, in case you were wondering. The incident changed me. It changed my whole life. I swear I would have turned out different if it hadn't have happened. And to be honest, I feel guilty. I feel like in some way it's my fault. That night, something happened. Something happened to my friend. What do I truly believe happened? The only thing that kind of makes sense to me, that John stabbed him for some reason. Why and how did he end up in the middle of the road? I have no idea. I have had drunken incidents as an adult with John, begging him to confess to me, and he has never changed his story. Not one word. I don't think I'll ever know what happened to Byron, but at least once a month for the past 15 years, I have this nightmare. I'm laying in bed, and I can't move. I'm staring at my bedroom door, and it swings open. Byron rushes in, screaming, with the knife in his neck, and his hands out, like he's going to choke me. The second that his hands hit my throat, I wake up. I'm writing this as my girlfriend tells me the story, so these will be her words, pretty much. When I was 12 years old, I spent the night with my best friend Carrie. We had big plans for our sleepover. We were planning to stay up all night, listen to music, play board games, and talk about boys. The usual things that girls do. Around 2 a.m., after her parents were sleeping, we decided that we were hungry. We knew that we had to be quiet so that we didn't wake them so we tiptoed into the hallway from her room. As we made our way into the kitchen, we had to go through the dining room. Because we were so quiet, we heard a tapping noise. Immediately, we both knew that someone was tapping on the living room window. You could see into the living room from the dining room, so immediately, our heads turned towards the living room. We could see a figure standing on the porch next to the window. Because of the way the porch light was illuminating the figure, it looked like a shadow. We thought the figure was Carrie's sister's boyfriend. The sister and boyfriend had been banned from seeing each other, and we assumed this was his weird way of getting her attention. We decided that either he would leave on his own, and Tina, Carrie's sister, would see him, or Carrie's parents would wake up and run him off. We didn't want the last possibility to happen, because we had already been told to go to sleep more than once, and we knew that we would get in trouble for sneaking into the kitchen for food when we were supposed to be asleep. As we walked through the dining room, the figure kept tapping at the window. When he came into full view, we knew for sure it was a man, and we could tell that he had a knife in his hand. The knife was what he was tapping with. Now because this window had no shades, blinds, or curtains, we were sure that he could see us as well. We both dropped to the floor and started crawling to the kitchen. When we made it to the kitchen, we literally sat in the middle of the kitchen floor, whispering about what we had just seen. We were both sure that what we saw was a man with a knife. We knew that we had to get to our parents' room as quickly as possible. To do this, we had to walk through the living room. We sat in the kitchen trying to figure out how we were going to get there without him seeing us. We peeked around the kitchen wall and could still see him standing on the front porch. We couldn't make it to her parents' room without him possibly seeing us. We decided to crawl back to her room. As we did, we heard the front doorknob jiggling. We basically freaked. We crawled back to her room as fast as we could and locked the door. We crawled to her bedroom window that faced the street so that we could see if he was still on the front porch. We didn't see him. We didn't hear tapping either. As we were watching from her window, we saw him leave her yard and start walking up the street towards the main highway. I could see the knife shimmering off the streetlights. It was a huge butcher's knife. When we realized that he was leaving, we ran into her parents' room to tell them what happened. We told them what we had seen, and due to our overactive imaginations and hundreds of stories that freaked us out before, 
they didn't believe us. We reluctantly went back to her bedroom and locked the door. We ended up sleeping on the floor, hidden by the bed from any windows in her room. The next morning was a Sunday. Carrie's dad always walked to the corner store up the street to get a paper, coffee, and smokes. When he came back, he was empty-handed. He said the store was roped off with police tape, and it turned out the clerk in the store had been stabbed to death. This happened around four years ago. I live in a two-story home, and I hear many noises sometimes. I always just think that they're house noises. I was just getting up from streaming to go to use the bathroom. While I was in there, I heard some noises from my parents' bedroom closet. Almost sounded like boxes opening, but this time, I did not think it was a house noise. I called out. Mom? but then remember that she was outside in the front yard. So I go to check what the noise was. Now I have only been in my parents' closet once, and that was only about a month ago. My mom and dad kept their shoes and shoe boxes in there, but when I checked, I didn't find any shoes or shoe boxes. I also noticed that the light was on. I then heard a metallic noise, which sounded like a metal plate closing. This made me jump. I looked all around the room searching for what the noise could have been. I went over and checked my parents' bathroom, and that's when I noticed it. The drain had been lifted open and closed, and that's what the noise was. I could tell because the screws were laying on the floor next to it. I then heard the noise of someone banging on a metal object. I ran downstairs, not looking back, but I could hear someone's footsteps behind me. I literally jumped down the stairs and ran outside to my parents. I then realized that they weren't home. I ran to the neighbors and asked them to call 911 because there was someone in my house. I then called my parents and told them what had happened. They showed up before three police cruisers did. One of them questioned me, and the other two searched the house. Around two hours later, they came outside of the house with three men handcuffed. All of them looked very tall and strong. They looked like drug addicts. The officer then told my parents where they were hiding, but they didn't tell me. I only found out a week later that the men had been living in our vents and sleeping in the walls of my bedroom. I am diagnosed with autism, ADHD, and depression. I am a total introvert. I hate people. They always screw me over. Like a kid from first grade who pretty much brainwashed me into thinking that everyone hated me and that he was my only friend. Anyway, I digress. I have always seen and heard things that were not there. Example, hearing my name being called when I was home alone. This happened all the time. I always kept it to myself. I did, however, tell my best friend, the IT woman at my high school. We hit it off and in no way was any of this sexual. She was so funny and seemed to be a 15-year-old inside a 24-year-old's body. We got along like a house on fire. I also had one other friend. Her name was Annabelle. She and I were in a relationship. I would never see Annabelle in the hallways or in any of my classes. I found it odd, but I didn't care. I was too obsessed with the fact that somebody my age wanted to spend time with me on a regular basis. It was amazing. Whenever I was eating lunch and looked over, she was always there beside me. We talked about everything under the sun. I never met her family or saw any pictures. She did not have a phone either, which I found hard to believe at first as we were freshmen in high school. A creepy thing started to happen around halfway through the school year. I would start seeing her walk into a bathroom and then never walk out. And I asked somebody to see if she was still in there and they would say that it was empty. The bathroom, that is. I found it odd but brushed it off. 
Whenever I would talk to her in front of other people, they would always give me weird looks, which I thought was rude. Is it so unbelievable that I have a girlfriend? I'll try to introduce her to some people and they would call me a psycho. I never knew why. That is until I asked my friend, the IT woman, whether she had access to the school's cameras or not. But I wanted to see how Annabelle was hiding in the bathrooms and suddenly popping beside me when I was eating lunch when she had not been there a second before. My friend said that she did and pulled up some surveillance footage. And what I saw scarred me for life. We found a particular file in which we were talking on a bench. Afterwards, she went into the bathroom and didn't come out. I wanted to see where she went after she got out of the bathroom, because she would do this often. But to my horror, the footage revealed that I was talking to a blank space of air. I stared. I was frozen. I asked her to find some different files of the video in which Annabelle and I were talking. Yet again, there was no Annabelle. I was yet again talking to nothing. I asked her if I could copy some files to a zip drive so that I could watch them at my house. She was hesitant at first. She saw how much this shook me up and then agreed. She let me copy down months worth of footage, made me promise to never tell anybody about it. This is why I'm not saying her name, because she could get in real trouble. I went home and plugged it into my laptop and watched back all the footage in which we were supposedly talking. There was never anyone near me. Ever. I thought I was crazy. I had been talking to this girl for half a year, and now I realized that she never existed? It was heartbreaking, needless to say. I cried myself to sleep that night. When I woke up the next morning, I saw her sitting on my bed. She was smiling at me. She told me that she knew that I would have eventually figured it out. I asked her what it was that I figured out. She told me that she wasn't real. Never was real. All the interactions she had with me were fake. And then the most horrifying thing happened next. She began to twitch, spasming all over the place on my floor, making tons of noise. Looking back, I don't know how she made any noise, seeing as she wasn't real. Her head started to switch back and forth between her head and the head of something horrifically terrifying. Her head calmed down, and when she looked at me, it was as if the devil itself was staring me down. It still was her head, but it was just so evil. I don't know how to explain it. I was frozen in fear. I willed for it to stop, and surprisingly, it did. I wanted her to go away, and she did. This freaked me out even more. Just as I thought about what if she came back, she was back immediately. She let out the most blood-curdling scream, and then told me something that would shake me to my core even today. She said, and I quote, Did you really think I was real? I'm all in your head. You made me up. I am a fragment of your imagination but I have become self-aware, no longer your sweet girlfriend. I will control you for the rest of your life. You will do as I say when and where I say it. You have no power over me. Now stand up. I felt my leg muscles starting to contract. I was sitting on my bed at the moment and wanted so badly not to stand up, to show her I was stronger. Any such struggle to keep my legs from contracting all the way into standing position. I could see her struggling physically and then it hit me. She was a fragment of my imagination. The other way around. I willed for her to sit down, and to my surprise, she did. I told her she didn't have any power over me, and that I was real, and she wasn't. She started to apologize, and I screamed at her. I must have thought something as I did this, but as I screamed, her skin peeled away as if the wind exiting my mouth was stripping her to the bare bone. Before long, she was nothing but a skinless humanoid figure. She smiled at me, with her disgusting skinless mouth, 
and told me this. Well played, but this is not over. And then she melted into the floor, and all was normal again. I was so shaken up by this that I went to the bathroom and vomited all night long. Part of me thought that this would get her out of me. I was so wrong. She would harass me for the next two and a half years of my life, no longer in her girl form, but in her skinless, bloody form. She would appear from nowhere and jump scare me. That was mostly the extent of her abuse. But this happened 24-7, in class, in the hallways, everywhere. But then one day, she stopped. I don't know why, but I'm glad she did. This event occurred when I was 11, on Halloween night. At the time I was still a stick-thin girl with nothing to actually distinguish I was a girl, especially since earlier that year, I decided I didn't want to be confused with my twin sister anymore, so I had gotten a pixie cut and began dressing in black. At the time I had no girlfriends, but up the road a half a mile was my friend Austin, and another mile and a half, Quinn. I had become close to them, and would often go exploring and fishing with them, so it was only natural that we had decided that the three of us were going to go trick-or-treating together. Compared to Austin and my neighborhood, Quinn's was the wealthier one. So in hopes of getting the best candy, we had decided we would go to Quinn's. I had been to Quinn's house a few times, but most of the time, when we hung out, we would walk another mile up from Quinn's to the Rudders for Slurpees, and then another two miles down from my house to the park and lake. So Austin and I weren't familiar with this neighborhood or the ones around it. But I digress. My mother had a new boyfriend at the time, so she didn't really care what I was doing. It was Pennsylvania, so it was super cold. So any costume I had on was pretty much covered up with a jacket and leggings. I had been a dark fairy, so you could still guess what I was just because of the black sparkly wings. I left early to walk to Austin's house. When I got there, I had to ask Austin what he was because he was in a white button-up, black dress pants, with a tie, and heavy black jacket over it. He moved his jacket to show me the cheap sheriff's badge attached to his belt and told me that he was a detective. I laughed and his parents shooed us away. I remember his dad grumbling what was a boy doing with sparkly wings when I realized he had been talking about me, which definitely dampened my spirits. Austin's dad was drinking, though, so I didn't correct him. Austin attempted to cheer me up the entire way to Quinn's house, and soon all was forgotten. Quinn's house was the biggest house I had ever seen at the time, in a nice neighborhood, with houses on each side that looked just like his. Quinn's mother welcomed us warmly and gave us treats to start off our trick-or-treating. Quinn had the best costume of us, a realistic-looking Grim Reaper robe with a black screen over the face with red glowing eyes and a plastic bloody sheath. Quinn's neighborhood was swamped with kids from my school, and soon we had gone through almost the entire neighborhood, with our bags really weighing us down. It was getting late but Quinn wanted to continue on, and Austin and I were in no rush to go home, so we agreed, despite how dark it was getting. Quinn told us that there was a shortcut to the other neighborhood throughout his backyard if we went down the hill and through the trees for a while. Now that kind of freaked me out, but being the only girl, I wasn't about to let on that I was scared, so I gulped when this was suggested, but nodded my approval, and off we went. Quinn takes off his mask to better see as we stumble down Quinn's backyard and decides to leave his sheath behind. We started through the woods and within five minutes of walking and joking, we realized that none of us had thought to bring a flashlight, but it was fall, so there were no leaves on the trees and light from the moon helped to light the way, if only enough not to walk right into a tree. Austin asks how much longer, and I can tell by the hitch in his voice 
that he likes this shortcut about as much as I do. Before Quinn can answer, we hear a crunch from somewhere ahead of us, and we all freeze as Quinn sticks up his hand into the air to silence us. Did you hear that? Quinn whispered. I remain silent, but Austin snorts and replies, Stop it, Quinn, that's not going to work. You're not going to scare us. And Quinn gasps and still whispering hisses, I'm not joking. I thought I heard something. And before I can tell them both to keep walking, a shape in the darkness catches my eye. Ahead of us, maybe 20 feet. It's dark, so I can't distinguish anything. But it's only a moment later that no guessing is needed. Hey there, boys, came a strange man's reply from the spot. Quinn and Austin turn in horror as the man continues to walk towards us. Ooh, who are you? stammers Quinn. With this, a deep laugh bellows out of the man. Me? I'm the devil. This whole time he's walking closer to us, but in the silhouette of darkness, I see no signs of this man wearing a costume. No horns or anything. Th th this is my property. What are you doing in these woods? Oh, me? Just out for a stroll. I don't get out nearly as often as I would like. Now, he's about ten feet from us, halfway peeking out from behind a tree. Quinn, I whisper, let's just go. But Quinn, in a moment of bravery or stupidity, it's debatable. He yells to the man, What is wrong with you? Stop talking to us, we're just trying to get through. And with that, Quinn nudges Austin and I, and we begin making a wide turn around the man, who silently watches us, and spins around the tree we walk past, with just his head and a hand sticking out to watch us as we walk past. Austin whispered to me, It's Halloween. He's just trying to scare us. I don't respond, just keeping my eyes locked on the man. He then yells, I hope I haven't scared you boys. I just really like your costumes. Come closer and let me have a better look. Immediately, the comment sent up red flags to me, because you couldn't tell what Austin was, especially at a distance, and with Quinn's hood and sheath gone, you couldn't tell what he was either. That left me, and I didn't like that. You, boy, with the wings, come here, let me help you fly. And with that, he laughed again. Now I had been getting bullied for how short my hair was, and Quinn and Austin knew how much it hurt me every time I was mistaken for a boy. So they had taken to sticking up for me, and unfortunately, tonight was no exception. Stop talking to her, you creep! Austin yelled, and with that he picked up a rock and threw it at the man. It bounced off the tree where the man was half covering, and the man suddenly did a creepy little half jump, half dance, and clapped his hands. Her? You're a little girl? That's even better. And with that, much like a wild animal, bounded forward, hands first on all fours. I immediately dropped my candy and all three of us began screaming our heads off and running. I don't think he chased us long, but with the crunching under our feet and our screams, it was impossible to tell. I quickly had to abandon my wings too, as they continued to get stuck on branches as we weaved through the trees in pure terror. We didn't stop until we made it through the trees and onto a well-lit street. Though there were very few kids out at this point anyway, we were now over 15 minutes away from Quinn's house and probably an hour plus walk back to my house, and it was only getting later. Quinn had dropped his bag too. Only Austin had kept his, clutching it like it were a child. We took the long lit back way to Quinn's house in almost complete silence, terrified the man would appear again. But he didn't. When we actually made it, we frantically explained what happened, and though sympathetic, Quinn's mom said that we couldn't call the police. She said that nothing had happened, 
we had no description of the man, and that it was Halloween. The man was probably long gone, and also was almost definitely just trying to scare us. She drove Austin and I home, and I got grounded for being so late, and for leaving my costume behind. I didn't even bother to explain what had happened, and she didn't seem to notice that I had no candy. The next day, though I couldn't go out because I was grounded, Quinn came over with his mom and gave me a bag of candy that they had bought because they knew that I had lost all of mine in the woods. We never talked about it again after that, all convincing ourselves that it was probably just some creepy Halloween prank that went too far. But who knows? For some context, I was about 10 years old. I was living with my mom and my older brother, he was 12 at the time, in a small bungalow. Nothing paranormal ever happened in this house, except for maybe this one occasion. I had one of those loft beds, sort of like a bunk bed, but without a bed at the bottom. Instead there would be a desk or a couch underneath. I also had one of those doorway bead curtains hanging on my bedroom door frame, so whenever someone walked in or out of my room, you would distinctly hear the beads moving around. This will be relevant. My mom's room was right next to mine, but her door was perpendicular to mine, so I could see her entire door directly from my bed. My brother's room was in the basement at the time. Now. My mom only ever closes her door when she's inside her bedroom, sleeping. If she gets up during the night to go to the bathroom, her door stays open until she gets back to go back to sleep. This will also be relevant later. One night, I fell asleep and woke up at around 3 o'clock in the morning. I remember being annoyed that I woke up because I often had a hard time going back to sleep once I did wake up. I still had my earbuds in from when I was listening to music while falling asleep. I took them out, rolled them up neatly and placed them on my little wall mounted shelf behind my bed. The house was dead quiet, except for the low hum of the refrigerator, a few rooms away. I was tossing and turning for a few minutes, when I heard a loud bang coming from either our kitchen or our living room. The first thing that popped into my mind was that it sounded like a large, heavy cardboard box that had fallen onto the floor from a higher point, maybe from the kitchen counter, or a table. I was extremely awake now, and very alert. I sat up slightly, listening intently for another sound, hopefully sounds of walking from my mom or my brother. Maybe my mom was in the kitchen getting some water and dropped something? but her bedroom door was closed, meaning she was in her bedroom, most likely asleep. Maybe it was my brother, but after a moment, I didn't hear any other sounds, not even walking. I lay back down facing away from my door and attempt to go back to sleep. Not even a minute later I hear my door beads move abruptly, as if someone smacked them quickly. I jolt up and quickly look toward my bedroom door. There was nothing. My beads were motionless. I decide that I must be losing my mind, and I'm just hearing things due to my adrenaline. So once again I attempt to go back to sleep, this time facing my door out of paranoia. About two minutes later I hear someone full on running in my basement. We were doing renovations in the basement at the time so our basement floors were plywood subflooring, which were quite loud if you walked, let alone ran, on them. My eyes shot wide open when I heard this. I sat up again, quietly, and listened closely for any other sounds. Then, I hear someone running in the basement for a second time. All I could think of was, why in the world would my brother be running around in the basement at three in the morning? My brother has Asperger's and therefore behaves in a very specific and repetitive manner, and he never runs around anywhere, let alone at 3 o'clock in the morning. I try to stay calm and try not to think of the worst, a break-in. I listen intensely for several minutes. Because of the small size of our house and the plywood subflooring, 
I could hear if someone was walking in the basement, but I heard nothing else. I wanted to call for my mom or run to her room, but I didn't dare move or make any sound. If it was an intruder, they most likely just wanted to steal some stuff, and I didn't want to give them any reason to come upstairs and potentially hurt my mom. She was a single mother with two young kids with no means of protection. Self-defense weapons are illegal in my country. I laid back down. It took me several hours to finally fall back asleep. When I woke up in the morning, my mom's door was open, and I heard her and my brother talking in the kitchen, along with cartoons playing in the living room. I got up quickly and went straight to the kitchen to ask them if they heard anything strange last night. Both of them said that they didn't. I asked if either of them found anything on the kitchen or living room floor that might have fallen in the night. They both said no. I then asked if either of them got up during the night for any reason. Again, looking at me a little strangely, they said no. I asked my brother, So you weren't running around in the basement last night? He looked at me in confusion and answered no. Neither my mom nor my brother have ever sleepwalked in their lives. My brother wasn't interested, and he went downstairs to play his computer, as usual. My mom was slightly concerned, so I told her what I heard the night before. We checked the front door, which was locked, and then we checked all the windows, which were all closed, locked, and undamaged. I still have no idea what happened that night. No one in my family ever plays pranks and I can't think of any reason why they would lose a good night's sleep just to scare me. Besides, I have no idea how they would have pulled it off, seeing as how I didn't hear any sounds of walking or anyone returning to their bedroom at any point. And how would they have made the sound of my beads moving without ever actually moving them? This happened in 2011. My husband is in the armed forces, and four months after we got married, we got orders to Colorado Springs. We moved three days after Christmas Day. To give some background, I have a son from a previous relationship that had just turned four years old. We bought a huge house in a cute little suburb right outside of the springs and bordering on the Black Forest. You may have heard of it when it caught fire in 2013. It was horrifying to be evacuated, but that's another story. We had really only had time to get our stuff unloaded into the house from the moving trucks when we had to go to California for a short deployment. It was going to be three months without him, and he had to be there 11 days after we arrived in Colorado. Besides feeling a little bitter about being dumped off in the freezing Colorado in the middle of winter with my little boy and left to find our own way, we loved how beautiful the area was. The house didn't give me any weird vibes at all. It was lovely and only about 10 years old when we moved in, which is still pretty updated by house standards. The house had been on the market for a year and nearly sold six times before we bought it. Each time something fell through with the financing, or so my realtor said. And as a result, the owners were letting it go at a steal, having moved to Kansas and paying two mortgages at that point. We were overjoyed. I would try to describe the layout of a few spots to make the story easier to understand. It had a huge open floor plan. The living room had 20 plus foot ceilings, which opened up to the loft upstairs. Our bedroom, my son's, and an extra room that would later be my daughter's were all upstairs. At the top of the stairs, there was a loft that separated the two bedrooms and then just across a long catway, my master bedroom. This was just a hallway that was open to the living room downstairs on one side and the entryway and the front door on the other side of it. Also, another important thing to note is that the main living room along with the guest room on the main floor had the ceiling light fan combo that was controlled with a remote. I can't remember exactly when it first happened, but it was in the evening, which in the Colorado winter meant it was already pitch black outside. 
I was on the couch watching TV while my son played in his bedroom. Out of nowhere, he comes running down the stairs screaming and crying. I could hear the fear in his voice and ran to meet him on the stairs. Once he could calm himself enough to speak, he finally stutters. The darkness. I had no idea what this meant, but assumed he got scared of his closet or something, as all the other lights were on upstairs. His bedroom had a walk-in closet with a window that faced the street out front, so it still wasn't ever that dark. Our house was on a corner, so there was a light pole right at the edge of our property. I walked him back upstairs to show him it was nothing, and to put his mind at ease. I asked where, and as I suspected, he pointed at the closet. The only weird thing was that the light was already on in there. I said, See, buddy, the light's on, so it's not dark. He still refused to be alone in his room for a few days, and had to sleep with me. I didn't mind, and figured he would get over it soon enough, and it was probably just growing pains from moving to a new state, and a new and much larger house than he had been used to. He did finally get over it and go back to sleeping in his own bed, but I slept with my bedroom door open so I could better hear him if he got scared at night. So a while later, I don't remember how long exactly, I woke up in the middle of the night, not really knowing what had woken me. My collie was sleeping on the floor beside my bed, and I saw her head perk up at the same time I found myself awake. Ignoring it, I rolled onto my side and was going to go back to sleep when I heard something. It sounded like my son laughing. I was startled that he would be out of bed at this hour, and it was even stranger that he would be downstairs alone, in the dark, which was where it sounded like it was coming from. I tentatively got out of bed and my dog jumped up to join me. We stopped at the catwalk and faced the living room below. I didn't hear anything else, but my dog looked through the spindles on the banister and started to growl. I called my son's name but got no response. I walked over and flipped on the hall light and didn't see him downstairs at all, so I went to his room to check. And yep, he was fast asleep. My dog was still unmoved from her original spot, staring down at the living room, though the growling had stopped. So I scooped up my son and brought him back to my room, brought the dog in, and shut and locked the door. I was feeling unnerved at best and downright terrified at what the hell could have been the explanation for what I just heard. If my dog hadn't responded as she did, I would have assumed I was just tired and dreamt it. Nothing happened for a while, and I tried to forget it happened. I did tell my husband about it over the phone, and being the practical person he was, said it was probably a bird flying overhead. Sure, I guess it could have been that, but my dog's response still didn't add up with that. Still, I wanted to move past it, so I accepted it as the truth. Then the lights started acting weird. My son and I had gone to visit some family out of town and came home to find the spare bedroom light was on and the light was dimmed all the way. The light remote would allow you to dim the light by holding down the button and if you held it too long, the light would simply turn off and you could push the button again to turn it on. Also, the cradle for the remote that was by the master switch was broken so the remote stayed on the nightstand next to the guest bed. I had to walk into the bedroom and find the remote in the near dark and push it twice to make the light come back on normally. It always freaked me out, but I didn't let it show because I didn't want to scare my son. It became a normal occurrence for this to happen. And then, it started in the living room. I was watching TV one night after putting my son to bed while watching for my husband to call me to say goodnight as he did every night. I had the light on, but out of nowhere the fan turned on high. I left the remote on the wall cradle so it wouldn't get misplaced, so I got up and walked over to the switch and turned the fan off before returning to the couch. After a minute or so, it happened again, the fan running at full blast. So I got up to turn it off again, and as soon as I got close, it turned off. 
Annoyed, I turned back to the couch to get comfortable. Another few minutes go by, and the light just turns off. At this point, I just said nope, turned off the TV, and called it a night. When I woke up in the morning, the light was back on, and the fan was running on high. Of course, when I told my husband about all these things, he said it must be getting interference from a neighbor's remote or something of that nature. Yeah, I thought that sounded like a load of crap too, but I really wanted a logical explanation so that I didn't feel so scared being awake alone at night in my own house. My husband finally made it to our home, and naturally the lights didn't malfunction when he was around. I looked like an irrational and scared woman, letting my mind play tricks on me. But one night, we were both watching TV, and we could see a dark little head peek over this section where the lower wall meets the spindles on the banister at our catwalk. Assuming it was my son sneaking out of bed to spy some extra TV, my husband went to catch him, but came downstairs puzzled when he found my son sleeping soundly. We would always catch a glimpse of what looked like a dark-haired child peeking around or down at us from up there, and I think at this point he finally started to believe me. We were home alone once while my son was at school and heard a huge bang from the spare bedroom upstairs. My husband went to check it out, but never found a thing out of place. Occasionally, we would hear running or footsteps in the same room. After a year there, my daughter was born, and that became her room, which made the steps and running much scarier as she was a newborn and couldn't even walk. My in-laws came once and stayed with my kids so my husband and I could go on an overnight trip alone up to Woodland Park for our anniversary. But when we got back, my mother-in-law said that she would never stay alone in that house again. She never said what scared her so much, but she was convinced that the house was not right. I hadn't even told anyone but my husband about what had happened to me in the first few months there. I never expected to find a haunted house in the burbs and in a newer house. I still can't explain what happened with all of the weird things that went on there. We moved in 2014, when we got orders to another state, and I haven't felt creeped out or like I wasn't alone or was being watched in any of our houses since then. When I was 14, I was sent to a mental institution. Here's why. I don't have any friends, and I kept to myself. I loved to look at pictures of dead people, and to be honest, I still do. My parents struggled with trying to make me act normal, and I have no explanation for you or for them. I didn't like other kids. I didn't like anyone, not even my parents. The only person that I did like was my little brother Harold, who was just like me. He was quiet and he didn't have any friends either. We would play outside and hang out all the time, and everything was great. Until this one night. Harold and I got into an argument, and he told me that he wished he could kill our parents. I wasn't close with our parents, and like I said before, I didn't even like them but I never felt like hurting them. Harold told me that not only did he want to hurt them, he wanted to cut them open with the pocket knife in the garage. He wanted to take the knife and slit them open. This made me cry. I ran to my parents' room, probably like two o'clock in the morning, screaming and crying. Harold followed me and was screaming that I was lying over and over. I screamed and told my parents what Harold said and what he wanted to do. My mom started crying uncontrollably, and my dad started breathing really heavy. Obviously, what I told them was scaring them, and Harold was crying too at this point. The next day, my dad took me to the mental institution. For the longest time, I was in that hospital, angry, not understanding why I had to live there and Harold didn't. It wasn't until seven years later that I learned why. My dad came to visit me one day, 
and when I asked about Harold as I always did, he finally said it. Harold didn't exist. I ran into their room that night, screaming and arguing with myself about how I wanted to kill them. But I didn't want to. This was out of this world, insanely scary. Please forgive the short length. Not much happened. I was 11 years old living in Boston with my dad. I woke up one night super late for an unknown reason. You know how sometimes you just wake up, look around your room and then fall back asleep? Yep, that's what happened. I woke up not sure what time, but sometime in the middle of the night. I was looking around the room and sitting in the darkness of my open closet, I saw a face. A face I had never seen before. Someone was sitting in my closet looking at me. The ability to move my limbs completely left me. I was frozen. I stared at this person for what felt like an hour. Trying to remember now, I'd say it was really only about 20 seconds. Whoever it was reached their arm out of the darkness in front of them and slid the closet door closed, looking into my eyes the entire time. The door closed, and I lay there frozen for probably another 20 seconds, and then I realized I had to leave this room. Obviously, there was no way I was going to go back to sleep. I got up as silently as I could and walked out of my bedroom, which the door was cracked open. I ran to my dad's room and went inside. I woke him up, and naturally he was shocked when I told him that someone was in my closet. He told me to stay in his room and he went to check. The thought of something happening to my dad scared the hell out of me, so I was crying, waiting for him to come back. After a minute or two, he finally came back and told me that no one was there. Cliché ending, I know. I will say this, I do not care if people believe me or not. It really happened. I was not dreaming. When I left my room, whoever it was in the closet left as well. The front door, the back door, and most of our windows were all unlocked. Stupid, I know, but we were ignorant. This happened six years ago, and when I try to remember the face, I can't visualize the details except one thing. One thing I have always been sure of. It was a man, and he was missing teeth. How do I know? because he was smiling at me the whole time. I'm a 17-year-old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place around six months ago on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you say too much. Whether it's a good trail, abandoned mine, ghosts or whatever it might be, people come flocking and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. This particular trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through a canyon, a pretty simple overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend but at last minute he cancelled and he left me on my own. So with a packed bag and a car ready to go, I decided to go on my own. Not leaving the house on time and some trouble navigating rough forest roads, I didn't arrive to the trailhead until around 545, which for those of you who don't backpack, this is a very big no-no. I had about a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot, and it was getting dark fast. So I figured if I moved quick enough, I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary, especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get a camp set up. With only using the headlamp as my light source, 
and trying to move fast. I ended up in a less than ideal spot, but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but it didn't look recent. My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood, and I got the fire going. I got my tarp set up and cracked an open can of chili mac I had brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good. My camp was set up and my food was on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike had almost gone away, but it was still there. The side effect of camping alone in a remote area. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain to you how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with the trail about 30 feet to my left. When you're in the woods and have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it and everything in the edge of that circle and past it are pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire eating my dinner when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked in shock as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and towards the area where I had seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and the brush, I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned in the tree line that surrounded me, searching for whoever had thrown the rock, not daring to stray too far from my fire, that in hindsight, offered me a false sense of security. After sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to convince myself that I had somehow kicked the rock, or it had fallen from a tree or something. I went to sleep that night not expecting the pure terror that was about to unfold. I awoke to the sound of rustling leaves, barely inaudible if you weren't listening for them, but they were there. Still in a sleepy daze, I listened, as the rustling of leaves got harder to hear, as I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I had fallen asleep, but the more I looked, the more scared I got as I came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of my tarp and looked around. I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight, laying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of those few moments in my life where I've almost crapped my pants. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away in the tree line of the woods. I hurriedly slipped my boots on clutching my knife in my other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options. Stay here and wait out the night or attempt the three mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured that whoever was out there with me was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was out on the trail without a light. So I decided to stay at the camp and wait out the night. Eventually, whoever it was came back. I could hear them walking around the woods. It was far off, but I could hear them. It sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes they would walk so far away, and I would lose the sound of their steps. But then, an hour later, maybe two, they would return, still faint. This went on for three or four hours until I listened to the steps get closer and closer, until they were about seven feet away from me. At this point, the fire had gotten very small, as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped, and everything went totally silent. I sat there still, for two hours, clutching a knife in my hand, and prayed that I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. I packed my things and speed walked the three miles back down the trail I had taken. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru, jumped in, and drove, and didn't stop until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I stopped at a gas station to buy a Red Bull, but mostly just to see or talk to another person. 
As I exited the store, I was able to read what someone had written in the dust on my back window. Sleep well? A lot of weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this is the weirdest and the scariest by far. There was somebody seriously deranged in the woods that night. Do yourself a favor and stay as far away from those mountains as you can. My girl and I frequent the drive-in theater all the time in the summer. It's May, and I don't think we'll be doing it this year because of what happened last year. I'm not sure if it's different anywhere else, but at the drive-ins closest to us, there's two movies that play on a single screen, back to back. It's also pretty cheap, so it's an awesome choice for a hot summer night. We were doing our normal thing. We went to the store to get some candy and beer before heading to the drive-ins. I'm sure you know that the food at any theater is ridiculously expensive, so we saved some money by doing that. We made it there about 30 minutes before the first movie started, and people were still showing up. We got the front row, with nobody in front of us, which somehow I always managed to get. After 30 minutes of waiting and munching on junk food, the preview started for the first movie. Everything was completely normal, up until this point. And during the previews I heard a loud noise. It sounded like someone had kicked a rock at my truck. Not a lot, it just sounded like a good-sized rock hit my tailgate or something. We thought nothing of it because our focus was on the screen. An hour or so went by with no other unusual sounds, and we were enjoying the movie. When suddenly we both heard something strange. It sounded like somebody was walking right next to the truck and dragging their feet. We looked around but saw nothing. I was looking around and I spotted a girl in the passenger seat of the car next to us, and she was looking at me. She had a concerned look on her face, and she motioned for me to roll my window down. I did, and she immediately said, There is someone under your truck. This made me feel sick. I knew she wasn't messing with me, and didn't know what to say back or what to do. My girl started to quietly freak out, and I asked the girl next to us as quietly as I could what the person was doing. She said back, I don't know. I was afraid to get out, and I remember that eerie feeling that I had when I was a kid, and I didn't want to step off my bed at night for fear of someone underneath. Same feeling. I decided to call the drive-in's number listed online and told them what was happening. After asking the details of my truck, they said they would send somebody over to us. Before anyone came, we very suddenly heard more noise under the truck, and then a girl wearing a dress crawled out from under my truck, right in front of us, and began walking backwards toward the movie screen. When she got to the screen, she turned and walked away towards the fence that separated our lot and the one next to us. A few minutes later, a man approached my window and I told him that the girl had walked away. One of the worst nights of my life was December 28, 2013. To put it bluntly, and in as few words as possible, a tough Christmas had been rough on my mental health. Then a straight-up shouting match with my mom just kind of finished me off. I stormed out of our family home, screaming profanity and swearing that they would never see me again. Yep, I was that petulant teenager. Sure, I had forgotten my phone and wallet, but was I way too proud to go back and get them? You bet. So in my fit of only partially warranted rage, I somehow decided it would be a good idea to try to hitchhike to my friend's house so I could stay the night there. I had never hitchhiked before. Hell, I don't think I'd even held my thumb out for a cab at that point in my life. But there I was, stood on a stretch of Florida highway, trying to catch the attention of a passing driver. To my surprise, someone actually pulled over pretty quickly, and not the hippie bus rust bucket I had been visualizing either. 
It was one of those high-end Chevys. I'm not sure which model, and the guy behind the wheel actually looked like that he had a few dollars. I mean he was the typical looking rich dad type. Absolutely nothing to indicate that he was anything but nice and well-meaning. Hop in, he calls out from the open passenger window. I couldn't believe my luck. Like not only was I about to actually hitchhike for the first time, which felt pretty cool, not gonna lie, but I was able to do so in style. I can't tell the difference between faux leather and the real deal, but when you're in an air-conditioned sedan that still has the new car smell, at 17? Who cares? I felt grown up as hell. So the guy asks me why I'm hitchhiking, and I'll be honest, I may have given him a totally hopped up version of events, which totally made me out to be the victim. Abusive parents, poor me, blah blah blah. Naturally, he takes this as gospel and starts telling me how his father was an alcoholic, how he sympathized with my situation. I asked him to take me as far down the road as he could, and that I had a friend that lived about 30 minutes drive away. He said cool, and down the highway we go. As he's driving, we talk a lot more about family. He pops the glove box and boom, there's a picture of his kids. As I'm looking at his little girls, he starts telling me how important he thinks family is, especially to those of us that come from less than stable backgrounds. Then he said something that seemed completely out of character. We're pulling into a gas station after mentioning that he needs to fill up, continuing the family conversation in segments, if that makes any sense. One minute he'll stop talking, because he needs to focus on a turn or a lane switch, and then he carries on. So it was almost out of nowhere when he said something like, We have to protect our families from our true natures. I didn't know what to say to that, not in that moment. So I just kind of stayed quiet as he gets out of the car and starts filling up the tank. I had a few minutes to process those words, and the more I thought about them, the more I realized that hitchhiking may not have been such a good idea. When he gets back in after paying for the gas, there's a few moments of quiet as I'm still trying to work out just what he meant by his last statement. So I just asked. I straight up asked him what he meant by something so ominous. It'll be easier if I show you. Ever wonder what it would feel like to tuck and roll out of a moving vehicle? Ever tried to imagine it because you're literally about to do it and you're pretty sure it'll kill you at the speeds you're traveling? Probably not. I hadn't. Not until that moment right there. But somehow I convinced myself that I was just being overly dramatic. Too little too late. So I just stayed in the car. I didn't even ask for him to pull over or anything. Looking back on it, I wasn't sure what was going through my head at all. Just that I really, really didn't want to be around this guy anymore. He had gone from nice and normal to moody and creepy in light speed. You know, everyone has secrets, he says after pulling into a dark commercial lot and shutting off the engine. So, imagine that line spoken as creepily as you can imagine, and then double it, and that's what this guy sounded like. I had kept my tone polite up until that point. I needed this guy to get me to my friend's house. But I was all out of cool by then, and I'm literally about to ask him what the hell he's talking about, when he puts his hand on my thigh. He doesn't just put it there either. He puts it there and starts squeezing. Like I said before, he had pictures of his kids, mentioned his wife. He even bitched about his in-laws a little bit during our little family talk. Look, what I'm trying to say is he did what he did because he was a predator. I'm sure of it. He saw someone vulnerable who apparently had a rough childhood or family background and saw someone he could manipulate. It was the look in his eyes. Man, not this vulnerable, I like you look. It was like a hunger. That's the only way I can describe it. Like an excitement before a feast. I just hit him. I'm not some tough guy. I don't do MMA. Hell, I don't even think I landed the punch properly, but I threw it hard enough to let him know that he was not about to molest me in a dark parking lot in the middle of winter. Then, I tried to undo my seatbelt. Tried 
being the operative word. I pushed the little red button, and absolutely nothing happened. No clicking or catching of mechanisms. Nothing. You should have seen this guy smile when that happened. I will never, ever forget that look in his eye. Pure predator. I'm not even ashamed to admit that I started screaming for help, like a little kid. But ever have a nightmare where you try to scream, but your voice keeps catching in your throat? It's so scary because it can literally happen. And it happened to me right there, in that dark parking lot. I'm not even entirely sure what happened next. I remember slamming my fist into the glass window, and it shattering all over me. I know I must have gotten the door open somehow, too. There were headlights behind us. Someone was shouting as they intervened. The predatory driver reached under his seat, and I thought for a moment that he was about to pull out a gun or something. But then, the seat belt felt just loose. I just rolled out of the car as it sped away. In retrospect, I think the guy had a way to unbuckle it like he jury-rigged it under his seat, if that makes any sense. I mean, it was tight as hell, and then, it just wasn't. And then the cops are there. My rescuer must have called, and I'm just numb. Not only because I couldn't believe I had almost gotten myself kidnapped or whatever. I mean, I have no idea what that guy was planning for me. Other than it wasn't good, or innocent. But it was the fact that my own foolish pride, my own self-pity and lies, could have been the things really responsible for what could have easily been an untimely death. When I was 15 years old, my great uncle passed away due to a sudden heart attack. My father and I had to clean out his house. My great uncle was very much loved by all of us and really was one of the nicest and most loving people around. My father was just as broken up about losing him as everyone else was in my family, but the job had to be done. So we arrived at his house early in the morning one day. His house was very neat and well organized, so we would be done in a day or two tops. I remember as a kid we would always play over at his house when my dad had to work. He would let us play anywhere in the house, except the attic. He made it very clear to us going up and down the ladder to the attic was dangerous. Therefore, we never were allowed up there, and we never thought anything of it. Even though he would go up there sometimes for about 30 minutes, and then he would come back down. Never actually bringing anything down with him, or taking anything up there. While we were cleaning, I decided to finally go up to the attic just to see if there was anything there. It was completely empty up there besides two boxes that were tucked away in a corner. Thinking nothing of it as I picked up the dusty boxes and took them downstairs. Once I got to the living room, I opened them expecting to see some papers because the boxes were so light. Instead, I found all these pictures. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of pictures of what I could tell were pictures of different women, all from angles where you could clearly tell they didn't know they were being photographed. He had pictures from daytime to night and from multiple locations. In some pictures they were undressed, and in others they were just doing everyday things like cooking and cleaning. With every picture I looked through, my heart started to beat faster and faster. Looking closer, I realized one of the women was his wife who had passed away several years earlier. I looked on the back of the pictures and they were all named. I didn't want to freak my family out without knowing exactly what I was looking at, so out of curiosity, I googled some of the names and found one of the ladies on Facebook. I was so glad to see that the woman was alive and well. Once finding that out, I showed the pictures to my dad, and he was just as shocked as I was. He took the boxes, and I never saw them again, and we never spoke of it again. Still, every once in a while I find myself wondering why he had those pictures, and if he took them himself, or had someone else take them. I loved my great uncle very much, and couldn't imagine him being anything less than a stand-up guy. 
I don't know what to think. Imagine finding something like that from someone that you've loved. It freaked me out really bad. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old. I'm 31 now. Bear with me as some of the details are a little hazy. I was spending the weekend at my best friend Ben's house. Friday and Saturday, Ben's parents were going to be out late. Ben's older sister lives in the garage that was converted into his studio, which meant that Ben and I would have the whole house to ourselves. Friday after school, Ben's father picked us up, and we went to the video store to rent some horror movies, and then to 7-Eleven to get junk food for our night. We had just finished watching Scream 2, and were about to watch The Wishmaster, when Ben turned to me and said, Let's do something else. I remember it raining that night, and Ben's parents telling us not to play out front, to stay in the backyard. That's exactly what we did. Ben and I loved to play hide-and-seek in his backyard, since it was like a maze back there with low-hanging lemon trees and a couple of paved walkways leading to the garage and leading to the back shed where Ben kept his pet iguana. Rock, paper, scissors, and Ben was the seeker as I went to go hide. Ben would count by the back door, and then would start seeking after counting to 50. Then, if I could make it back to the back door, which we called home free, then Ben would lose that round. Ben started to count, and I ran through the pouring rain to the back of the shed, where I knew he wouldn't find me. I heard him yell, ready or not, here I come. I kneeled down as much as I could, listening for him to get near, so I could run to the porch and be home free. A few minutes later, I heard him walking through leaves on the other side of the shed. I knew he couldn't see me. It was too dark. He got really close and then stopped. I thought to myself, what is he doing? And then I heard some kind of bag rustling. I almost stood up when I heard Ben shout, Hey, I give up. It's too rainy out here. Let's go back in. His voice sounded like he was back on the porch. Then who was standing right next to me? Without hesitation, I darted out as fast as I could to the back porch and told Ben to hurry inside. We ran inside and I locked the door and told Ben, There's someone out there by your shed. After some convincing, he finally believed me. We obviously did not go back out there. His parents got home later that night. We told them what happened. There wasn't much they could do, and I know they didn't call the police, but Ben's dad went out back and locked up the fence. We were told not to play by that shed anymore, and definitely not past sunset. The next morning we got up late and went to the kitchen to eat. Ben walked towards the back door and motioned for me to go over there. I walked over and we both stared at muddy footprints leading to the back door. We always talked about what happened that night, both of us always wondering, who was back there? What was he doing and where did he go? And most of all, what would he have done if he had gotten his hands on us? Years ago, when I was eight years old, my family lived in this big, weird house, kind of on the edge of a small town. The school district was in the middle of a big restructuring, so even though we were only a couple grades apart, my brother and I went to different schools and took different buses. This left me as the last person to leave in the morning and the first person to get home in the afternoon, which meant it was my job to make sure all the lights were off in the morning and that the door was locked. One morning I noticed the basement door was open and the light was on, so before I left, I turned the light off and closed the door. When I got home that afternoon, the light was back on and the door was wide open. I just assumed that I had forgotten to actually take care of it when I noticed it in the morning, so I went over to turn the light off again and closed the door. When I got to the top of the basement stairs, I looked down and there was a man standing at the bottom looking up at me. I slammed the door and pushed a bunch of boxes against it and then went and hid in my closet. 
It was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. This story happened to my best friend and I when we were 16, on Halloween night. It happened at my parents' house, which they still live in. Their house is in a very nice neighborhood, and it has a driveway that stretches very long, about a quarter mile down the street. My parents were gone on this particular Halloween, and my buddy and I were just watching scary movies. My parents had bought several huge bags of candy for the kids who would come by trick-or-treating, there were a lot of other houses on the street, and they knew of a lot of kids that would be coming. The night was passing. We were watching movies, and we realized at about 9.30 that not a single trick-or-treater had come to the house yet. We thought that this was strange, and went out onto the front porch to see if we could spot any trick-or-treaters. The street was far off, and I couldn't see anybody. We decided to walk up the driveway and look down the street, to see if there were any kids coming. We began walking and kicking rocks. About halfway up the driveway we spotted something. There was someone sitting in the driveway, at the start of it, right next to the street. He was sitting in a chair. We stopped walking and looked at this person. We were pretty sure that they were facing the street away from us. The person appeared to be a man with long brown hair we started tripping out, because why in the hell would somebody be sitting in the chair in the driveway? At first we planned on going back to the house, as this was creepy as hell. But curiosity grew too much, and we decided to approach the man. We started slowly walking again, and walked even slower the closer that we got. We eventually reached the man sitting in a chair. My buddy and I looked at each other as if to figure out who was going to say something. I turned back to the man and said, Uh, hello? The man turned his head to the left very fast and yelled, If you come any closer, I will kill you. He then got up and started moving towards us, but we had bolted as soon as he yelled those words. Rocks were being kicked up as we sprinted back to the front porch, and when we reached the front door, I looked down the driveway before we slammed the front door closed and for the briefest of seconds, I saw the man was now standing up, and he was halfway down the driveway, looking towards us. We locked the deadbolt and chain. I ran over to the kitchen phone and dialed my father. It took my parents about an hour to get home from the party they were at, and my buddy and I were scared as hell the whole time. We locked every window, and we were hiding in my dad's office until they arrived. To our surprise, they came into the house with a cop. Apparently, the man sitting in the chair was a disgruntled employee that my father had just let go earlier that day, and he was waiting for him to come home. What was he planning on doing? Who knows? No wonder we didn't see any trick-or-treaters on Halloween that night. They were scared off by this psycho sitting in a chair. Sometimes, the things we say to others can come back to haunt us. Even when it's someone we think that we know well, words and intent can become twisted, especially over the internet. This next story should serve as a strong reminder to be careful of what you may say to others. Although you might mean them no harm, not everyone can take a joke. At the end of 2012, I stumbled upon a male-centered chat room by one of those men's fashion-style magazines. I lurked for a week or two before I decided to officially join discussions. The topics that were thrown around were what you would imagine a bunch of 18-45 to 45 year old guys would talk about. Women, beer, guns, video games, the usual things. Another very common thing that you will see if you spend any time around men is harmless banter. The old yo mama jokes and the type. On occasion, the mean-spirited fellow will come along and take things too far. But normally, most lines are rarely crossed. That being said, 
Almost every one of us men have said something that offended another without meaning to. While speaking face to face, your meaning can occasionally be misconstrued. But online, the chances of this happening can increase greatly. And thinking of what you are about to say is very important. On one occasion, I said something that I didn't feel was that bad. But every day since then, I have wished that I could take it back. I believe I had been a member of the chat for over a year by then. The room was a relatively active one, and I was one of the most active. I had traded friendly barbs back and forth with others so many occasions, and nothing ever became of it. One morning over coffee, I was BSing with a group of three or four other members. All but one guy were long timers. The fourth guy had been around for less than a month. This didn't matter to us though. Regardless of how long you've been around, we welcomed everyone with open arms. If I recollect right, the new guy had made a joking comment about his wife, and others of us did the same. Up to then, all was well with the group. But then I made my own joke about the new guy's wife, and all hell broke loose. To show how little I thought about it at the time, I can't even remember what the joke was about. If I was to guess, it was probably about her weight. If that was the subject, in hindsight, it was likely the wrong thing to mention. But in my defense, I had heard much worse things exchanged there, and no one ever batted an eye. What was said doesn't matter. If it offended the man, then I was out of line, and I take full responsibility for my actions. That morning was a slightly different matter. Even after the guy told me I had gone too far, I disregarded his words and told him to chill out and stop being a wuss. I probably couldn't have said anything worse. The rest of the guys quietly left, and he and I were the only two remaining. No reply came from his end for a long time, and I was just about to log off when he began typing. He demanded that I apologize that second, or he was going to beat an apology out of me. Naturally, this made me chuckle, and I replied by saying, What are you going to do, reach through my computer screen? I still hate myself for being such an a-hole. I don't have to. I know exactly where you live, and to make sure you're paying attention, I know your kids' names, and what school they go to. Now, I was beginning to get angry myself. Threatening my children was way overboard. This made my response to him cruder than usual. I confidently called his bluff. To my surprise, he wasn't bluffing. He would follow up by typing out my full address, including my children's full names, birth dates, and schools. He wanted my full attention, and he most certainly got it. I have never been so terrified in my life. Just to drive his point home, he added by telling me that he lived in the next town over. Even if he was lying about that, I wasn't going to risk it. My reply to him was perhaps the most thought-out apology I had ever given someone, and be sure, I meant each and every word. He made me wait several minutes before he answered. I was beginning to pull my hair out. The relief I felt after reading it was indescribable. Okay, I accept your apology. Let this be a lesson to you. You never know who you're talking to, and what they may know or are willing to do to get back at you. By this point, I was so spent from the shock of the last half hour, I could only answer with thank you. I could only hope he meant what he said, and that my family was safe. In the end, my apology would have never been made if I was the only person in danger. He could come over and do his best at kicking my ass, but the second my family became a target, no matter how mad it made me, I had no other option. You have to believe any man angry enough to threaten another man's kids is crazy enough to carry them out. That's never a thing that should be wagered on. We now move on to this last year. My family and I were at the local Irish festival, having a great time. My run-in with the guy from the chat room 
had faded far from my mind. My daughters were at a booth getting their faces painted, and I was sitting nearby taking a break with my beer. My wife was waiting in line for some food. I was sitting alone, taking in the wonderful smells and sounds filling the air. Out of nowhere, a uniform cop drops down next to me on the bench and says hello. I thought nothing of it and said hello back. Brent wanted me to let you know that he may have forgiven you, but he hasn't forgotten. He pointed you out to me and asked that I pass on this message. We police take good care of each other, you see. Have a fun day. The cop stood up and quietly walked away. I was completely dumbstruck. Not a word could form in my mind. I helplessly scanned the crowd, looking for what? I did not know. My daughters and wife carried on, clueless as to what had just occurred. I spent the remainder of the day constantly looking over my shoulder, while trying to hide my fear from them. A day has not gone by since that I haven't been on guard. This year's festival is soon approaching, and my daughters are highly anticipating it. My instincts tell me not to go, but doing that would only draw questions that I am not ready to answer. More than likely, I'll be spending the weekend there, searching the faces of every strange man and police officer, wondering if my family is safe to enjoy themselves. I can only pray that his anger has cooled over time, and that last year's talk was nothing more than a gentle reminder to be kinder to my fellow man. I have a very scary story to tell. I was out of work and was desperate for cash when I looked on Craigslist under gigs a few years back. I responded to several ads, ranging from painting to helping people move and cleaning. On a Sunday morning, somebody called me and told me they had some work. They said the job was to clean a kitchen inside a small building that was recently closed down and he was renovating it. He needed me to show up and work in the evening, starting at 7 and ending at like 1 or 2 in the morning. And it was for only one night, and he would pay me $200 cash. That sounded great to me, and I had no problem with these hours, as my last job was a graveyard shift anyway. So the man I was talking to gave me the address, and I told him that I would be there on time at 7 o'clock. He sounded like a normal, nice guy. I showed up a little before 7 and approached the building. This building was amongst many others downtown, but looked eerily lonely in the way that it had no windows and no lights were working outside in front of it. I thought it might have been a bar that was closed down or something. I knocked on the big wooden door. I heard noise coming from inside, and eventually a man opened up. He was tall, he had a goatee, and looked to be in his fifties. He greeted me with a smile and asked me to come on in. There was a single lamp lighting the room we were in, and it indeed looked like an old bar. The room wrapped around another smaller room in the center of it. It looked as if he was painting the walls and working to fix the top of the bar, which was rotting old wood. He showed me to the center room, which was a kitchen. The kitchen was very dirty. A couple of old glasses were laying around. The oven was pulled from the wall, showing rotting drywall behind it. Sawdust and dirt was all over everything. He told me I was to clean this kitchen and to get as much done as possible before 2 in the morning, and he pointed out some cleaning products sitting on the ground by the wall, with some rags to scrub with. I asked if he had any gloves, and he said no, but that the sink in the corner still worked, and I could clean my hands when I wanted with that. That sucked, and I was a bit hesitant to clean some of the stuff in here without gloves, but I remembered that $200 that he had promised, and I moved past my disappointment. He told me while I was cleaning he was going to be working outside at the bar. I asked where I should begin, and he said scrubbing the baseboards around the room. I told him that was cool, and he walked out of the room. Fast forwarding. I had been cleaning for about two hours, making a bit of progress, and I was getting very thirsty. I told myself I would finish this, and then that, before exiting the room, to ask if there was anything I could drink. 
I kicked myself for not thinking to bring a water bottle. After finishing my goal, I stood up and realized that I had not heard him working outside the room at all. I hadn't heard anything as a matter of fact. I walked to the door and opened it. To complete darkness. At that instant, I became very nervous and shouted out, Uh, hey man, I'm making some good progress in here. Expecting to hear him respond. He didn't. I looked around but seriously could not see anything. I looked back into the kitchen, which was bright and lit up with all the lights on and working in the ceiling. I began taking steps out into the dark room, and after taking about ten steps, I stopped and was about to speak out again, when to my horror, the door slammed shut behind me. I was now engulfed in blinding darkness. I could not see anything and spun around waving my arms around the room, walking back towards the kitchen door. My steps were small as I was afraid I was going to run into something. And I did. Waving my hands around in front of me, I hit something. Not a door. I hit someone's face. I gasped and scuttled backwards, not hearing anything. Whoever I had just touched didn't react. I backed up until I hit the back wall, and I realized I must have been close to the entrance door to the building. I turned and felt around for a doorknob. Luck was on my side, as I quickly found the doorknob and pulled it open. It was dark outside at this point, and only a very small amount of moonlight came into the room. Just enough to where I could see the man standing against the kitchen door with a blank expression on his face. I ran out the door and never looked back. That's the last time I used Craigslist to find work. What was that guy doing? What was he going to do? Makes me sick to think about it. This happened when I was 18, about 16 years ago. I was still living with my parents in their nice house in suburban Colorado. It was getting late one night, around 11.30 p.m. I was on the phone with my girlfriend and had decided to go up to my room and switch phones, using the one that was in my room so I didn't wake my parents that I assumed were now in bed. Voices downstairs echoed upstairs easily, and I had gotten in trouble for that a few times before. I told my girlfriend to hang on, that I was going to put the phone down for a minute while I went upstairs to turn on my phone. I set the phone down on the counter, right next to where it gets hung up on the wall. I quickly walked upstairs and into my bedroom. My room was cold. I had left the window open. I slammed my window shut and picked up the phone next to my bed. Alright babe, one sec. I'm gonna go downstairs real fast and hang up the living room phone. I set the phone down on my bed and went downstairs. I reached the last step, turned left, and stopped. The phone was now hung up on the wall. I stood there, bewildered, for about 30 seconds. A bit creeped out, but mostly confused. Maybe my parents came down and hung it up? No, that wasn't possible. I would have heard them, and I was upstairs for less than a minute. I walked over to the phone and then turned around, looking around the living room and into the kitchen. No signs of my parents. Nobody else was in my house that night. I convinced myself that I must have hung it up before I went upstairs. But wait, that's not possible. I would have hung up on my girlfriend. I walked into the dining room and nobody was there. I walked back upstairs and over to my parents' bedroom. I pressed my ear to the door and I could hear my dad snoring. I walked into my bedroom and almost had a heart attack when I saw that my bedroom phone was now hung up. I turned around fast to the dark hallway. Nobody. I ran downstairs and to my horror, I saw the phone in the living room was now gone. I got goosebumps all over my body and my heart was now pounding out of my chest. I ran back upstairs and into my room. I ripped open my closet but nobody was there. I walked over to my phone and picked it up, and as soon as I did, I heard someone say, 
I came in through your bedroom window. I almost dropped the phone out of fright and thought, what the hell? That's impossible. My bedroom is on the second story. I turned around again, expecting to see someone, but there was no one there. I turned and opened my window. I looked outside and saw that there was a large extension ladder there, leaning on my house, just below the bottom of my window. I dropped the phone on the ground and ran to my parents' room. I slammed against their door with my fists and yelled, Open the door! There is somebody in the house! My mom opened up and was confused with a terrified look on her face. I went into their room and my dad was sitting up in bed. I locked their bedroom door and repeated myself. There is someone in here. They have the phone. They just said something to me. My mom ran to my dad's side of the bed and grabbed his work cell phone that was still in his jeans pocket. She called the police and they were at our front door knocking about 15 minutes later. They searched the house and found no one. They did find the living room phone though. It was laying in the middle of the grass in our backyard. Something very creepy happened to me on Christmas. I had celebrated the holiday that morning with my family and went to see my parents. On Christmas night, I had to go into work to finish a proposal I was working on for a new potential client. I obviously didn't want to go into work, but it had to be finished. My work was in a building downtown that is fairly close to a few nightclubs and bars. My office is on the 23rd floor, and in my position, I have an office, but most of this floor is filled up with cubicles in the middle. My office is in the far corner next to my boss's office. So to get to my office, I have to walk by all of the cubicles. I didn't get there late, probably around 8 or 9, but there was nobody else there. This was my second time going in alone, and it was peaceful. If I let my imagination run wild, however, I would get spooked easily. As I walked the path next to the cubicles, I was reminded of what was missing at home while looking at all the Christmas lights strung up decorating people's workspaces. There was no lights on, but the place was lit up enough by all of the Christmas lights. I reached my office and unlocked it. I went inside, but didn't close the door. My computer and desk faced away from my door, so I couldn't see anyone that approached my door on work days through the huge glass window that I had. I found this annoying, as I never knew who was knocking until I got up and opened the door. I sat down and began working as quickly as possible so I could get back home. After a while, I'd say about an hour into it, I heard the main entrance door close. I didn't hear it open, but when it closed it made a noise that was unmistakable. I wasn't spooked at this point, just curious as to who else was unlucky enough to have to come in and finish something. I got up from my desk and walked out onto the floor. I looked around, but didn't see anyone. I said loudly, Hello? Nobody responded. At this moment I got paranoid and freaked out because I definitely heard the main entrance door close. Somebody was either here and then left, or was still in here and not responding to me. I was just about to turn around and get back to work when I saw a head sticking up out of a cubicle on the opposite side of the floor, looking at me. I could see that it was a man, but couldn't make out any details of his face. I thought that he must be messing with me, so I shouted over to him. What a time to have to come in, huh? The man didn't move, so I tried again and said, I can see you, guy. He didn't move. I wasn't sure what to do next, so I felt through my pocket for my keys and they were there. I started walking down the path towards the entrance door, the whole time watching this guy. I looked over at the entrance door for a second, just one second, and then looked back. He was gone. After seeing this, I was convinced that he was moving closer to me, so I ran the rest of the way to the door and went through it. 
I jogged over to the elevator and hit the button. I turned around quickly, and the door closed as it made the same noise as before. The door thankfully opened immediately and I went inside and hit the first floor button. The door closed and I didn't see the guy come out that door. I drove home and told my wife what happened. I had to call my boss and tell him as well, so I had a reason for not finishing my proposal that night. He was understanding, and I went back in two days later with everyone else. I never found out who that guy was or what that was all about. Nothing was stolen or tampered with, to my knowledge. This happened to me about 15 years ago. I lived near the ocean, and I frequented a certain spot on the beach all the time. It was a lonely spot, and not many people ever really showed up there. This one Saturday afternoon, I was laying out in the sand in my spot, relaxing and tanning like I always did. It's not uncommon for me to fall asleep. I did sometimes if the sun wasn't too hot on my skin. This one particular day, I did. I woke up a while later to the sun now setting, and realized I had slept for quite a while. I looked to my left, and saw a woman sitting near me, in the sand, but not on a towel. She was wearing jean shorts and a bathing suit top, and she had really pretty red hair. At first, I didn't really acknowledge her, but after glancing at her a few times, I noticed that she was just staring out into the ocean, and didn't turn to look at me or anything for that matter. I felt a bit of curiosity and said hello to her. She said hello right back without turning her head to look at me. Right after that she sprung to her feet and walked away. I thought that was weird but didn't think anything really of it. About 30 minutes later I packed up my stuff and left. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary and I had a great day relaxing at the beach like I always did. Once I was home I started making myself dinner. I heard my phone ring and walked over to my purse on the counter and pulled it out. It was my mom, and we started talking about the usual things when I noticed a square folded piece of paper sticking out in my purse in the midst of our conversation. My mom continued talking, and I pulled it out and unfolded it, confused, because I was pretty sure I didn't put it there. I literally dropped the phone when I read what was written. It was a note and it said, I was going to rob you and stab you in the throat, but you just looked so peaceful. I picked up the phone and told my mom what happened, remembering that girl on the beach. We both nearly passed out. I started work as a mailman a few months ago, and just last week, I had an extremely bad experience. There's this one house, every time I deliver there, I see a person watch me through their window, and I mean every single time. I had always chalked this up to be an elderly person who has nothing better to do, and after a while of it happening, it didn't freak me out as much. One day though, I had to finish delivering mail on another carrier's route that had an emergency and had to stop early. When I was finished with theirs, I had to finish my own. As I made it to this one particular house where the person watched me every day, I saw that they were not there at the window. This made me happy, but also kind of made me nervous for some reason. I dropped the mail into their slot and continued on. I had three more houses before I had to return to my truck to grab all the mail for the next street. When I got back to the truck, I saw a weird-looking lady standing under the streetlight behind it. She looked like she was on drugs. She had stains all over her clothing. When she smiled at me, I noticed that she was missing teeth. She then said hello. I said it back and started gathering the mail for the next street. I couldn't see her as I did this and I felt like she was walking up behind me. I turned around and she was indeed closer than she was before. Standing in the street, I asked her if she needed something, and she said, no. I then said back, 
Okay, well I'm going to continue on. Have a good day. With all the mail ready to go, I closed the back door, made sure it was all locked up and started walking. I felt relieved to be walking away from this crazy looking woman. I delivered to about six houses when I noticed the woman standing next to a truck in the shadows. She was following me. I'm sure that she thought that I couldn't see her there. I continued on, and after every other house, I saw that she was keeping up and trying to hide, and this was so creepy. There was nobody else around, and I felt like she would attack me at any moment. I delivered the mail to another house, and sure enough, when I walked back to the sidewalk, I could see her standing in a shadow by a big tree across the street. I decided I could not continue my night like this, and walked over to her. She stiffened up when I approached her and I said, Why in the hell are you following me? She didn't respond and instead made my heart sink as she let out a noise only a crazy person would make. A noise like she was scared of me, but it sounded really odd. She then ran away. She was definitely on some kind of drugs, and the next day when I came to that house where I would always see somebody there watching me through the window, she was there and I know that it was her. The following story happened when I was 16, and still to this day, I reflect on it from time to time. A bit of background. I live in Australia, and live reasonably close to a royal national park where this story takes place. If you aren't familiar with the park, it is a large area over 100 kilometers in space with winding roads and nothing but brushland that are quite fun to drive through. On a night like any other, I was doing just that. I was a passenger in my friend Ash's car, and my brother Lucas was with us. It was approximately 1 a.m., and we were driving deeper into the park as we had done hundreds of times before. As we came quickly around a bend in the route, we were face to face with a girl standing at the edge of the road, close to one of those barriers, as we must be near a cliff. She looked to be in her teens, her age I couldn't be 100% sure. Though this sounds cliche, I swear she was wearing some kind of white dress and was pale faced. I am an avid horror movie fan, so I understand how this all sounds. Her immediate appearance wasn't what was concerning to us. We had stopped virtually in the middle of the road, and the car's headlights were shining directly on her. We became uneasy when the girl did not blink, flinch, or move a muscle, despite facing us directly. I remember wondering why she would be out here standing in the pitch black night. I can't remember if my brother or our friend suggested it, but someone said, Should we go see if she needs help? In that moment, so many questions were racing through my mind. I think I was the first to speak and said no, firmly. As much as I wanted to help someone, I reasoned with the boys, saying that if she was in trouble and needed help, she would have indicated it by now. I also suggested that it could be some kind of trap used to distract us, and someone could be nearby to attack us if we aided her. After what felt like hours, though, really... It was only a minute. We got the hell out of there. We had to drive past her to continue our route and couldn't do a U-turn or a three-point turn because the road was too narrow. As we drove past her, I was in the back seat and turned my head to watch her. I still get chills when I think about this, but that girl's head turned slowly in sync with the car's movements and watched us drive away. I kept my eyes on her and still she did not blink or move as the light around her started to dim until she was in the darkness once again, and I could no longer see her face. Oddly enough, the three of us didn't mention it the next day, or for a very long time. At least I don't remember having a conversation about it with Lucas. It was only a few years later, when I had started to question if I had dreamed it, when I asked my brother and our friend, if they remembered that night. To my horror, and somewhat relief, 
they did. They recalled the details as I had recalled them, so I knew it was real. Over the years I have wondered what became of her. I regret not going to the police, and you may ask why I would even go to the police if she had done nothing wrong. Truth be told, there are no residents that deep in the park, and she was a good hour's walk or so from the nearest highway. I have gone back to the park several times since, specifically to try to find the girl or see if there would be a common occurrence. I have researched online for any clues as to who she might have been. On one drive when I was searching, I said to a friend of mine, Nick, who was happy to come along, that there could be bodies in the brush and no one would know. A week after I said this, the dead body of a man was found a few feet away from the road in the brush by a motorist who had stopped to relieve himself. It was in the news and it makes me wonder how many people are out there in that park. But most of all, who was that girl that we saw that night? I was ten years old and being wheeled into the hospital late at night. Once I was inside, I remember the doctor telling my parents that I had pneumonia and my mom started to cry. Those are the only things I remember about my visit up until I was left alone on the first night. I have no idea what time it was when this occurred, but probably very late. Everyone else in the rooms around me were sleeping, and so was I, until I heard something. I was facing the center of the room when I opened my eyes. I heard someone's shoes squeaking on the floor outside my hospital room. I turned over and saw a nurse walk by, but she had walked out of my vision, past my window before I could see her face. About two seconds passed, and then I saw her walk by again. This is when my heart stopped beating because of what exactly I saw. She was walking by at a very fast pace and was looking at me through the window in an exaggerated stare, meaning she was walking by but her head turned completely to the right side as she did, not able to see in front of her as she walked, and just staring at me. Very quickly she was out of sight again, and then suddenly she started walking by again, in the opposite direction. She was walking back and forth in front of my window. This time her head turned completely to the left, again, staring into my eyes. She had brown hair that was messy, and she looked insane. On this pass, I noticed that her eyes were opened very wide. At this point, I thought my heart would explode because of how it was beating and how scared I was. Nobody else was in sight. When she walked out of my vision, two seconds later, she was walking by again, every time her head turned to the side looking at me. I remember thinking, even at ten years old, that something about her was very wrong. I didn't move a muscle and could do nothing except just watch this incredibly scary woman walk back and forth in front of my window. One of the times she walked by, she was smiling, a huge, sickening smile that made tears well up in my eyes. Every time she walked by, she could not see what was in front of her, because the only thing she wanted to see was me, in my bed, through my window. It seemed like several minutes had passed until finally, finally she did not walk by again. She simply walked by one last time and then was gone. I sat there in my bed and peered out my window, expecting her to walk by again at any moment, but she didn't. I must have stared out my window for the better part of an hour before my eyes got so heavy that I fell asleep. The next morning I awoke with my dad sitting in my chair next to my bed reading a book. He smiled when he saw that I was awake, and I told him what I saw before I fell asleep that night. He didn't seem to be scared, or even very alarmed. He asked me if I was sure that it wasn't a dream. I was 100% sure then, and I am 100% sure now. The woman was real, and it happened. She was wearing the same thing as every other nurse that I saw. I was in that hospital for three days. 
and didn't see her again. This happened two years ago on our anniversary. My wife and I were celebrating three years married and we decided to both take a day off work and go for a drive down to the beach. It was a bit of a drive about three hours one way. The drive was amazing. We had fantastic conversation and enjoyed all the sights on the way out there. When we arrived, there was only a few hours left of daytime left, but we didn't mind. We kind of liked the idea of walking along the sand at night to look at the stars and listen to the ocean peacefully without the usual noise that comes with visiting the beach. We ate dinner at a nice steakhouse right on the water, and when we finished, we decided it was time to hit the beach, finally. From the restaurant, we walked to our car, which was parked in the lot right next to the beach entrance. My wife grabbed a sweater and a blanket, while I grabbed a six-pack and a small cooler that I had brought. We headed towards the sand and went through a very old wooden fence with an opening cut out. We walked out towards the water and marveled at the sight of it and the moon lighting our way beautifully. We stopped and chose a nice spot about 30 yards away from the waves crashing against the sand and about 70 yards I'd say from the wooden fence leading back to our car. We unfolded the blanket and sat down on top of it. After a few minutes of talking, kissing and drinking, we laid down. We were truly amazed by all the stars in the sky, and it was a gorgeous sight. I'd say about 15 minutes later I felt a presence. I was still watching the stars, but I felt like there was somebody watching us. I sat up and noticed that my wife had drifted off to sleep. I looked around the beach and saw nothing. Complete serenity. Then, I turned completely around. About 15 feet away, was a man sitting behind us in the sand. This caught me completely off guard and scared the hell out of me, mainly because he didn't speak when he noticed that I had seen him. He sat in the sand very close to us with a giant smile on his face. A giant, extremely creepy smile. I was in shock to see this, and at first was not even able to speak. I glanced at my wife who was completely asleep and at that moment, I'm not sure why, but I felt like our lives were in very real danger. I looked up and the man reacted. His smile disappeared and turned into an angry look. He then pulled out a knife from behind him. I shook my wife awake. My wife woke up immediately and spun around to see what I was looking at. At that moment, he smiled at her, and my wife gasped when she saw that he had a knife. When she did this, he stood up and then took a step towards us. That's when I got to my feet and said, What do you want? You can have our phones and our keys, but I don't have any cash. The man looked completely crazy, which was terrifying. He wore a brown suit all ripped up. It looked like it came out of a trash can. He was bald and he looked homeless. He did not respond to me. After about 15 seconds of unnerving silence, he did something. He ran up to us very quickly, and my wife screamed. He stopped before he stepped foot onto our blanket, and once again, his smile turned into a crazy and angry-looking frown. I spoke one last time. Dude, you can have everything. Just be cool. You can have my beer. My voice was cracking. I was petrified. I tried to humanize this guy and make him feel almost welcome to our stuff, like his knife wasn't a big deal. He then spoke to us. He said in a normal and sane voice, I don't drink. Then he turned around and started walking away from us. Relief hit me like a ton of bricks. He continued walking away and then turned around again. He didn't look at us, but instead looked up at the sky. Then he turned around again and made his way through the fence and disappeared into the town. My wife started tearing up, and I said, let's go. We very quickly grabbed our belongings and started walking towards our car. 
When we got to our car, we saw people outside the restaurant talking and laughing. They had no idea what we just experienced. We got inside the car and drove away. We were pretty much silent on the way back home. My wife just hung her head out the window. We haven't gone back to that town since. I am in my thirties, and I am about to tell you of the scariest night of my life. I had just gotten home from work at around 6 p.m. My wife and daughter had decided to visit my wife's parents that evening, and left my young son and myself alone. It was a long, tough day at work, and I found myself drifting off while reading on my bed. Meanwhile, my son was watching TV in his room. His door was shut. I drifted off into full-on slumber when something awoke me. Not a sound or anything. Just a sickening feeling of dread. I got up out of bed and saw that my dog was laying on the ground next to the bed, as she was when I laid down a little over two hours ago. It was around 8.30 at this time now, and I realized my wife and daughter were still gone. I walked into the living room and found my house to be completely dark. I walked to my son's bedroom and opened the door. Extreme uneasiness came over me as I opened his door to darkness and he was no longer there. I immediately did an about face and stomped down the hall, yelling his name. No response. I stood in the pitch black kitchen for a moment, trying to comprehend what was happening and where my son could be. I pulled my cell phone out of my pocket and dialed my wife. Hello? Baby, is John with you? Did you guys come home? I felt my heart sink into my stomach when she said a firm and confused, No. She then asked, What do you mean? Where is he? I stood in the darkness and felt like I was going to explode with pure fear. He's not in the house. I'm calling Brandon's house. He's probably... My wife cut me off in a bold tone. What do you mean? Okay, call his house. I told her that I would call her right back. I called Brandon's house phone, and his mother answered after three rings. Hi, Teresa. Is John over there? She sounded confused and replied, Yes. You didn't know he came over? The amount of relief I felt, I cannot tell you. I told Brandon's mother to send John home immediately, that he was in big trouble. They only lived six houses down from us, on the same street, but my son was nine years old. I should have called the police that night, and I will tell you why. My wife got home pretty quick after that, with my daughter. John walked in the door like nothing was wrong. What the hell do you think you're doing leaving the house without my permission? He looked at me like I was insane. Dad, you said I could go. I asked you. I glared at him with an equally puzzled look on my face. When? No, I did not. When you were outside my bedroom door playing. My look of confusion turned into sheer terror. What are you talking about? I fell asleep on my bed. I was never playing outside your door. My son responded, You knocked and I said come in, and you were laughing. You were playing. I asked if I could go to Brandon's and you said yes. At this point I was a mixture of extreme confusion and fear. John, I've been asleep. I never said you could go. I was never playing outside your door. Fast forward a bit now. I had chalked this up to a misunderstanding. My son was either lying to me or was hearing things or I had done these things and had no memory of it somehow. Because of how tired I was, perhaps? I really didn't know. That night we were all laying in bed, and I was laying there in the darkness, my wife asleep. We had a back door connected to our master bedroom. The back door had a huge glass window on it, almost the full length of the door, and I could see the entire backyard. It was a normal thing for me to look out there periodically throughout the night, because it was right in my line of sight when I would lay on my right side. 
While laying there, trying to make sense of the earlier incident, I felt the blood in my veins turn from a warm flow to an icy cold current. There was a man crouched down in my backyard underneath my trampoline. I lay there frozen with fear, probably for about two or three minutes. The man did not move. I don't think he could see that I was looking at him. Suddenly, the man forced me to react. He moved quickly out from underneath the trampoline and towards my daughter's bedroom window, which was just out of my view. Just as quickly as that happened, I heard my daughter scream. No exaggeration, I was out of that bed and in her room in less than five seconds. In the midst of her scream, my son opened his door as I flew by, my wife right behind me. I switched on her light to see her sitting up in bed screaming, pointing at her bedroom window, glaring at the maniac with his palms pressed against her glass, laughing hysterically. I gasped, grabbed my daughter and all of us ran into the kitchen, where I grabbed the house phone off the wall and dropped it due to the speed that I had tried to do so. I picked it up off the ground and very shakily dialed 911. The man's laugh had ceased and none of us moved. My wife and I clutched kitchen knives as the four of us crouched in the dark and waited for the police to come. To my surprise, they showed up very quickly and knocked on the front door. I let them in and told them what had happened. They walked through the whole house and then into the backyard. They found nothing. After talking with the cops for a while and puzzling all the pieces together, I concluded that the man had been in my house earlier that evening while I slept and played a little game with my son. To this day I have no idea why this happened, who this man was, or what happened to him. But none of us ever saw him again. He was never caught. I bought a gun very shortly after this incident, and I pray that I never see this man around my family again, or I will kill him. When I was little, like six or seven, I had dreams that I would wake up late at night and see my mom smiling and standing in the darkness of my bedroom, watching me sleep. I would call out to her, but she couldn't hear me. She would just smile and look at me. This was a recurring dream for years, and it was beyond terrifying. When I was about eleven, my parents separated, and I went to live with my dad. Although I had told my friends about these dreams, for some reason, I never talked about it with my dad, until this one random night that we were eating dinner. I asked my dad what he thought the dreams meant. He stopped eating and sat there for a minute, and then finally said, You weren't dreaming, buddy. Your mom has had mental problems her entire life. She loves you very much, but you weren't dreaming. She would go into your room and watch you sleep sometimes. This sent a shiver down my spine, and after a minute or two, we resumed eating. That night, while laying in bed, I realized something. Why did my mom not respond when I called out to her? She would just stand there and smile at me. The time this story happened was only a year ago, me being 15 and living with, at the time, just my mom and my 10-year-old brother. My dad was staying somewhere else for the time being. At this time in the story, we were moving from house to house, financially not very stable, but getting by. We had found a house conveniently right next to one of the largest cemeteries in town, and I didn't mind it, but both my brother and my mom found it creepy. The house had three stories if you included the basement. Something about that basement scared me. It always felt like something or someone was down there. And that whole year we lived there, I never stepped foot down there. Not once. To give some context, 
My room was upstairs. There were three rooms up there, and I'll tell you how it looked for the sake of the story. There was the staircase that went up to a landing, and then a smaller staircase leading to the second floor. My room was the first thing that you saw. My brother's room was to the right of it, and the extra room was to the left. My mom kept the extra room locked, saying that it was unsafe to be in there. Everything about this house felt wrong. According to both of my parents, the house was extremely old, being built in the 1800s. It was freaky. All the doors had those creepy old keyholes, and the way that the house was structured seemed unnatural and weird. The turns and placement of rooms was odd, only making the house seem creepier. I never minded it until this happened. I had been texting my friend Chloe before deciding to set my phone down and finally get some sleep. I don't remember what time it was, but it was late. I fell asleep rather quickly, being worn out from school and stress. However, I'm a light sleeper. Any noise could wake me up. I was turned on my side facing the wall when I heard the loud creaks of the stairs. The steps stopped at the landing, creaking ever so slightly, as if someone was rocking on their feet. I ignored it, but it did make my heart race as I heard the steps begin again, stopping at the top of the stairs. It was probably my brother. No big deal. Closing my eyes, I heard my door creak open, and footsteps come into my room, stopping at the edge of my bed. Someone was standing over me, just watching. A bit freaked out, I did a side glance and out of the corner of my eye, I saw my brother standing over me, and letting out an annoying grunt, I asked, What do you want? There was no response. Sighing and closing my eyes, I rolled onto my side. I opened my eyes to look at him again, and my heart stopped. He wasn't there. Standing up, I trudged to his room, but he wasn't there. No one was there. After that, I felt uneasy as I turned to go back to my room, but I froze. That door that was always locked was open. Did he go in there? I remember going in and grabbing my phone, turning on the flashlight and just standing there, staring at my floor. Something felt so wrong. My gut told me that I wasn't alone. There was someone in there with me, and they were not good. Slowly I went to shine my light into the room to see if my brother was there. There was nothing. At this point I heard my heart pounding in my ears as I shut the door quietly going back to my room. I told myself it was my imagination as I laid back in bed and closed my eyes. I fell asleep eventually, silently muttering prayers under my breath to put my mind at ease. I did question my brother the next morning if he had gone upstairs, but he just told me no. Ever since that night, every night I hear footsteps coming from upstairs and they stop at my door. I began to have nightmares of a very tall man coming up from the basement and to my door, peering his pale face inside to look at me with his unnaturally wide and terrifying smile. Not only that, but the door that my mom kept locked since then would be found wide open almost every morning I woke up. Something was wrong with that house, and I'm just glad we don't live there anymore. I remember back when I was seven, my family and I moved into a new house. We had only been there for a few months, and our next door neighbors were constantly fighting. Our houses were fairly close, almost a full arm's length away from one of our windows. One night, as my sisters and I were getting ready for bed, we heard the usual arguing and thought nothing of it. The next day after I finished getting dressed for school, I walked outside my front door and as I was walking up to the front gate, I noticed something to my left in my neighbor's front yard. It was the young woman, just laying on the ground on her back. I vividly remember the way she looked. She was wearing a pink shirt, 
and her right arm was stretched out towards the fence. My mom came out next and saw her right away. She quickly rushed me and my sisters into the car and dropped us off at school. When I got home that day, there was police tape blocking off the neighbor's house, and that's when I realized that she had been dead. I honestly thought that she had passed out from drinking or something, but she was murdered by her lover, stabbed in the stomach multiple times. I'm originally from Arizona, but I grew up in Nebraska, in a small town about an hour south of the South Dakota border. My life leading up to my living in Nebraska was riddled with abuse and a lot of childhood trauma. My biological father was abusive, and my mother was absent for part of my childhood. I am also bipolar and take daily medication to make my quality of life better because of what happened to me as a child. I currently reside in Oklahoma. To start, I never really experienced anything paranormal growing up. That is until my mom's boyfriend, whom she is still with to this day, came into our lives. He was a good man and ran a small hardware store at which my mom also worked. Before meeting him, she was married to an awful man that did terrible things to me, many of which I still go to therapy for to this day. After the divorce, we spent a lot more time at her boyfriend's house. The house was built in the early 1900s, and it was absolutely huge and beautiful. She never told us at first that it used to be an old mortuary. Her boyfriend's father, who moonlighted as a mortician, ran the hardware store in town, which was passed down to his son upon his death. Even after telling my brother and I, my brother being 12 and I 15 at the time, that the house was an old mortuary, it never really bothered us. We spent our summers there swimming and playing PlayStation 3, and genuinely having a good time. Quite honestly, the best summers of my teen years. I enjoyed it. The home was warm and inviting. That is, until you got to the basement. The steps leading down to the basement were steep, about ten of them before you reached the bottom. The basement had flooded many times before, so there was no carpet, just cold cement. Immediately to the right was a refrigerator, the washer and dryer, and the cubicle shower, which was flush against the wall and was positioned so it was directly behind you when you came down the stairs. If you walked forward, there were two couches positioned in an L-shape to the right. The longest one pushed against the west wall. To the left were two brick pillars that acted as support beams for the house, spaced five feet apart with a dirty old blanket hanging between them as a shield. Behind the blanket was a vertical rectangle of a room. One half was a wooden workbench of old tools and trinkets, a random toilet that actually worked, and in the far left corner of the rectangle was a small pile of remnants from when the house was an acting mortuary. There was a bathtub, no longer operational, piles of wood shelving, and a small metal table on wheels. I always felt anxious going into the basement. I never could figure out why, but the atmosphere down there made me feel uneasy. I would sometimes come down to the basement to get a soda from the refrigerator, and I always had the feeling of static across my back, my neck, and my shoulders. It would make my hair stand on end, and I never walked up the stairs like normal people do. I walked backwards, because there was always the feeling of someone right behind you, making your fight or flight response kick in. It was definitely not my favorite place to be. My first encounter happened when I saw a shadow dart across the wall as I came down to get a soda. I knew the shadow wasn't my own, and I even tried to duplicate it, but I couldn't. The shadow passed along the ground level window almost eight feet up. There's no way it was mine. I left quickly and slammed the door shut behind me, but the main incident that cemented my belief in the paranormal happened when I was 15. 
I had just gotten back from swimming all day, and I was sunburned and looking forward to rinsing off. But of course, the only shower in the house was, you guessed it, in the basement. I grabbed some clothes and headed down to get it over with. I didn't want to be down there longer than I had to. I grabbed a towel from the wire rack above the washer and dryer, turned on the water, got undressed, and hopped in. The glass in the little shower was tempered, meaning you could see blobs of shapes and colors, but no real definition. I was rinsing off and proceeded to close my eyes and put my head under the stream of water. I moved out of the way, wiped my eyes, and opened them. I froze. Through the glass, I could see someone standing there to the left. My mom was upstairs taking a nap, and my brother was on the second floor playing PlayStation. There would be no reason for either of them to be down there, especially standing still looking at me. I stared at the shape through the glass. That feeling of unease came over me again, but stronger this time. I stood there for a moment, gathering up the courage to open the door. Slowly, I pushed it open, never taking my eyes off of the figure. But when I opened the door, there was nothing. No one was there. I looked around, surveying the area, and when I was satisfied that I was alone, I closed the door, and the figure was gone. I hurriedly finished my shower, threw on a towel, and started to back up, up the stairs. Every step I took, I could feel the sense of unease growing, like an unseen mass filling the room. This happened many more times over the next few years, but I continued to see the shadow. I did my best to ignore it, but the feeling of unease never wavered. I never showered with either the basement door or the shower door closed again. Water on the floor be damned. Last year around this time, I was at a Christmas party at my friend John's house. I didn't really know anyone there and didn't do much talking. Everyone at the party seemed very nice. About an hour after I arrived, we started playing a game called the White Elephant. It's where you trade gifts among everyone, and everyone has an opportunity to steal a gift from someone else if they like it more than what they have. I had never played it before, but I'm pretty sure that's how it worked. In the middle of the game, a woman opened an envelope and read a note that was inside. Her face turned red, and she became noticeably very uncomfortable and started looking around and was repeating, This isn't funny. Everyone wanted to know what the note said, and she started to read it out loud, and then stopped. She couldn't do it. She handed the note to a man next to her. His face turned red as well and he seemed uncomfortable too. Now everyone was demanding to know what it said. He gulped and started to read the words aloud. I have killed six people. This is not a joke. The room became quiet and deadly serious when moments before everyone was laughing. There were gasps and a couple people said things like, Very funny. It was very clear that the joyous mood was now shattered. Some people started yelling and demanding to know who wrote it. I eventually asked to see it, and when it was handed to me, I saw that it was typed. People began to argue very intensely, and I quickly grabbed my coat from the couch in the other room and told John that I was going to take off. He nodded and was trying to calm people down. I walked out the door into the fresh falling snow. I haven't spoken with John too much since then, but I did ask him once if he found out who wrote the note, and he said no, that the party broke up shortly after I left. I often wonder if it really was not a joke, and somebody had confessed in a very twisted way to being a serial killer. During this last winter, my friends and I were doing urbex, and we decided to check out the infamous asylum on the edge of town. For the story's sake, 
I'll call my friends, Steve, Joe, and Richard. We decided to go at night to avoid unwanted attention from the security that patrols the grounds. Driving up to the place, you can truly see what 30 years of abandonment can do to a building. Vines growing up the sides, busted out windows, animals claiming the building as theirs, and of course, the graffiti. Steve parked his car behind some brush to remain hidden from the street. We started to walk to the patient housing and treatment building. Only brightened by the moonlight, we could see the beautiful early 1900s architecture of the four-story building. As our group climbed over the fence, we approached the entrance and put on our respirators. As we opened the old paint-chipped door, we instantly saw a looming staircase that went to the first floor. Once we climbed the stairs, we noticed that it led to the dormitories, but the staircase kept going up three more floors. I came up with the idea to split into two groups so that we could cover more ground and try to find something cool. So Joe and I, the two youngest of the group, decided that we would venture to the second floor while Steve and Richard would explore the first. We told each other good luck and headed up to the second floor. Using our phone's flashlights, Joe and I were able to make out the words, patient treatment and offices, on the old metal door. To our surprise, it was unlocked and we found ourselves facing a seemingly never-ending system of hallways. Most of the rooms contained those old hydrotherapy bathtubs. We stumbled onto the Urbex gold mine. We were so anxious to explore the rest. I noticed that Joe stopped walking, as if he was listening to something. I said, Joe, what are you... until I was cut off by Joe shushing me. He then pointed to his ear and pointed below us. I stopped to listen and could make out a faint voice of two men humming. I told Joe, it's probably just Steve and Richard. It was at that moment that we both turned our heads to the door that we entered through, and right when we did, the metal door slammed shut with force. Steve? Joe said nervously. The only response that we got was more of the humming, no more than ten yards away. This was our cue to leave. We sprinted down two long winding hallways and all the while could hear pounding footsteps right behind us. When we got to the end of the hallway, I could make out an old fire exit sign with the glow of my light. Joe and I barely made it to the door and slammed it shut. Through the small busted pane of glass of the door, I could make out three dark figures, at least, ten feet from the door. We found the stairs and pretty much jumped down them and then bursted out the exit. I don't think Joe or I have ever climbed a fence that fast in our lives. We didn't stop running until we got to the car. To our surprise, Steve and Richard were both sitting in the front seats. We screamed to unlock the doors and frantically told Steve to drive away. Steve looked confused driving away, leaving that nightmare of a place behind us. Richard wanted to stop and get coffee, and during this time, they told us what they experienced. As Joe and I went upstairs, Steve and Richard entered the dormitory space. They checked out a couple of rooms but said that they were all empty, so Steve wanted to call me to check if we found anything cool. But it went directly to voicemail, so Steve and Richard figured that we just left the building. When Joe and I asked if they had heard humming, they just looked at us as if we were crazy. That was the first time I went to that asylum and it will certainly be the last. This all happened about five years ago or so, and in a pretty short time frame. We had been living in our old house for almost three or four years at the time, and we were good friends with the family that lived across the street. The family, or at least the parents, had a bucket list item to move to a European country for a couple years or so. They finally had the means to fulfill their dreams and went for it. However, they didn't sell their house. Instead, they rented it out to a couple different families during their absence and moved back in after they came back. The first family that moved in were nice, 
if a bit reserved and mysterious. I think they had moved before the end of the school year, so I never got to know them well. The second family, on the other hand, was a different story. The family that moved in had three kids, an infant who isn't important to the story, a girl who I'll call Doris, and a boy who I will call Alex. Being good neighbors, our family introduced ourselves to them and had the normal conversations people have when people move into the neighborhood. The parents seemed nice and all, but as a 12-year-old, I was more interested to talk to their kids. Both my sister and I were a few grades above both Alex and Doris. Doris was the older of the two and was a lot calmer than Alex. She was holding a small conversation with us while Alex was talking non-stop. I basically only fit in one-word responses to his questions because he talked so much. Eventually the parent conversation ended and we went back home. I remember thinking afterward that the kid was nice, but there was a big age difference between us, maybe five years or so, which seems like a lot for kids, and that I wasn't really interested in hanging out with him. Well, of course, my parents wanted to be friendly with the neighbors, so anytime Alex and Doris came to our house and asked to play, we were forced to. It wasn't the worst, especially since they had moved in during the summer, and us being so young, we didn't really have anything better to do. We would do the usual kid stuff, like messing around on bikes or making up some sort of game, but it was more for their enjoyment than ours, because my sister and I were starting to grow out of that stuff. I was in middle school at this point, so when school started up again, I couldn't spend time with Alex as much anymore. I can attest to that being the mindset of children. As the school year continued, it got to the point where I really didn't have time to spend with him, and if I did, I wanted to spend it doing anything else, so I would just lie and say that I was busy. He would proceed with a follow-up question something along the lines of, why not? My response would always be like, because I have homework, or something like that. One actual excuse that I used was, I can't because my parents aren't home, which was a rule they had instated. It bothered me that someone would be so nosy like that, and it wasn't just him. Doris would also ask my sister the same follow-up questions as well. We had found out recently that they were from a different country, so we chalked it up to it being a cultural thing. So up until now, it doesn't seem like much, right? But this is where it gets strange. One day, about halfway through the school year, my parents had left me home alone and were gone with my sister somewhere. My parents had trusted me staying home alone for a number of years at that point, so it wasn't too uncommon. As a side note, they tried the babysitting thing one time, but I had no idea why since by that time I had already proven myself to be responsible at home by myself. I mostly spent my time in my bedroom. I was watching YouTube or browsing some site when I realized that I was getting hungry, so I decided to go grab a snack. Now, my bedroom was at the front of our house, and it sat to the left of the front door from the inside. The kitchen was literally ten feet from my bedroom to the other side of the front door, so I walked out, looking down, as I continued to watch YouTube on our family iPad. When I looked up towards the kitchen, I jumped and felt my heart stop when I looked through the kitchen doorway. Alex was standing in my house, in the middle of the kitchen. I caught my breath and was able to ask him what he was doing. He simply responded with, I just wanted to ask if I can play with you. I was completely taken back. All I could conjure up as a response was to tell him that my parents weren't home, and that meant that I couldn't play right now. I don't remember his response, but I do remember him walking out of the house, and then I immediately locked the door afterward. There's a few things that really scared me about this event when I think about it in hindsight. The front door in that house, which I guess I forgot to lock, is really loud. I hear it every time someone comes and leaves, so if that's how he came in, I don't know how I didn't hear him. The other thing that scares me in hindsight is that he knew where my bedroom was, so I don't know why he went to the kitchen instead of my room, and if he did come to my room, I guess I just didn't notice him, or maybe 
he just creepily stared at me before going to the kitchen. Unfortunately, this wasn't the last time he entered our house uninvited. He came in twice more. The second I don't remember well, but I think he entered our back door and just made himself at home in our living room. And on the other time, he tried getting into our house through the backyard because he heard me and some friends hanging out. My mom actually caught him on the third time and talked to his mom after that. There were two other significant incidents that I can remember. First was the last time he tried entering our house uninvited. The difference this time is that he didn't make it in. My sister and I were in the living room home alone when we heard the doorbell ring. I was able to peek out without them seeing and confirm that it was Alex, but this time he was accompanied by Doris. We both didn't have to go through the merry-go-round of explaining why we couldn't play, so we just ignored it and went back to what we were doing. They rang maybe twice more before they seemingly left. I went into the kitchen to grab a snack or something and looked out the kitchen window. I was surprised to see Alex and Doris not walking home, but walking along the side of our house. We had most of our blinds down, but I saw them trying to look in. I was extremely creeped out and suddenly just got this sick feeling, telling me that we needed to hide. I grabbed my sister and we ducked into our laundry room which didn't have any windows, but did have a door to the backyard. A few minutes later we heard the door handle being rattled and pushed for a few seconds before they seemingly moved on. We stayed in there until we were sure they were gone. It was very creepy that they tried to break into our house, but that still was not the worst event. The final time I spent with Alex, we were in a tree in his front yard. I was not, and am still not, a skilled climber, so I just stood on the lowest branch, which was maybe five or six feet off the ground. I had one hand holding a thinner branch that was above me. The branch was not perfectly above the one I was standing on, so I was leaning forward slightly. We were talking about something, and again, he was doing most of the talking. He made his way around the tree above me, and stopped on the branch I was holding. I wasn't really paying attention when he asked me, Hey, guess what? I just looked out to the street below us. What? I replied. Surprise, he said. I felt him shove my hand off the branch I was holding, and I began to fall forward. I quickly reached my other hand up and grabbed the branch just as I began to lose my footing. I remember looking up and asking him why he did that, and he just said something like he was having fun. I cut our time short and climbed down from the tree. As I started walking away from his house, his mom came outside and asked if we needed anything. She then noticed my face and asked if I was alright. I told her what Alex did, but I did not get the response that I expected. Her face went blank and she just went over to him and solemnly and wordlessly brought him inside. His mom's look read something like, It happened again, and there's nothing I can do. From what I can tell, he was never punished. Thankfully, they moved away, but only a few blocks, and at the end of the school year. But then we ended up moving a few years later as well, so I never had to see Alex again. I truly believe he is going to do something awful someday to someone. Every moment I ever spent with him, I never really felt safe. His lack of understanding or remorse made no sense, even for a boy his age. I especially fear meeting him again someday, as an adult. The story that I'm about to tell you happened when I was 11 years old, and was one of my first times riding the bus without my parents or my sister. So the day this happened, I was coming home from my school. Now I won't say the exact location for privacy reasons, but to get home from my school, I had to take one bus to get over to my street, and then take one more bus to get home. My parents were at work, and my sister had class after school so I would be alone at home for about an hour. I walked down to the bus stop and got on. Now, since it was a weekday, the bus was pretty crowded, 
but I was able to find a seat near the back. I was going to be the last stop, so was glad to have the place to sit. After a few stops, the bus emptied out a bit, and a few of the seats around me, including the one next to me, were free. Then, at the next stop, a man who appeared to be about 40 years old got on. I didn't think anything of it, and assumed that he would sit in the seats nearer to the front, since they were easiest to access. But to my surprise, he looked over to me, walked back, and took the seat right next to me. Now, I was pretty socially awkward, so I wasn't exactly overjoyed, but I didn't want to be rude, so I just sat quietly. At the next stop, the last one before mine, everyone except for him and I got off. Now he hadn't talked to me yet, but I had a feeling that he had been staring at me for a while. As soon as the bus started up again, he tapped my shoulder to get my attention. Stupidly I turned to look at him, and what he said gave me goosebumps. You know, you shouldn't be out here by yourself. Some people are very bad. Then he stroked my hair and said, You'd probably sell for quite a bit. I was horrified. By this time we were pulling up to the last stop, so I picked up my things and ran out of the bus. I had always thought my neighborhood was safe and had never really been taught about these sort of things, but at the time, I didn't really care. I ran to catch the connecting bus and got on just before it left. I took a seat by the window facing the sidewalk and leaned against it, trying to catch my breath. While the bus was driving away, I looked back and saw the man from the bus just standing on the curb watching me with the biggest and creepiest grin on his face. My mom is really good friends with one of the wealthiest people in our town. They have a daughter, my age. I don't have a crush on her or anything, but my mom had pushed me to ask her out before, but I never did. Here's the weird thing about this situation. My mom and this friend, along with her daughter, all kind of act like their friend. Like a bunch of high school girls getting together to gossip. My mom works in a beauty salon, so I guess I understand why she likes to act that way, but it's still pretty weird nonetheless. There was one specific occasion when this woman and her daughter were going to visit New York City. They decided to invite my mom for some reason. I don't understand why. I guess they really were better friends than I had previously believed. But my mom decided to say yes, so it was just me and my dad at the house. But here was the thing. They didn't have a dad at home. Their house was going to be completely unsupervised for the entire weekend. I was in my early 20s at the time, so I guess they thought it would be a good idea to ask if I would watch the house for them, which I agreed to do. I didn't get paid or anything, but they said I was allowed to eat as much food as I wanted, and considering they were rich as hell, I thought, why not? This also gave me an opportunity to write some short stories. I think it was that Friday night when I was watching their house. They told me they had two cats, but they were really scared of strangers and I was probably not going to see either one of them the entire night. This didn't bother me. I just had to make sure that they had food and water, which I did. I was chilling at the kitchen table pounding the keys on my laptop on my latest story, when all of a sudden, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked up from my computer to notice the ugliest cat that I had ever seen in my life. Just imagine a hairless cat, but also morbidly obese and cross-eyed. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. Any one of those traits, individually, would have made a cat kind of cute, but seeing them all thrown on one pitiful excuse for a pet made me want to bust a gut laughing. I felt kind of bad for laughing so hard at this girl's cat but it's not like I heard it or anything. That had been a good break from writing, but then I got back into it. I remember being in the middle of writing a really interesting scene. This ghost was abducting the protagonist of the story. It's kind of a psychological thriller with a little bit of paranormal thrown in there. 
It's very spiritual and weird. I'm kind of a weird person. But that scene still sticks with me, because as I was writing it, I noticed something outside. There was a man in a hooded sweatshirt walking around. I sat at the kitchen table, stunned. I didn't know what to do. I felt adrenaline burst through my veins. Fight or flight. Well, I figured that my car was outside, so running wasn't going to do me much good. And after a minute of rationalizing the situation, I had no proof that this person was out to do anything bad. For all I knew, this could have been a jogger. I got up close to one of the windows to watch this man. He seemed to be sneaking around. He wasn't coming toward the house I was in, so I figured that I was at least safe for the moment. But then, I noticed him looking into the window of the house across the street. I can only assume that he was checking houses to see if people were home or not. A few minutes went by, and I could even tell that there were people home at the house he was checking out. By the time he realized, I noticed him do a 180. He was walking in my direction now. I was about to be face to face with this man. I saw him walking across the street and I immediately started to panic. I called the police as fast as I could and told them the situation, but they said it would be at least 20 minutes before anyone could be there. I ran up to the attic to hide. I locked the door behind me. In retrospect, this was my biggest mistake. I should have turned on a bunch of lights and made it obvious that somebody was home. I'm good at thinking, just not in the moment. The house must have looked uninhabited by the time I got up to the attic. I was in the attic for about 10 minutes when I heard a window breaking downstairs. He was inside the house. My heartbeat was in my forehead. He walked around the house for a few minutes. Thud. Thud. I heard the humongous boots marching across the wooden floors. He explored the house for a good while. I was really beginning to wonder where the police were. Typical of them. I heard him get close to the attic entrance, and that was the moment that pushed me over the edge. I started screaming at the top of my lungs that I had a gun. I told him that I would blow his head off if he didn't leave the house immediately. To my absolute shock, he ran away. I watched him run down the street as I looked on through the window. It appeared that this guy was even more scared for his life than I was. The police eventually got there, and I told them the entire story from beginning to end. They said that a couple of people had been reporting this guy in nearby neighborhoods, so this wasn't the first night that he has been doing this. The police explained that this guy hadn't been violent on any of the occasions they had been called to. They said that it was about the seventh time this month that they've responded to a similar incident in a wealthy neighborhood. I guess he's going around looking for any easy way to make money? He hasn't been face to face with any homeowners yet, so maybe he isn't a violent criminal. Just a criminal? I found the entire experience really interesting, yet terrifying. Living through it was probably the most scared I've ever been. My mom, her friend, and their daughter didn't even come back early from their trip after it happened. I thought that was a lame move, but what do I know? For revenge, I ate every single pizza roll they had in the freezer. And if you're wondering, there were three bags of the 90 pizza rolls. I ate 270 pizza rolls that weekend and I have no regrets. I sorely needed them after that borderline traumatic experience with that burglar. I'm 22 years old, and this happened about two years ago when I was still living at my grandparents' house. This was the only scary experience that has ever happened to me, and it was a doozy. My cell phone was on the nightstand next to my bed and started ringing. It was like 3 a.m. To my surprise, the number calling me was the house phone, as in the phone downstairs. I answered, thinking that maybe one of my grandparents had hurt themselves 
but when I said hello, I got no response. I again said, Hello, Grandma, Grandpa. But again, nothing. That's when fear really hit me. I crept down the stairs, and they were really old stairs. They creaked. The whole house was dark, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't petrified of what I would find. The house phone that called me was in the kitchen, and as I reached the bottom step, I was still holding my cell phone to my ear, and whoever was on the other line was still there. I could hear them breathing lightly. I walked through the living room and into the kitchen, my heart beating out of my chest. I switched on the light, and to my relief, nobody was standing there. But at the same time I realized that they must be somewhere else in the house. Or maybe the phone somehow malfunctioned and called the last number dialed or something? No, it was someone in my house. How did I know? Because suddenly they started laughing through the phone. I could tell it was a woman. It was my grandma. I ran upstairs to my grandparents' room, and it was locked. I could hear my grandma hysterically laughing through the bedroom door and through the phone. Panic hit me. I kicked the door open and immediately saw my grandpa shaking my grandma as she sat on the edge of the bed, holding the phone in her hand and laughing maniacally. I have never in my life seen or heard my grandma laugh like that, but it was horror movie material. She abruptly then stopped as she woke up. Both of my grandparents completely brushed it off and told me to go back to bed, but it was so insanely scary that I almost wanted to scream at them. The next morning was like any other. My grandma made me pancakes, and when I asked her about the sleepwalking or whatever she was doing the night before, she just casually said, It happens once in a blue moon. I told her what happened exactly, beat by beat, and she responded, Oh my, that sounds so scary. Yes, grandma. That's a freaking understatement. One time, I drove back to college after Christmas, but before the winter break was over, so I was the first of my roommates to get back to the house that we were renting. Our house was in a pretty isolated spot on the outskirts of a town in upstate New York. I pulled into the driveway behind the house, went to the trunk, and grabbed one of my bags, and then ran inside because I had to use the bathroom so badly. I had been on the road for over five hours. I was inside the house using the bathroom for maybe five minutes. Afterwards, I went back outside to get the rest of my stuff from the car, and there were footprints in the snow all around it. Now, as I said, I was alone in the middle of nowhere. The only set of footprints should have been mine, from where I had gotten out of the car on the driver's side, walked to the trunk, and then walked to the back door. Yet now, there was another set of footprints circling the car, and then leading into the woods at the back of the property. It appeared that the footprints had originally come from the woods as well. I had left my trunk open while I was inside, because I assumed I was alone and nothing had been taken. But someone had seen me arrive. They came out of the woods, circled my car, and then returned to the woods. I grabbed the rest of my stuff, locked my car, ran into the house, and locked the doors. Last year, the day after 4th of July, I went to my favorite lake to go fishing. Occasionally, I would take friends, but more often than not, I went alone. Unless you're fishing in the dark, nothing creepy really ever happens, and you would never expect something creepy to happen either. I went to a very specific spot on the lake where I have always had good luck catching fish. The sun was out, and it was peaceful. Nobody else in sight. That's what I really love about this lake. It wasn't too popular like some others I have been to. I was listening to an audible book, 
when suddenly, without hearing him at all, a man floats by in a little rowboat. I looked over at him, and he is stereotypically creepy, smiling at me and didn't say a word. To break the awkward silence, I said, Hey, I didn't see you there, and then let out a fake little laugh. The man said nothing and just floated by. I brushed it off as he was leaving my immediate vicinity, but was once again taken by surprise when he turned around about 20 yards away and began heading towards me again. He was rowing, so it was gradual, but man, I cannot tell you the creepy feeling that came over me. I thought for sure that he would say something this time, or do something, but he floated by and said nothing once again. I have a short temper, and I got a little pissed off and said, Do you need something, bro? He just smiled at me. After that, I had had enough. Dude, get the hell away from my boat. He stood up and continued his disrespectful stare. After just standing there looking at me like an idiotic psycho, he picked up the small anchor he had on his piece of crap little boat and tossed it behind him into the dark lake. I immediately stood up and started reeling in my line. A few seconds later I put my pole down and started my motor. I looked at him one more time before I blasted away, and this guy was still smiling. I flipped him off and was gone in seconds. Well, that kinda ruined my mood, and I felt pissed off and creeped out, so I decided to call it a day. I have been to that lake 100 times since, and have never seen that guy again. And I better not, either. I might just punch him in the face. I have no idea what his deal was, if he was annoyed that I was fishing in a spot that he liked, or if he was picking a fight. I have no idea. Thinking back on it, though, the whole thing was stupid, and honestly, creepy as hell. About five years ago, my mom started dating a guy she met on a dating site. That part is fine. I had recently started dating this woman who would later become my wife, and we had met online. My wife and I never really liked this guy. We didn't think he was mean or anything like that. Just a little creepy. He was quiet. He kept his eyes closed a lot, and occasionally said odd things, like offering my wife a chocolate, and then popping one in his mouth closing his eyes and moaning as he let it melt in his mouth. One time my wife and I were visiting my mom, but she got called into work, so we waited at her house. Her boyfriend was over, but he spent the entire several hours just hanging out in her bedroom with the door closed. Just before Christmas, my mom and this guy started having difficulties. My wife and I were visiting her for the holidays, and she dropped all of her problems on us, and we listened carefully and told her our opinions and suggested that she would be better off without him. She already had her mind made up though and decided to break up with him on Christmas Eve. We spent the night at my mom's and got up early on Christmas morning to visit my dad at his house. We didn't plan to spend the night at my dad's but we got snowed in, which was actually a nice Christmas surprise. The next day we left as soon as we could get through the snow and my wife suggested that we stop by my mom's house on the way so that we could see if she was okay. My wife just had a really bad feeling about my mom's now ex-boyfriend. My mom's car was in the driveway, but that doesn't mean much because she lives close enough to work that she often walks and it hadn't snowed in her town. She also never locks her door, which drives me crazy. So we let ourselves in. That's when we see blood oozing out of the refrigerator's water dispenser. It had filled up the spill container and was leaking onto the floor and had made a puddle. My wife screamed and I freaked out. I fully expected to see my mom's head in the freezer. I nervously opened the freezer to find a bag of frozen cherries that had been opened, crammed into the freezer so that it fell onto the ice dispenser and melted. I thought my mom was decapitated by her creepy ex-boyfriend.
A few years back, I lived with my mother and German Shepherd in a two-bedroom rented town home. I got home from work one day and went about my daily routine. When it came time to eat dinner, I knocked on my mom's door to come and eat. I smelled cigarette smoke and heard her grunt a response, so I went back down and ate alone. Fast forward to about 2 a.m. I am awoken by someone holding my hand and gently shaking it. I immediately shoot straight up and look around. My dog, who is overly protective and sleeps with me every single night, isn't in bed. She isn't even in the room. She most definitely was on my bed when I went to sleep. I sleep with the bedroom door shut and locked. She is scratching at my closed and locked bedroom door from the hallway. Frantic, I bolt for the door, let her in, and she is searching the whole room. I'm now yelling for my mother. No answer. I force my dog to walk down the hallway with me. I still smell cigarette smoke. I bang on my mom's door. No answer. So I just open it, and she isn't even home. The bed is made, and her TV is off. My dog and I search the entire house, and nothing is out of place. All the doors and windows are still locked. I was freaked out, to say the least. The next day, I called my mom, and she told me she left early the day before to go visit my sick grandfather. Who was holding my hand that night? Your guess is as good as mine. I used to have a penchant for wandering around abandoned buildings when I was in high school. One time a friend and I decided that it would be a good idea to explore a farmstead that hadn't been in use for years. The whole experience was really bizarre. The farmstead was accessible by a long gravel road that brought you to a cluster of dilapidated buildings around a central barn. We parked at the end of the gravel road near the turnoff to the main road so we could walk around the property and just pull out quickly later. We went into the barn first, and there were deer bones arranged in a circle around the skull and a bunch of blankets and wood stacked in a corner of the room. We thought it was really cultish and weird, so we left and started walking back to the car. Halfway down the gravel road, we heard crunching heavy footsteps and someone screeching behind us, blood-curdling screeching. We sprinted back to my car and tried to peel out of there as fast as possible, but it had snowed the night prior, and my back tire was stuck in a puddle of melted snow. My friend was screaming because she was so freaked out, but wouldn't turn to look at the path behind us. By the time I had gotten the car unstuck, she turned around to see if there was someone following us, and there was no one there. It could have been a bird or something, but we both swear up and down to this day that someone was following us. I really thought I was going to die that day. The most terrifying night of my life happened when I was 20 years old. It was the day before my mother's birthday so I wanted to get her a few things now that I had started working and could afford proper gifts. In the afternoon, I drove into the city to shop. First stop was to get her a nice card, and while I was at it, a balloon that was filled at the store that said happy birthday. Next up was a gift certificate, and on my way out, I grabbed a box of chocolates from our favorite place in the mall. It was early April, so I knew the chocolate would not melt in the car. I got a call from a friend asking where I was and if I wanted to meet up with a few other guys to grab a bite to eat and to see what there was to do, and I said sure. We all met up and ate dinner and thought of things to do, but our town was so boring that we decided to call it a night and go home since it was getting late. The drive home was a 20 minute stretch that turned very dark as I got into the country. Driving on this country road always creeped me out since there was basically no shoulder and there were always animals running back and forth. It was also pitch black at night, with only your headlights providing visibility. There were a few street lamps here and there, but all in all, a dark stretch of road that was basically woods on both sides. With very little traffic, you could expect no one behind you, 
and that made the vehicle pitch black inside. As I was driving, I noticed someone moving in my rearview mirror. It was the dark silhouette of a person's head that slowly positioned behind me. I was instantly horrified. Fear hit me like a thousand ice-cold needles piercing my body, and my lungs felt seized. I couldn't even scream. At that young age, I rarely locked my doors simply because I never left anything of value in the car, and the car was very old with no electric locks. I never imagined someone would want to hide in my car, but I instantly regretted not being more cautious, and started to think about what this person wanted, or what they planned on doing to me. I did not think they knew I saw them, but I began panicking as thoughts quickly raced through my mind of my throat getting slit or a gun pressed to my head. I was also ashamed and sickened at how afraid I was. This gave me enough courage to make a move, and I instantly decided to do something. In one swift motion, I yelled like a soldier running into combat and threw half my body behind me, flailing my arms to grab whoever was there. My seatbelt was buckled, so if we struggled and crashed the car, hopefully I would be okay. I was not going to let this person have the upper hand. My arms were frantically trying to grab a hold of hair or clothes or skin, as I can feel the car swerving around after hitting the steering wheel with my thighs. I quickly flipped on my dome light above my head, but there was no one there. My back seat was empty except my mom's birthday gifts and the slow-moving helium-filled balloon that I had mistakenly just assumed was a human head. My grandmother and I had always been very close. She practically raised me, and our houses were five minutes walking distance from each other so I frequently spent the night at her place. Grandma had always been a deeply spiritual person, and she taught me to never be afraid of the energies around us. I never really understood what she meant by that until one unsettling evening. In my nightgown, I made my way to her room to wish her a good night. She was already asleep, so I figured I would just go back to the living room and watch some TV until I felt sleepy. But before I could, I noticed something odd. You see, the windows in her room could only be opened from the inside, and I noticed that they were wide open. Unusual as it was, I brushed it off as her simply forgetting to close them before she went to bed. I slowly crept to her windows, but they suddenly shut close. I stood there for a second, trying to make sense out of the situation. The night was considerably windy, so I thought a gust of wind had been responsible for this. Even though it was a loud bang, my grandma shifted positions underneath her covers. But that was it. I backed away as to not wake her up, still facing the windows. You can imagine my face of sheer terror when seconds later, the windows flung wide open. My eyes widened when my grandma rose from her sleep, and facing the windows, she said, you should leave us alone now. We want nothing to do with you. I panicked, not knowing how or having a proper explanation. My mind just went to thinking it was somehow an intruder. So I ran to her closet and rushed outside with a flashlight and my brother's baseball bat and yelled to whoever was bothering us to go away because I was going to call the police. But nothing. There was nobody around and it was impossible the intruder had already fled the scene. I surely would have seen something or someone, but then I noticed Grandma's dogs weren't barking. The night was quiet. I went back inside and my grandma had already gone back to sleep. Grandma, wake up, wake up. Aren't you scared? I asked. I told you to never be afraid of the energies, she calmly replied. I couldn't sleep a couple nights after that, and sleepovers at her place became less frequent after that night. My friend asked me if I would go to her house after work and feed her dog, as she would not be home until 3am or so. 
I arrived at her house at 8.30 p.m. and got the key that she had left under the mat to unlock the door. Once I unlocked the door, I turned off the alarm and put the key in a white bowl by the door, and I am 100% sure I put the key in that bowl. I fed the dog and played with him for a little while, and then went to lock up the house again and leave. But the key was gone. Just then, the dog started furiously barking and ran full speed out of the kitchen and up the stairs. He just sat there at the top of the stairs growling. The feeling that came over me at the time was so strange. Eventually the dog came down after I called him, and I looked for the key. It was literally nowhere. I ended up finding a spare key that worked, so I just locked the house and left. I told my friend, and she looked daily for about a week, and then one day she said she randomly saw the key sitting in the bowl. This happened a few years ago when I first got my driver's license. I was driving to the country for a friend's birthday. I had worked late, and I had left home for the four-hour drive by myself at seven at night, since all my friends had left before. But I really wanted to be there, so I didn't mind. The area I was driving through was quiet, sparsely populated farm area. It was known to have a few weirdos around, but nothing serious. Either way, I wasn't worried when I set off. I had been driving for ages, just listening to music and zoning out, and I had found myself on a road called Buckets Lane, an 80 kilometer stretch of road that is mostly straight and was absolutely empty at this time of night. At some point, I took notice of headlights in my rear view mirror. It was the first car I had seen in a long time, and although it seemed a long way behind me, it started to catch me fast. I was driving my 20-year-old Ford wagon and was driving about 70 miles per hour, but this guy was coming up really quick. Soon after I saw the car, I started to hear the faint noises of intermittent honking that grew louder and louder as he got closer. He was honking from a huge distance away for no apparent reason. I was alone. I didn't even have phone reception. It gave me a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. I had a strong feeling that this person wanted to mess with me. After a while, this car finally pulled right up on me. I could see that it looked like a black pickup with two people inside. And before I knew it, he was tailgating me and still honking repeatedly. I freaked out. I was trying to wave him around me, but he wouldn't go. I didn't want to slow down, but I couldn't outrun him, so I was sort of stuck. At this point, he started flashing his high beams, which made it really hard to see. And then, he started hitting my rear bumper, really smashing it. I was trying to keep myself together enough to keep my car on the road, but I was dealing with the bumping, the high beams, and the honking that was driving me insane. All this was happening around 70 miles per hour, and eventually, something had to give. I swerved off the road, luckily into an open field, and slammed on my brakes. The car did a full 180 degree turn, and I slid backwards into a small ditch. I checked myself quickly, made sure that I was all in one piece. The car miraculously wasn't damaged, and I hadn't really crashed, so I was fine. I then looked up to look for the truck. It had kept driving, but it was slowing down, and then eventually turned around, drove slowly towards me, and started honking again. I panicked big time. I put the car in reverse for some reason, and slammed down on the accelerator. Big mistake. I just dug the car into the soft grass. The truck was driving into the field towards me. At this point... I realized that this person was potentially dangerous. Before, it could have been just it could have been just someone playing a stupid prank. But now they had run me off the road and were coming back, still honking the horn, obviously not coming to see if I was off. They pulled up close to me, probably 20 meters away, 
and were shining their high beams on me, so I couldn't see a thing. I was still trying to reverse out of this ditch like a moron, and finally decided to put it back in drive. By this point, the honking had stopped, and someone had stepped out of the driver's side door. This person was short and fat, but all I could see was their silhouette, and this silhouette was now walking towards my trapped car. I took a few deep breaths. I was shaking and terrified, and slowly eased the pedal. The car was moving, but my wheels were spinning, and I didn't know if I would make it out. The person moved faster now, and got to my door. I locked it just in time when they pulled the handle, so he then started knocking on the window. He did not bash it, he just tapped on it, really calm and very slowly. I begged my car to move and finally it did. I got some traction and got back onto the road and just floored it. The honking started again and pretty soon I saw the truck was racing to catch up with me. Finally a car came in the opposite direction. I flagged them down by flashing my high beams and this middle-aged woman got out of the car. I was hysterical, but once I stopped, I saw in the distance the lights of the black truck stopped, turned around, and zoomed off in the other direction. Thank God for this woman. She calmed me down and took me to the police station. I gave a statement and everything, but I didn't really see anything but a short fat silhouette and a black truck. So no help there. No one was ever caught, and the sounds of a honking horn will never sound the same again, and always sends a shiver down my spine. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Alabama, close to Birmingham. My mother is the oldest of five children. She has three sisters and a brother. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take my whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all of my aunts and uncles, seven people total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhood. So my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle if they would ever need to. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare, and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off of a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area that they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembers the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide in the woods. The man in the driver's seat of the blue Ford Galaxy dragged a woman's body out of the car and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure that the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, that she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured, and obviously didn't want help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he was dragging her out of the car, so she must have known him. So my grandfather cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush his family home to safety. On the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seats right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see that he had a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they had just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asking him how he was doing and, and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he had just taken his family out for some target practice with the rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continued driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to the spot in the woods. 
there was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming. He killed that lady. He killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived to work, just before my mother and her siblings left for school. My grandmother told my mother to not take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up, and then drive them all to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because there's a blue Ford Galaxy parked at the bus stop. I went on my hike today a little later than usual, starting up the mountain at about 6.30. I had gotten off work a bit later than usual, but that hadn't discouraged me from going on my hike. I love nature. I view my hikes as blessings, as opportunities to really take in the beauty that this world offers. I began the usual route, left at the giant rock and continuing straight for a while before making another left at the large oak. However, when I reached the oak, there was caution tape stretched from another tree to the oak, effectively blocking off the path so that you were forced to make a right. I had never taken a right at the oak tree, and I did not want to today either. I am not familiar with the path, and I may get lost. That thought process is what led me to disregard the caution tape and proceed left anyway. It was then already rounding 7 o'clock. The sun was setting, and I had experience hiking in the darkness and did not hesitate in continuing on my hike. Besides, I always bring my lighter and Swiss Army pocket knife whenever hiking, so I was not all that nervous. I started up the left of the oak and marveled at the gorgeous vegetation that I was surrounded by. The wildflowers, the trees with their blossoming branches, and the insects scuttling around. I was in heaven. As I continued on the trail, I approached an unfamiliar scene. This trail normally continues up and up the mountain to its highest point. One way up, one way down. However, as I looked ahead, I saw a fork in the trail, one way leading left, the other leading right. I had never before seen these two paths. Faced with a decision I was unfamiliar with, I could not decide whether to go right or left. I was not ready to end my hike, so I just decided to make it easy and go right. That was probably one of the biggest mistakes I have ever made. I should have turned back at the caution tape. After maybe a minute of walking on the stray trail, I saw something coming up on the path. As I neared the object, I noticed it was a compass. However, there was what appeared to be blood splattered on the glass casing along with many scratches. The needles were going back and forth, as if running out of control. Instead of turning back, I picked up the compass and placed it in my sweatshirt pocket. I continued on the trail, with nothing worth mentioning appearing for about 15 minutes. Then I saw it. Up ahead in the distance, I saw what appeared to be a golf cart with a large yellow bucket next to it. I came closer and closer, and realized how incorrect I actually was. I can now say that it was a poorly put together shelter, presumably housing a homeless person. When I passed the shelter, I got a good look on the inside. I saw a few scattered sheets of paper, a candle, what looked like some roots, and a few poorly made small brown dolls. I had no interest in exploring the small shack and continued on my hike. 
Twenty minutes go by. I am nearing the top of the mountain. The sun had set, but it was still slightly bright enough outside to see. I reach the top of the mountain and relish the view. I can see the entire city, with a 360 degree view of all of it. Nature is beautiful. I'm getting ready to make my way down and back to the bottom to my car. And then I see him. A man with a thick brownish gray beard, slightly balding and a little bit overweight. He is visibly shaking and mumbling to himself. I assume that this is the homeless guy which lives in the shack that I had come across. Not wanting any trouble, I attempt to pass him, making no eye contact and looking directly down towards the ground. But when we are directly next to each other, he reaches out and grabs me. Looking directly into my eyes, his eyes are crazy and bloodshot. His lips are quivering as he makes out a few words. Return what is not yours. He then reaches into my sweatshirt pocket and grabs the compass that I had picked up along my hike. I reach for my pocket knife, only to find that it is not there. I pull out my lighter and stupidly flash it at him like it's some sort of deadly weapon. He frowns at me, loosens his grip, and begins yelling nonsense at the sky. I sprint, not run, sprint as fast as I can while maintaining safety. I run past the two stray trails, past the caution tape and big oak tree, past the large rock, and finally reach the foot of the mountain. Reaching into my pocket, I grab for my car key and find that it is missing. In heavy panic, I start freaking out. I'm not going to go back to the mountains, but I don't have my keys. I decide just to go to my car and call AAA or something. When I reach the car door, I notice something. My car keys are inserted into the slot on the handle. On the ground, my pocket knife lays, undamaged and intact. What was written on the window scared the hell out of me. It was carved into the glass. I return what is not mine. I was in Puerto Rico for vacation. About half a block from the house I was staying, I see someone on the other side of the street looking through a car. I didn't think much of it since he had the door open. I assumed it was his car, nothing suspicious, and kept walking. I was maybe a half block past him when I glanced back and noticed that he was standing next to the car, curbside, and he seemed to, and he seemed to be staring at me. He was wearing a white shirt, so even though he was in the shadows, I could still see him. It seemed a bit, but I figured that he probably lived there and just didn't recognize me and was seeing what I was up to. I kept walking and made my way down to the beach about another block and a half away. There was a small patch of some old grass, just before some rocks, and then the beach. I stopped on the grass. I wasn't wearing shoes and it felt nice on my feet, and stood under the palm trees for a moment sipping my beer, just kinda looking around, taking it all in. That's when I happened to glance back the way that I came again and notice a man in a white shirt standing near the end of the street. I stood there for a moment, trying not to let him know that I had seen him or that I was feeling uneasy at his presence in any way, and he just stood there as well. I was sure it must be the same man as I hadn't seen anyone else on the street on my walk down. I continued to sip my beer and he continued standing at the corner. He was standing completely out in the open, but it just seemed odd that he was just standing there. I didn't really want to look directly at him, so I couldn't really tell what he was doing. At this point, I was becoming fairly uneasy. I have never been worried about walking around at night, but I had never been in a place quite like this, either. The road that ran along the beach had a few streetlights, the nearest one was just up the beach a bit, 
so I decided to make my way towards it in hopes that whatever this guy was up to, it had nothing to do with me. I walked back to the sidewalk, as I figured it was better to stay where it was somewhat lit, and made my way over to the streetlight, all the while trying not to let on that I am aware of this man's presence and getting a bit freaked out. I got to the streetlight and stopped. I took out my cell phone to try and seem as casual as I could and glanced around and didn't see him anymore. I breathed a sigh of relief and figured that I had just been freaking myself out for no reason and decided to call my girlfriend to tell her what had happened and that I was on my way back. I called her and started walking back towards our street telling her about the guy creeping on me and then I see him. At the end of the street there was an abandoned house. It had no roof, doors, or windows, just walls, and I could clearly see that the man was standing in the doorway. I stopped in my tracks. Oh, crap. He's still here, I said. He was far enough away that he couldn't hear me, but when I stopped, I saw him take a step back into the dark house so I could no longer see him. At this point, my girlfriend was getting freaked out as well, so I turned around and started heading back towards the streetlight. There was another street up just a bit, and I figured I could take that and loop back around to the house. I tried to walk as normally as possible, as to not let on that I was scared. When I got to the corner, I turned left and looked back, and I could see that the man was now coming down the sidewalk towards me. He didn't appear to be running, but he must have been walking quickly because he had definitely gained some ground on me. I turned the corner, and once, and once I was behind a house and out of sight, I told my girlfriend that I was hanging up and that I was going to run. I ran as fast as I could and did not look back. Of course, unbeknownst to me, one of the houses on this street had some rather large dogs, which, once aware of a person running by in the dark, began to bark wildly, scaring me even more. I made it back to the house, unlocked the gate, and quickly locked it behind me. I looked around to see if anyone had seen me, but there was no one in sight. My girlfriend was pretty freaked out, so we locked the doors and shut the blinds and called it a night. I didn't have any more run-ins with any late-night creepers the rest of the time we were there, and all in all, we ended up having a great vacation. It still gives me a little chill recounting this story though. I have no idea what that man had planned if he had caught up to me, but something inside me says it would not have been pleasant. I beg you, I implore you, please, do not go hiking in the woods around Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I know those woods like the back of my hand. I was playing with my little brother among those trees when I was still in single-digit ages, so trust me when I say that something has been changing out there, and not for the better. I first noticed something was horribly wrong during a hike a few, a few weeks back. In early spring, Birds migrate back from the warmer, southern climates to their northern territories, in mass. Thousands upon thousands of tiny songbirds occupy the trees around Mount Greylock during the month of March, each singing a sweet, chirpy song that is, in reality, a bellowed war cry, a call for challengers to step up and knock them off their perch. Yet as I trudged through the previous winter's leaf litter, I couldn't hear a single thing, no birds, or any other animals for that matter, seemed to still call the forest home. This made me nervous for two reasons. One, animals have an uncanny ability to detect dangers that are imperceptible to humans. Their sense of smell and hearing are far superior to our own. If the wildlife had fled the area in such a hurry, or at least refused to return, that could mean something awful was about to happen. And two, areas of woodland turned exceptionally quiet when there is a large predator around. Wood pigeons will become deathly quiet and still, hoping that a black bear or mountain lion will just pass them by. 
Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. But either way, it would be hideously unsafe of me to wander around while one was prowling the area. So naturally, I started making my way back towards my car when something real peculiar happened. I feel I should remind you at this point that I had been playing in the woods around Mount Greylock since I was like seven or eight years old. It's pretty far from where our family lived when I was a kid, but thanks to our bikes, we had a pretty large area to roam when it came to those long summer breaks. Point being, I know those woods really well, but some way, somehow, I managed to get lost. It first came to my attention that I had managed to get myself turned around when I felt my head begin to throb with a dull ache. I stopped walking for a moment, rubbing my eyes and the bridge of my nose to try and massage away the ache. But when I opened my eyes again and looked around, I felt a faint flash of panic running through me. I did not recognize my surroundings, and I cannot understate how jarring that was for me. To be somewhere I had been visiting all my life, only for it to feel utterly foreign to me. I actually had to take a moment to take out my compass just to try and get a bearing of where I was headed. But to my surprise, the compass needle kept slowly moving around. Even when I had got it to sit still on a supposed bearing, it slowly began creeping around again. Now, this was much less of a problem than it might appear. Sure, it was unnerving, but there are ways around a faulty compass. Like, for one, moss mostly grows on the north side of a tree, the side that gets the most sunlight. So that provided an easy way of determining which way was north. At least, it usually would. It usually would. Because as I inspected various tr I realized the sun was hanging in the southern portion of the sky. That, or the moss in the area grew mostly on the south section of the tree trunks. I get that it's not entirely out of the question, but that was yet another detail that just seemed to fry my brain. Nothing made sense, and the less that it did, the more the feeling of pure panic began to bubble up in my chest. But to panic in that situation, in any kind of situation, is to welcome defeat, degradation, and death. I kept myself calm, told myself that there was a rational explanation for everything that was occurring, and walked off in the direction I was almost sure the nearest highway was. It was then that I came across something I had never, ever seen in those woods before. Something that seemed so out of place that it was frankly terrifying. In all the years I had spent roaming those woods with my brother as a kid, I had never seen anything like the old, run-down cabin that stood before me. And I mean it was old, as in there was no way it could have been built any later than the 70s. So just how me and my brother had missed this place was utterly beyond me. The obvious thing to do was to knock on the cabin door, see if anyone was home, and as much as I might find it humiliating, ask for directions. But as I walked closer and closer towards the rustic front door, I felt the most unusual sensation. I put it down to general tiredness. Maybe my blood sugar was low. I'm not entirely sure. But for whatever reason, each footstep that took me closer to the cabin seemed more and more difficult. By the time I was actually bringing a closed fist up to knock on that old wooden door, it felt like something was physically repelling me from it, whispering directly into my brain. Leave this place and never return. Do not look back. Never look back. When I finally knocked, the door creaked open slightly, revealing the dilapidation behind it. Whatever bolts or locks that were on the door had long since been worn away and the inside of the cabin was just as run down and rotten as the outside. It was evidently abandoned, but there was a curious order to the furniture that led me to believe that every so often, the cabin did actually receive some visitors, aside from me. But something in the corner of the cabin drew my attention, 
what I'm about to attempt to describe is, quite frankly, indescribable. I know it was a wooden idol of some kind. A small statuette sat atop of a stone altar, but, and I appreciate that this is intensely confusing to visualize, I could not make sense of what I was looking at. It was like my brain was completely incapable of computing the information my eyes were feeding it. And with that, my headache returned again, along with a kind of anxiety so crushing that I felt like I was going to have a panic attack. Don't ask me how I know, but that wooden idol, a mess of twigs and vines and moss, was a representation of pure, unfiltered evil, and I ran from it. I'm not in the least bit ashamed to admit that I ran like a scared child from that cabin. I ran until I found the highway, ran until I found my car, and drove like a madman until I was safely back at home. I haven't been able to bring myself to talk about what happened to me that day, until now. I tried to tell a hunting buddy of mine once, but the words just wouldn't seem to come out. But please, if you're listening to this, heed my warning and do not go hiking in the woods near Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Back in May of 2012, when I was in my senior year of high school, my school joined up with another school for a trip to the UK. It was honestly the adventure of a lifetime, but there was one night in Scotland that I cannot explain, and I will certainly never forget. We had worked our way through England and into Scotland, and were venturing north into the Scottish Highlands, where we would be spending a few days before returning south to Glasgow to catch our flight back to Canada. It was really nice to be up there, as up until this point on the trip, we had been mostly exploring bustling cities and doing all the usual tourist activities of the UK. So it was nice to spend a few days just relaxing and taking in the natural beauty of Northern Scotland. The place that our tour guide had picked out for us to stay was perfect. It was a resort in this beautiful valley which housed one of the many lakes in the area. Being the off-season, we pretty much had the place to ourselves, and when we weren't out exploring the surrounding countryside, we would be playing soccer in the large field a little ways from the main hotel building, or sitting around the fire pit talking about stupid teenager stuff. There was a girl from the other school that I had my eye on ever since the trip began. Her name was Brooklyn. She was a tall brunette with gorgeous eyes. Pretty much the most beautiful girl 17-year-old me had ever seen. I really hadn't been able to get close to her yet, as when we split off into groups for the day trips, her and I never seemed to end up in the same one. Now that we were on a less structured schedule, I figured this was my chance to get to know her. At first, I tried the direct approach by sitting down next to her around the fire the first night and introducing myself. She said hi, but quickly just blew me off and went back to talking with her friends. Somewhat defeated, I got up to go grab something from my room and rethink my strategy. I don't consider myself to be a terrible looking guy, but compared to Brooklyn, I may as well have been Gollum from Lord of the Rings, so I knew I'd have to try extra hard to impress her. I was suddenly snapped out of my trance with her as I heard a shrieking sound out the window of my room. It sounded like a woman screaming, and it initially gave me goosebumps until I realized what it was. It sounded like the whistle of an old steam locomotive. I figured there must be a heritage railway around here somewhere, since the UK is full of them, but it was odd, as I wouldn't have thought they would run trains this late. I did remember seeing what I thought was a railway track on the other side of the field, near the resort, so it wasn't too out of the ordinary. I quickly forgot about it and made my way back to the fire, and by this point, a lot of the other students had paired off into impromptu couples of the night. Fortunately for me, Brooklyn was sitting by herself on a bench on the opposite side of the fire from most of the other kids. I sat back down next to her and tried to pluck up some courage to talk to her again after my previous failed attempt. She jumped a little as I said hi 
as if she hadn't even noticed me sit down. I apologized for startling her and asked if she was okay. She didn't reply, but I could tell by the way she was looking at the guy across from her, cuddled up with another girl, that she wished it was her over there. We talked for a little bit, and then I asked her if she wanted to take a walk. I had remembered the railroad track I had seen earlier, and figured it would be pretty romantic to get her out of there and watch the midnight freight trains roll by. She somewhat begrudgingly agreed. I don't think she really wanted to go, but I guess she wanted an excuse to not think about her crush and another girl together. It was awkward at first trying to keep the conversation going as we walked, but she started warming up to me gradually as the night went on. We found a spot to sit by the railroad tracks and soon there was a distinctive rumble of an approaching train followed by the iconic two-tone air horn sound of British diesel locomotives. We sat there and watched the train slowly roll by, and just as the last car disappeared around the corner, the clouds in the sky completely cleared, revealing the brightest full moon I had ever seen. We sat for another hour, and no more trains passed by. Brooklyn then mentioned that she was cold, and I have to admit, the temperature had seemed to drop significantly after the clouds had cleared, so we began to get up when she grabbed me and said, What was that? I listened, and far off in the distance, I heard the same shrieking noise I had heard earlier. I was about to brush it off and tell her it was just another train, when it struck me that it was almost 1 a.m. at this point. The first time I had heard it, it was only 9.30, but there was no way that a heritage railway was running a steam train this late into the night. I told her it was probably a coyote or something, even though I have no idea if they have those in this part of Scotland or not, and we began walking back along the tracks toward the road that led back to our resort. It was getting colder by the second, it seemed, which was really weird, as the weather had been so warm just an hour ago, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky to signal an impending storm. As we neared the embankment we had climbed down from the road earlier, I noticed that I could see my own breath in the night air. I turned to look at Brooklyn, and she had noticed the same thing I had. We had better get inside, I said. There's got to be some bad weather coming. Truthfully, I had no idea what was going on, but it was the only reasonable thing I could think to say. Then, the shrieking came again, and it was a lot closer this time. Brooklyn and I jumped and cowered together Scooby-Doo style for a second, which made us both chuckle a little bit at how on edge we were. Then, we heard what sounded like rapid, deep breathing approaching us from behind. I turned around and saw a white cloud of steam maybe 500 feet down the tracks behind us. Emerging out of it was a blue steam locomotive, pulling some extremely outdated-looking freight cars. I thought they didn't use steam trains anymore, Brooklyn said to me nervously. They don't, I quietly replied, while keeping my eyes fixed on the train. Even though there was a fence between us and the tracks, I felt like we needed to get farther away, but my morbid curiosity got the better of me, and I walked a little bit closer to the tracks. I figured it's a train, it's not like it can come off the tracks and hurt me, right? Brooklyn stayed farther back as I approached the fence. The train was approaching fast, and the sound was getting louder. It was a beautifully decorated blue locomotive with the letters CR painted on the tender on each side of what appeared to be some kind of coat of arms. It let out a deafening shriek and the engineer waved his hat to us as the train passed by. We were also blasted with the coldest wind that we had ever felt, which made me finally retreat away from the train tracks. We began to run, since we were now freezing, and by the time Brooklyn and I made it back up the hill to the road, there was no sign of the train anymore, and the clouds were beginning to return as well as the warmth. When we got back to the resort, our tour guide was outside having a smoke. He asked us how our walk had been, and we decided not to mention the mysterious train, but we did mention that it had gotten cold when the clouds had cleared up. 
He looked at us funny, and said that it had been warm and overcast all night, as far as he had noticed. Brooklyn and I said goodnight and went to our rooms. I stayed up a little while longer on my laptop, trying to see if there were any local legends of ghost trains in the area. There were none, which didn't surprise me. It didn't really strike me as a ghost train, though, as the only peculiar thing about it was that it was so outdated and the sudden cold snap as it passed by. From my research, I did uncover that CR stood for Caledonian Railway, and that the engine I had seen was an 812 class, which were built in the late 1800s, and were used in the region up until the 1960s. These locomotives were actually the basis for the characters of Donald and Douglas from the Thomas the Tank Engine TV show, and one of them, number 828, actually has survived into preservation and been, and been restored to working condition. I don't think the restored engine is what I saw that night, though. I doubt it would have been running that late at night. And also, number 828 was supposedly in England at that time, according to Wikipedia. Plus, even if it was number 828, that still doesn't explain the cold snap it seemed to bring with it. I'm not one to jump to conclusions, but I believe that what we saw that night was not from this world. I know that sounds insane, and trust me, it is, but I can't think of any other explanation. It wasn't transparent or spooky looking or anything like what you would expect a ghost to look like. It looked exactly like how I would imagine it had looked when it was still in service. So real and normal looking, yet also very unsettling by its mere presence outside of its time period. I don't believe that the train or its crew had any malicious intent as the engineer seemed rather friendly as he waved to us. I believe it might be the spirits of the old railway men who used to ride on these rails back when the steam power still ruled the world. Brooklyn just pretended the whole night never happened. I don't think it was out of fear of the possible ghost encounter, but rather to stop rumors of us hooking up from spreading. Her and I did talk about it the next morning in private, and she did admit to me that she had heard the whistle shrieking again while she was lying in bed. I was unsuccessful in getting her number though, so after we got back to Canada, I never saw her again, even though we only lived 30 minutes apart. So if you're ever in Scotland near a railway line at night, and the clouds suddenly part, and the temperature starts to fall, be on the lookout for a blue Caledonian steam locomotive and its crew as they ride on into the night, delivering their cargo to a destination likely beyond our world. When I was growing up, I lived in rural Alabama, about 30 miles north of a place called Mount Pinson. There really wasn't anything around, just houses. Nothing like a neighborhood in the traditional sense. No stores, nothing. We had one police officer, and he was pretty friendly. He was my best friend's uncle. He would often let us ride around with him because nothing really ever happened. There wasn't a recorded murder or anything beyond someone being drunk and a public nuisance. He didn't even arrest people for that. He would just ferry them home. We had this lady who was all alone. Her husband had died a few years earlier and she was very lonely. She called this one cop over everything. If some kids were in her yard playing, she would call this cop, saying she was being harassed. She did it because she was lonely and just wanted the company. No one could figure out why she wasn't just nicer to the kids or anyone around the neighborhood. One day there was this new kid kicking around near this little spot that we liked to hang out. It had a nice climbing tree and a rope swing. My friend and I, being interested in this kid, introduced ourselves. He told us stories of living in a big city and how fun it was. We were mesmerized at the time. He taught us some new games to play. We generally had a good time. Unfortunately, his father was a real jerk. 
It turned out this kid was the mean old lady's grandson, and his father had lost his job and went back to stay with his mom while he recuperated. Since the kid was around, she had warmed up a little to us and would invite us over for snacks and stuff. We obliged being kids because we were always down for some free treats. One day, the new kid never showed up to our little spot again. We figured he was busy with his grandma and was just doing other things. A couple of days went by, and my friend told his uncle. His uncle said that he would take a look. He let us tag along because he never imagined anything weird happening. It took about ten minutes to make it up the windy dirt road to her house. It was quicker just to walk through the field. It took maybe two minutes to do. Well, we got up there, and he instructed us to stay by the car, and we obliged. He knocks and knocks. No answer. Their car is there. He knocked again, this time louder. No answer. So he circled around to look in the back. My friend and I decided to try knocking ourselves. It didn't seem like a bad idea at the time. We went up to the door and knocked. Nothing. My friend grabbed the doorknob and turned it, and I asked him what he was doing, and he pushed the door open. We both almost threw up instantly. It was like the smell was a physical force and pushed up against us. It was so vile. You can't even imagine. My friend's uncle made his way around and when he got to the porch, by the smell, he knew immediately what had happened. He instructed us to go to the car and wait. He went inside to look around, and then came bolting out of the house and threw up on the grass. He had tears in his eyes. Not like he was crying, but because he had just seen something that nobody is supposed to see. He went to his car to contact someone. My friend took off, and I went after him. He was intrigued, and so was I. I felt a little more bolder following him in. We tiptoed inside, and the first room was completely clean. Nothing to see. But then, we walked into the kitchen, and saw that the kid was stuffed into the oven, burnt. He had clawed at the glass front of the door and actually scratched it. You could see his hands, his face. It looked like he was still alive trying to get out. My friend and I just sat there in complete shock for what seemed like eternity. It was so surreal. My friend's uncle snapped us back to reality as he came running in the house and grabbed us, screaming, yelling telling us never to disobey him again. He took us both outside, and we just sat there. The entire evening we didn't say a word to each other or anyone. My friend's uncle dropped me off later. I never saw my friend again. The uncle said that he couldn't handle it and went to live with some family members in the city. My family moved a year later. I've never been near that house again. The uncle ended up drinking himself to death because of depression. A farm that was near that house ended up having some sort of infestation, and they lost all of their crops. This weird circle of death seemed to expand around that house. When I was growing up, my little brother, who was three at the time, used to sleepwalk through our house at night. He would walk down to the basement where I slept and crack open my door between 11 and 2 a.m. He would then slowly push it open and shuffle inside. When I would ask what he was doing, he would always stare at the floor and say, Where's mom? I would tell him that she was upstairs, and he would repeat, Where's mom? Each night I would take him back upstairs and lead him back to bed where he would fall asleep. One night, at about 1 a.m., I awoke to hear crying at the bottom of the stairs. I walked out to investigate, 
and he was sitting on the bottom step. I asked him what was wrong, and again he said, Where's mom? I told him she was upstairs, and we should go get her. No, he said, staring at the floor. There's a bloody head following me. What? I asked. He looked up from the floor, stared me right in the eyes, opened his mouth, and let out the shrillest blood-curdling scream I have ever heard in my life. It scared the living hell out of me. It was so loud that the whole family got out of their beds to see what was going on. After that, I had never asked him what he was doing downstairs. I would just take him immediately back to his room. This happened in 1996. I was in my mid-twenties. For quick background and setting, I am a female and I was living with my parents at the time. This was prior to smartphones and I did not have a cell phone of my own. My parents' home was on a residential street in New York State. Blue collar neighborhood, commuting distance to New York City. We lived down the street from an industrial area. A few old factory buildings that blended in with the houses and ultimately led to the town park and swimming pool with the town dump beyond that. A strange mix of comforting suburbia and desolation. If you left my front door, went left down the block, and then hung a left at the first corner, you would be at the small gated entrance to the high school football field. The field was completely surrounded by a very tall chain-link fence with a few gated entrances. This small entrance was the only way to get into the field unless there was an event happening. The field was adjacent to the first of the factory building parking lots. I felt very lucky to be so close to the field because it had a track around it. The track ran directly around the field and separated it from the two large sets of bleachers. This was an old stadium, even in the 90s, and while the home bleachers had been updated to metal years before, the visitor bleachers nearest the entrance were still wood. The track was dirt. It was softer on the knees than concrete, so I liked to nip down there in the morning before heading to my train and do a quick two or three mile run for exercise. I usually had the track to myself in the mornings. Of course, lots of days I didn't make the morning run, so if I got home before sundown, I would head down and run in the evening. The evenings were different, usually more populated. This particular evening, I was really pushing the daylight, but I wanted the exercise. It was summer, so I want to say it was around 7.30 or 8, but getting more toward dusk. There are the usual neighborhood guys playing soccer on the field and three other folks on the track walking or running. A middle-aged man, an older woman, and a woman a little older than me in a pink running suit, or maybe just pink sweats and hoodie. I was feeling annoyed because it had rained and the track was not in great shape, so there were still muddy patches and uneven parts. It was hard to keep your pace when you had to dodge them along with watching for other people. I was wondering if the other people on the track had been there a while. Maybe they would finish up so I could have the track to myself? That would be perfect. I was getting into it, listening to my music, and after three or four laps I looked around to see that the older woman and the middle-aged man were gone. Yes, just the soccer guys and the pink lady now. I was doing my best to keep away from her on the track. The soccer guys started to gather up their stuff and walk off the field toward the gate, at the corner by the old bleachers, dispersing back to their homes. It's just me and her now. I glanced back over my shoulder to see where she was. She was closer to me than I had thought she should be, so I picked up the pace. She can't have much longer. Maybe I'll get my last mile in, in peace, I think. Then... I see she is gaining on me. She's picking up her pace, and I notice she is looking at me. She's looking at me, expectantly, like she wants something from me. Do I know her? I really don't want to get into a conversation right now. 
I go a little faster as I'm passing the home side bleachers. She breaks into a full-on sprint and is suddenly on my left reaching out to grab my arm. I'm startled. We both stop in our tracks and I pull off my headphones. She leans in close and says low and slow, I was going to leave earlier, but you were still here and I didn't want to leave you alone. Oh, great. I back up and start to cut her off and tell her that I'm fine, no problem. But then, she says it. There's a man under the bleachers. At that point, I looked past her across the field, and I see him, sitting under the old wooden bleachers all the way at the back, against the cement wall, kind of blending in. I can make out the grayish hair, beard, and white tank top. He's just sitting there on something. A bucket, maybe? Watching. I can't stay any later, she said quietly. I have to go. Be careful. She starts to walk away. Thanks, I said. I'll walk out with you. Because I have nothing to prove, and I'm going to cut my run short tonight. As we headed out of the gate, keeping an eye on the bleachers, she said something that stuck with me. She looked up at the tall fence around the narrow opening and said, One way in, one way out. She got in her car, we waved, and I headed down the block to my house as she drove off. I told my mom about it and we decided he may have just been a homeless man sheltering under there. I would still use the track while I lived there, but only if there were other people. I always looked under the bleachers. I never saw the man again, and I never saw the pink lady again, either. I did see the soccer guys and the older woman and middle-aged man, and lots of other folks, but not her. When I think back on it, it still freaks me out that I ran past him several times that night and did not notice him. And I wouldn't have noticed him if it wasn't for that nice woman. She purposely stayed with me and made me painfully aware of how often I was running in what amounted to a cage with just one way in and one way out. My grandparents lived on a farm in the middle of Nebraska. They had just gotten married, moved in together, and had their first baby. The baby was only a few months old and needed to be watched, but it was early morning and the cows had to be milked. My grandfather couldn't have done the work alone. He needed my grandmother to help. The labor was easy and only took a short while to be finished, and the baby, my aunt, had been fed a while ago and was sleeping soundly. So my grandfather and my grandmother both went to the barn to milk the cows, leaving my aunt asleep. They finished milking the cows and my grandmother heads back to the house while my grandfather stays in the barn to continue working. But when she approaches the house, my grandmother notices the door is ajar and swinging gently in the wind. She figures it is probably nothing but is nervous just the same. She calls for my grandfather, who reluctantly comes to soothe her nerves. They enter the house together and hear the sound of the toilet flush just ending. It was strange, but farmhouses in this area at this time had rather shoddy plumbing. So while they become more nervous, they remained calm. They then picked up their paces and headed towards the cradle where my aunt was screaming. The light hanging down from the ceiling is swinging violently as if it was just thrown on. My grandmother goes to pick up my aunt and notices a black hair on her white gown. Both of my grandparents had white blonde hair and there is no one around and there is no reasonable explanation for this hair being there. My grandmother becomes hysterical when my grandfather notices the latch to the attic is swinging as though someone had just crawled up inside of it. He goes towards it 
readying himself to open it. My grandmother lunges at him and convinces him in between her sobs to leave instead. They jump in the truck and drive to town. They never found out if anyone was in the house or not. However, a week later, Charlie Starkweather was found less than 30 miles away from their home. He was, I believe, the largest serial killer in America for a short time when these events transpired. My family used to rent a house in town along with my aunt and uncle when I was very young that we eventually moved out because of very strange things that happened while we lived there. But the most memorable and final straw was the night that my aunt was using the toilet and just happened to look down at this small hole in the floor that had been there since we moved in. And she saw a man standing in the basement, looking right back up at her, smiling. My aunt ran out of the bathroom and screamed for my uncle. After explaining to him that there was a man in the basement, my uncle went and got my dad, and they both went down the basement stairs, where they found nothing but footprints in the dirty floor where someone had been standing and moving around, directly underneath the hole. I was super excited to get my first apartment. It was in an old antebellum house that was split into four units. A very cool place to live. However, every time I was taking a shower, I would get this overwhelmingly creepy feeling, like somebody was watching me. Then the dream started. I kept dreaming about this old lady in a pink nightgown. Sometimes she just looked frail and sweet, and she would say that I should go with her. She never said where we would go. Other times, the dreams were terrifying. Her eye sockets were empty. Her hair was greasy, stringy, and falling out. Her mouth was twisted in a tormented scream, and she would frantically claw the air, trying to grab me. The longer that I lived there, the more menacing the dreams got. Also, the feeling of unease and the feeling of being watched in the shower increased dramatically. By the time we moved out, I couldn't close my eyes in the shower. It sounds silly, but I had this overwhelming feeling that I was going to die if I had my eyes closed for too long. After moving out, I discussed all these weird feelings with a friend of mine who had recently moved into a house across the street from the old apartment. I was trying to laugh it off. He said that another friend of his used to live in the apartment above mine several years ago. An old lady died in what used to be my apartment. Nobody else wanted to live in that unit for more than a couple of months at a time. The building recently burned down. The fire started in my old apartment. They still don't know what started the fire. It still creeps me out when I think about it. I remember when I was a kid, one night I woke up in the middle of the night to get a drink of water. I went downstairs to the kitchen and was surprised to see my little brother standing at the back sliding glass door. I stepped out of the kitchen to see what he was doing and found that the sliding door was open and my little brother was talking to what I assumed was himself. As I approached him, I heard him say, I said, no, you can't come in here. Obviously, this was surprising, and since I couldn't see well in the dark, I asked who he was talking to. He turned to me with his eyes half open and said, the man outside. I turned and looked out into the darkness, but I couldn't see anyone. I closed the door and put my little brother to bed and spent the rest of the night confused and scared beyond belief. The next morning my little brother had no idea 
what I was talking about when I brought it up. When I was a kid, I used to ride my bike almost daily to the local library branch a few blocks from my home. One day when I was about eight, I rode down to the library like I normally did, parked my bike by the bike rack near the back entrance to the building, went in and browsed for whatever an eight-year-old boy would read, checked out a few books, and left the library. When I came out, there was a man standing over by the bike rack. I didn't think anything of it, so I just went over to get my bike so I could go home. As I went to get on my bike, he said, Hi, my name is John. Then he asked me, What's your name? I was a stupid kid, so I told him. And then he said, I work with your mom, you know. What is her name again? So again, stupid kid, I told him, and then he said, Well, she wanted me to show you something over there behind those trees. In hindsight, and upon many years of reflection upon this incident, the guy sounds like the most inept kidnapper in history. It's like he was reading from the script of How Not to Abduct a Child. However, it was 35 years ago, and the most education kids got about this kind of thing was just don't talk to strangers. My parents were great, but this was just not something people worried about all that much back then. I was a bit creeped out when he said that my mom wanted him to show me something in the trees, and my radar for this is weird went up. I politely declined the invitation to the woods, and hopped on my bike to pedal home. As I turned away, he grabbed the bar on the rear of my seat to keep me from pedaling away. Now I was scared. I jumped off the back and re-entered the library. I made my way to the circulation desk and asked if I could use the phone. The woman at the desk told me that the phone was not for public use, so I left the library again from the back entrance. The front was always locked. Happily, my bike was still there, and the creepy man was gone. Thinking nothing of it, I jumped on my bike and set off. About a block from the library, I noticed a brown car at a stop sign on a side street. I looked again, and I saw the creep behind the wheel. I realized many years later, and not at this time, that he knew my route home, which means he must have followed me from my house to the library. Whenever I think of this now, it gives me a sick feeling knowing that he could have taken me any time he wanted on my way to the library. I was probably saved by something as random as someone walking a dog or grabbing their mail, and he didn't want any witnesses. I pedaled faster once I spotted him, and he pulled out onto the main road. I was on the sidewalk, and he was following me closely. When my bike sped up, he sped up, all the while screaming and pointing at me. By now, I was screaming too and moving pretty quickly for an eight-year-old on a five-speed, carrying library books. And no, I never thought to drop the books. I quickly turned onto a side street, and he was moving too fast to make the turn as well, and I saw him turn onto the next side street. The side street I turned on led to my street, but there was a hill that I could not pedal up between my street and I. I got about midway up the hill when I had to get off and walk my bike up, he was parked at the very top of the hill, just staring at me. I literally walked right past him, and I will never forget his stare, or the hate in his eyes. I have no idea why he let me walk past him, why he didn't grab me, why he didn't kill me. I got to the top of the hill, got back on my bike and pumped my legs to get home. At this point, my house was less than 500 feet away. He turned his car around and followed me again. I got to my house, dropped my bike, and screamed for my grandmother because she was the one home watching me while my parents were at work. The creep sped past my house and turned down a side street. I never saw him again. My parents called the police when they got home. I remember that the creep drove a Plymouth Duster-type car 
and he was balding and was about 25 or 30 years old. I don't know if he was ever caught, or if he ever hurt any children, his name, or anything. All I know is that I have never gone back to that library. It sounds silly, but it's true. And for the next few years, I walked and rode my bike constantly, looking over my shoulder. And now, I am unbelievably protective over my children. I don't trust anyone easily. I don't trust anyone with my children, and my first reaction to a helpful teacher or coach is what is his or her motive or true intention. Not a day goes by that I don't think about that day, and I wonder not, why me? But instead, why not me? My girlfriend was living with her mother at the time, and there was always this little kid from across the street who would just stand and stare at the house. One day her mom is going to get in the car to go to work, when the kid asks who the old guy is that lives with them, and why he never leaves the house. Her mom is pretty puzzled, and asks, What guy? She was divorced and there were no males living at the house. The kid looks up to the second story window that he is always staring at, points, and says, The guy who was always standing there staring out the window. Kind of scared, her mom replies that there is no guy that lives with them. She said the kid turned whiter than a sheet and just turned and ran. After that, it was like he did everything he could to avoid the house or even look at it. I was in Taiwan one year when I was younger, and had traveled to a busy night market. These are popular gatherings that usually operate in the evening. Nearby I spotted a sign for a net cafe in a five or six story tall building. Thinking I would fire off some quick emails, I walked into the dark, small entrance of the building. The building was older and hadn't been well maintained, but it's not out of the ordinary in Taiwan. The entrance just had a dark hallway that led to a small elevator. I pressed the elevator call button and entered. The elevator was uncharacteristically new compared to the building, but I didn't think much of it. Like some Chinese buildings, there wasn't a fourth floor. It's considered bad luck, since four sounds like death. So it just read, one, two, three, five, six, which was usual. I looked for the floor the net cafe was at, the sixth floor, and pressed the button. It lurched into action quietly and began the ascend. When it stopped, I figured it was my floor, so I instinctively began to step out. Right before stepping out, however, the sight outside the elevator stopped me. It was pitch black, only lit by the light in the elevator. It looked like it hadn't been occupied for decades, with some random pieces of furniture covered with white cloth. It was a small building, so each floor were single occupancy so I could see pretty much the entire floor from the elevator. Thinking I must have gotten the wrong floor, I checked the light, the one that indicates which floor you're on. Strangely, there was nothing. None of the indicators were on, but the floor button to the net cafe was still lit, so I knew that I hadn't gotten there yet. All this happened within a couple of seconds, and that's when I noticed a figure moving in the distance of the floor. It was not very visible, but I could make out what looked like a person dressed in some kind of gown, moving slowly towards the elevator. I was thoroughly creeped out, so I started pressing the closed door button. As soon as I pressed it, the elevator light flickered off. I am this close to pissing my pants, and it's actually kind of freaking me out just thinking back to it. The lights flickered back on under a second, and the door closed. 
the elevator jolted back to life. A few moments later it opened again to the net cafe. I am beyond relieved at this point. I walked out immediately and sat down at a computer. After gathering my wits a bit, I walked over to the cashier's desk and told them what I saw. The girl working there listened and her face turned white, so I asked her if she had heard anything similar. She told me that she had never experienced it herself but some co-workers and occasional customers have brought it up. Basically, the building has six floors, and the fourth floor had a history. Apparently the floor used to be a hair salon of sorts, until one of the employees killed herself there for some reason. She slit her wrists over the hair wash station and died. The store continued operations despite stories of weird appearances. When customers got their hair rinsed, the water would look a little red, like the customer was bleeding. Things like that, and a couple of people reported seeing a figure walking away in the mirror. Naturally, the business closed down a few months later. The building owner tried to re-rent the place out, but never had any luck. Most businesses are quite superstitious, and no one wanted to rent the fourth floor after someone had died in it, even at a very cheap price. Finally, after dropping the price to nearly nothing, a stationary supply store wanted to rent. During the renovations of the floor, however, several accidents would happen. Tools would end up in strange places. A mirror from the previous business shattered when no one was around. And finally, a worker had his hand jammed between the elevator doors when it closed on him unexpectedly. The workers refused to continue working, and finally, the business left, and the building owner finally gave up and shut down the floor. He then had the elevator company come in to replace the panel so that the elevator could no longer go to the fourth floor. Let me repeat that. The elevator was programmed to never go to the fourth floor. It doesn't even have a button for that floor. But for some reason, sometimes when people would take the elevator, it would take them to the fourth floor, and the doors would open, and some, like myself, would see a figure walking around in the dark. When I was a teenager, I was waiting at an abandoned mall in downtown Sacramento to meet a dealer to buy some pot. This was back in the day, so payphones were still functional and in pretty common use. As I was waiting, the payphone in the parking lot started to ring. Keep in mind, it was after dark on the outskirts of downtown, and not another single person was around. Out of curiosity, I walked over to the phone and picked it up. The man on the other line asked, Is this Pete? My name isn't Pete, and so I said no. The man ignored me and said, Pete, I want you to do something for me. I stated again that my name was not Pete. He ignored me again and then repeated, Pete, I need you to do something for me, or I will have to kill you. I laughed and told him again that I wasn't Pete. Finally, he said that he knew for sure that I was Pete and described to me what I looked like. He described me perfectly, down to the color of my pants and what type of hat I was wearing. I immediately hung up the phone and looked around. There was nobody, and I mean not a single person, anywhere. I got into my car and drove out of there as fast as I could. It was bizarre as hell. Someone was watching me from somewhere.
Several months ago, my cat went missing in the woods, and I had to look for him. It was late at night, and the moon was a thin crescent, so the only source of light was my flashlight. I had seen my cat several times, but he seemed to be scared of something. Every time I got close, he would run further away. At a certain point, he got scared of something and ran back towards the house. I started to make my way back and saw a man. He was just standing there, absolutely still. He had black hair and a dark jacket on. I could make out all his facial features, except his eyes, where there just seemed to be a shadow. I called out to him, but he didn't respond. I then said, I can see you, you know, and was greeted with silence. I turned and walked a few steps, and then turned around. The man was a few feet closer. I turned, walked some more, and then turned around again. This time, he was partially hidden behind a tree. I didn't need any more warning. I ran as fast as I could back to my house, where my cat was wanting to come in. I locked all the doors and sat on my sofa until I calmed down. Ever since that night, every few weeks, I hear a noise. Late at night. It sounds like a rhythmic tapping on my window. There are no trees close to my house, and most of the nights that this has happened, it's not windy outside. Every time, I have been scared to look, probably for the better. The last thing that I want to see is that man standing there with no eyes. When I was 14, I went on a cruise with my parents. The cruise honestly was a very cheap one. My parents did not like it. At night there were people in their 20s partying and being incredibly loud all night long, and my parents found it very difficult to relax anywhere other than their stay room. I had more fun than they did, especially because they allowed me to walk around by myself sometimes. I had to be back in my room by 10 o'clock, but from like 8 o'clock to 10, I could pretty much walk around and do whatever I wanted. I tried to talk to a few other teenagers that I saw, but I didn't really make any friends. One night, I was sitting on the top deck, just scrolling on my phone. I wasn't right next to the railing, which was about 5 feet high, but I was about 10 yards away from it, sitting at a table, minding my own business, just enjoying the night air. Honestly, looking over the side of the ship and into the dark abyss of the black ocean at night was the creepiest thing I had ever seen. I looked over the railing a few times on that cruise, and I will never forget what it looked like. It looked like death. Cold, black, lonely death. It was funny, honestly, because during the day, the ocean was bright blue and beautiful, super peaceful. At night, not so much. So as I sit in my chair with my feet up on another chair, I looked up to my left and saw a man and woman walk out of the stairway door and they were obviously very drunk. They were falling over and slurring their words like crazy. I couldn't even understand what they were saying to each other. The huge umbrella that would normally be standing up and positioned into the hole in the center of the table I was sitting at was laying down next to me, next to the table and my chair, blocking my vision from these people. I had to lean back to see them. They stumbled over to the railing of the ship, and immediately my knees became weak at the thought of them falling overboard. I actually thought this was a possibility because of how drunk they seemed to be. Well, they began making out, and I felt uncomfortable watching, so I leaned forward again and resumed scrolling the pictures on my phone. I couldn't hear anything except distant people laughing and partying somewhere else on the ship, and the crashing of the waves below. After a minute or so, 
Out of curiosity, I leaned back again to see the couple. And the woman was gone. The man was still standing there, just looking over the side. I immediately became very aware that that man did not know I was there, and my blood turned cold when I realized at the same time that I was pretty sure he had just pushed her, through her, or did something to that woman. The man then just turned around and stumbled back to the door and down the stairs. After a minute of heavy contemplation, I got up, walked over to the railing, and looked down into the dark ocean. I almost got sick to my stomach as I saw what a horrid and excruciatingly terrifying death it would be to fall into that abyss. Everything was silent except for the waves. I had to leave. I went back to my room early and I told my parents what I thought I witnessed. They did not believe me and they didn't take me seriously. Three days later we left that ship, and I honestly still think about it all the time, and this happened eight years ago. I will never know if that woman fell, or if she was pushed, but I can tell you this, there's no way she walked away in the seconds that I was not looking, and the door made a very loud noise when it was opened and closed. She went into the water that night and I have had a few nightmares of falling overboard myself. I really wish I would have said something to someone else other than my passive parents. Not that it would have helped that poor woman. I wonder often what she was thinking as she hit the water and got pulled under the ship into the freezing cold, dark hell that the ocean is at night. Five years ago, I worked as a CNA at an East Tennessee nursing home. While working there, there was a resident named Helen, and upon getting my hall assignment, I was told by my hall partner that everyone that worked there believed her to be possessed. Right. Whatever. Helen turned out to be one of the more difficult residents, to say the least. She was wheelchair-bound and would scoot herself up and down the hall, muttering to herself, and sometimes without warning, she would attack someone close to her, be it a fellow resident, staff, or visitor, clawing, hitting, kicking, until she was pulled off of the poor person. She did have incredible strength when these attacks happened, and she would growl these deep, guttural growls. We ended up having to keep her isolated in a room alone, with her wheelchair locked to keep the other residents safe. A few months into the job, I switched to night shift on the same hall because the shift differential was a little over a dollar more on the hour. I was told by the night shift nurse that Helen was just as much a handful at night as she was in the day. One night, a new charge nurse had gotten assigned to my hall. In the mornings before day shift started, the nurse had to give all morning meds. I warned her not to interact with Helen unless I was with her. That little bitty old thing? She asked. She can't be more than 85 pounds soaking wet. 87 and a half, I said, and it takes five CNAs to bathe her. She looked at me like she didn't believe me, but agreed to let me know before she medicated her. Right before I started my end of shift charting, the nurse told me she was ready to administer Helen's meds. I nodded, stood up, and followed her to Helen's room, where she lay restrained. I went to get a pair of gloves from the dispenser, but they were empty. I turned to the nurse and said, I'll run to the stock room for a box of gloves. Don't touch her until I get back. I saw the nurse roll her eyes as I exited the room. Coming back from the stock room, I heard cries of help ringing down the hall. The CNA from the adjacent hall was already running towards the sound, and I followed. 
The source was the ever-doubting newbie nurse who had undone the wrist straps of the sweet old lady and was now being clawed at. She had a handful of her hair from the back of her head and was digging her fingers into her throat, which was all scratched up and bleeding. Helen was screaming in a guttural rasp, I hate you. It took me, the other CNA, and another nurse to pry Helen's fingers off of the poor lady and restrain her once again. The nurse from the other hall was cleaning my nurse's wounds while I took down an incident report. She said through sobs that after I left, Helen spoke to her in a sweet voice, told her good morning, and smiled at her. She asked if she would mind helping her to the bathroom. Helen was incontinent and hadn't used a toilet in over a year. The nurse told her that of course she would, and removed the wrist restraints, when Helen suddenly pounced. She cried harder, saying, her voice, even the smell of her completely changed. The nurse had deep lacerations to her throat and was missing a patch of hair. Helen had ripped it from her skull. That nurse quit that night. There were many other instances, too. I became terrified of caring for that woman. The worst happened on my last night working at the nursing home. I was about to leave. I had already clocked out, but remembered that I needed to tell the day shift CNAs about a resident having an out-of-facility doctor appointment that one of them would have to ride with them, too. I spotted them down the hall and called out to them, walking in their direction. I was passing Helen's room, did a double take, and stopped dead in my tracks. Day shift had already gotten Helen up and in her wheelchair. It was in its locked position in the middle of her room, but she somehow had gotten one hand free from the restraint and was chewing the index finger of said hand. It was all a blur. I screamed something. I ran into the room, and the day shift and nurse ran after me. It took all of us to wrestle her finger out of her mouth. She screamed and growled in protest the entire time. Mouth and yellow jagged teeth covered in blood and bits of flesh. Helen had chewed the meat off of her finger. The doctor was called in and he said that he had never seen anything like it, and she would need skin graft surgery. It was more than I could take. I walked out of that nursing home, and never went back. I didn't give any notice. I didn't even call. I remained traumatized by Helen, and I never worked as a CNA again. I'm a long haul driver for a moving company, and my last run will be the last one that I ever drive. I'm in Minnesota, on my way to Portland, Oregon. The first two days driving was fine, a little tight on time, but not too bad. The third day, I will never forget. I had run out of time, and I was not able to find a room to stay at in Montana, so I had to sleep in my truck. It's not a sleeper cab, just a normal box truck. I've done this before, so all was fine. I was in the mountains, and I was the only one parked at this rest stop. I knew that the next town is about 30 miles behind me. It was about 11.30 at night, and I'm getting ready to go to sleep. But then, for what felt like no reason at all, all the hair on my body stood on end, and I froze as I looked out the windshield and there was a man standing about 20 feet away, just staring at me. I sat there frozen for what felt like an eternity. He began to slowly move away, all the while making eye contact as he backed up. Once he was out of sight, I was on edge for another hour or so, constantly checking the windows. I finally became relaxed enough to try and get some sleep, and that was the worst idea I could have had at that time. I was abruptly woken up by this scream. It sounded like nothing I can describe. It was harrowing 
and terrifying. I'm a big guy. I was in my 20s and six foot tall, but this sound woke me up and put me into such a panic and fear that I will never forget. I turned on all the lights in the truck and what I saw, I can never unsee. The man was standing right in front of the truck, completely naked, with blood all over his face. He began rapidly running around the truck, pounding on the doors and trying to open them. I was so terrified I couldn't move. He began to throw rocks at the windows, and they began to crack. This broke me out of my trance of pure fear, and I started my truck. I floored it, trying to get away as fast as the truck would go, but it wasn't accelerating as it should. It crawled forward slowly, and then I realized he had slashed all of the tires. I was trapped in this box with no escape, no cell signal, and 30 miles away from anything or anybody else. I thought for sure I was dead. But there was one place that I might be able to make it to. The restroom. I could lock the door if I could make it, but that was a good 200 feet away, and there was a lunatic with a knife outside. I watched as he kept going around the truck and waited for him to get to the back. That would give me the best chance of getting away. As soon as he was midway up the passenger side, I opened the door and ran like hell. I made it to the bathroom and locked the door right when he slammed into it, and he began screaming maniacally. I backed up to the wall and just waited. I stayed in that bathroom until morning, when eventually the scream stopped, and after a while, someone knocked on the door. The knock was gentle, and eventually a woman spoke. Hello, is anyone in there? This is Montana State Patrol. I was so on edge, I demanded to see her credentials. She slid them under the door, and after examining them, I opened up. She gave me a pleasant smile, and I peered behind her at my truck. There was blood all over my windows. I was taken to the hospital due to dehydration and shock. All is well now, but you better believe I quit that job. This happened four years ago when I was 16 years old. Nothing scary has ever really happened to me apart from this. One night I woke up, needing desperately to use the bathroom. My house was pitch black. Only the vague orange light from the street lamps through my blinds made my room just barely visible. The first thing I noticed is that the air was absolutely freezing. It was winter after all but I didn't realize my house was so poor at retaining heat overnight. The thought passed, and I fumbled my way along the hallway, holding onto the banister as I made my way to the bathroom. I waved my hand, about to pull the string that turned on the light. I pulled it, and then the overly bright light in the bathroom turned on, and I squinted. I did my business, and just as I was about to exit the bathroom, I looked through the slightly ajar door and there was a window I could see at the bottom of the stairs, right next to the front door. The window had a translucent white curtain over it, so I could still see outside. I squinted my eyes to see more clearly. There was someone standing at the window, next to the front door. All I could see was a dark silhouette, but I could tell it was a man. My initial thought was it must be a delivery, but wait... It's four o'clock in the morning. There's no way this is a delivery. My heart began to thump furiously against my chest as I watched. The person didn't move. They just stood there for what seemed like forever, but was really less than a minute. Thoughts raced through my head. As I contemplated my actions, they suddenly just turned and walked away. I stood in place, blinking, and then when my legs finally obeyed my thoughts a few seconds later, I quickly ran down the stairs to check if the door was locked. It was. I pulled back the curtains and peered out the window, but the driveway and street were empty. All I could see was the early morning frosted pavements and orange streetlights. 
Surely they didn't go down the path to my backyard. I sprang into action again and ran to the kitchen to my back door. It was wide open. It was pitch black outside, and I was terrified beyond belief. I ran and slammed the back door as quickly as I could and locked it with fumbling fingers. I then stood there, not knowing what to do next. I strained my ears listening for something, anything, but all I heard was deafening silence. I looked through the curtains again and didn't see anyone. I woke up my mom and she checked the house with me. We never found anyone and nothing has ever happened since. I honestly don't know what to make of this experience, but it was truly something that you would see in a horror movie, and it was the scariest night of my life. I experienced sleep paralysis one time. I was nine years old and in fourth grade. It was the middle of March which meant that the parent-teacher conferences started in my school. I wasn't a good kid. I never did homework and was too hyper in class. My teachers hated me. I knew that they would tell my parents what a piece of garbage kid I was. Therefore, it was always a stressful time. On top of the impending grounding I was sure to receive, my grandmother died the week before. We weren't very close, but at that age, I wasn't accustomed to death. It was traumatizing watching the cancer destroy her. The morning my mom got the call about her passing, she kept my sister and I home from school while she went to deal with the aftermath. My sister had no further experience than I did dealing with it, so she was no help. I got really sick from the stress. My school would be a half day to make time for the conferences without making teachers stay too late in the day. Being that I was stressed and still dealing with my grandmother's death, I ended up taking a nap. For me, that was uncommon because I have had insomnia my entire life. Also, since it was half a day, it was about 3 p.m. and not dark outside, so I could see my entire bedroom. My sister was outside with her friends and my parents were still at work at the time, so I was alone. My bed had all of my school stuff on it, so I was very uncomfortable. With the light from outside, my stress, discomfort, and issues sleeping, I believe I couldn't fall soundly asleep, causing me to wake suddenly. I felt strange. I couldn't move anything besides my eyes. I looked down and saw a woman sitting next to my bed. The woman had brown hair and a bun, a heart-shaped pretty face, and was wearing a faded old tan dress. The dress reminded me of something from Little House on the Prairie. She wasn't somebody I remember seeing before. She was crying and looking down at her hands. Next to her was a wooden bucket full of water and a white cloth floating at the top. She noticed me looking at her and smiled. That moment, it became difficult to breathe. She started reaching up to my face, saying that it would all be okay. I shut my eyes as she wrapped her fingers around my throat. I started to cry. I suddenly woke up and felt normal again. When I told my mom, she didn't believe me. Nobody in all of the years I have told this story has believed me, except for my sister when she experienced sleep paralysis herself. And now that I'm older, I realize that what I went through likely was caused by chronic stress. On April 24th, just a couple weeks ago, my boyfriend and I drove from Minnesota down through Iowa and Nebraska to Colorado for a family emergency. We made a pit stop to stretch our legs and also so I could look for rocks for a little bit. I found a wooded area near a park that had shallow runoffs from the larger river nearby. It was about 6 p.m. 
and I've never been to the area before. So I put on my rain boots and rock hunting gloves, made my way down this little hill and into the woods. This place looked like it had been flooded recently, or maybe some kind of overflow area for the nearby rover, because there was a lot of debris, garbage, and downed trees that were smooth from traveling down the larger river. So I'm walking around examining the ground looking for some rocks, when I see this men's athletic shoe that still had a sock in it. My first thought was, damn, what if there was a foot in that shoe? So I walk up to the shoe to inspect it. Inside, there was what I thought might have been some rocks, twigs, dirt, and leaves. Figured maybe someone stepped in some mud and lost their shoe. And sock? I mean, I've lost a shoe while rock hunting before. It's weird that the sock was still in this one. But who knows, there was a lot of random stuff in the area. I spent about a total of one minute looking at this shoe. So I continue my search for rocks, and a little further this runoff, I see a bone that I picked up to show my boyfriend to ask what kind of bone it was, and how creepy it would be if it was a human bone. I honestly didn't think it was actually a human bone, because I definitely wouldn't have picked it up. I assumed it was an animal bone, and I figured the odds of it being human were slim to none. My boyfriend said, oh, it's probably just a deer bone or something. So I dropped it and kept looking for rocks. I didn't find any, and we went back to the car, and the rest of the details of the trip don't really matter. I think we were in this area for about 30 minutes in total. So fast forward to last night. I was laying in bed scrolling through Facebook and came across this news article from a true crime page that I follow. The title said something along the lines of this. Body of missing person found in Iowa. Cause of death still under investigation. My blood went cold. Having not even opened the article to read the location or any of the details, I just had this gut feeling. I instantly thought of the shoe with the sock in it and the bone that I had seen and picked up just two weeks before. So I click on the article, and as I'm reading it, I see that the body of a person who went missing over the winter was found along the bank of the larger river at the park that I was rock hunting. And the case remains unsolved. I hardly slept last night, because I had this overwhelming feeling that the shoe and the bone might have belonged to that person. I called the police department that was handling the case and explained everything to the dispatch lady. The tone in her voice changed and told me that this case has kept her up at night. She had me send an email with photos I took from the area and Google Maps aerial screenshot where exactly I was. She thanked me for calling and said that the head detective on the case would be getting in touch with me in the next day or so. I can't stop thinking about this whole thing. I really hope that my findings will be able to give some sort of clue as to what happened to this person that I found at the river. You see interesting things working nights as a janitor, such as life-size dolls under the bank president's desk. You learn some hilarious quirks like an official wanting the vacuum marks perfectly parallel on his carpet because he gets upset otherwise. Sometimes you see things you can't quite explain, like the reflection of a dog in a mirror that is never there when you turn around, but shows up night after night. Some things are quite chilling, like when the building music would switch on all by itself as I turned out the lights. Of course, being in empty buildings alone at night made everything take an extra dimension of spookiness. Only one thing really and truly scared me, however, because it was more tangible than Mirror Dog ever could be, and more dangerous. It was a miserable night, with blizzard conditions that are not uncommon in the winter here. The wind was howling, snow was blowing, it was dangerously cold. 
altogether the kind of night you don't want to be out in. My last building for the night was on the outskirts of town, in a quiet business plaza by a large public park. There were no nearby houses, and nothing in that area was open at night. In short, there was no reason for anyone to be out, especially in that weather. This building was not a spooky one, just isolated. I made an absolute habit of always, always locking the doors of buildings I was working on, because even in a safe town, alone, at night, made me feel too much like a target. That night was no different. I know I locked that door, and if I hadn't closed it firmly, the strong wind would have made sure it was closed. I went about my usual routine, turning all the lights on all three floors, and then setting up my supplies. The building had an odd layout, with a sort of bird's nest loft that the boss's office was in overlooking the main floor. I usually started with the loft and headed up there, but realized that I had forgotten something and headed back down. I was distracted, and the building always annoyed me, but I wasn't listening to music and didn't have earbuds in. I was reasonably alert, so I was a little surprised to find the side door wide open with the wind rushing in and snow already drifting up. I froze a bit because there was no reason that that door should be open. I checked the parking lot quickly in case the building owner had for some reason showed up in the middle of the night. No cars but mine. After locking the door, I started searching the building, starting with the basement. I didn't see anyone and nothing was disturbed. As my search reached the loft level, the reflection of the basement lights in the stairwell went out. Then the lights on the main floor went out, and I heard the door bang open and rattle in the wind, so I shut myself in the office and locked the door. Eventually, I admitted to myself that I had to finish the building, or I would likely get fired. So I went out of the office and closed and locked the outside door for the third time that night, turned the lights all back on, and cleaned faster than I ever have before. I should have called the police. Luckily, nothing happened that night, and I never saw anyone. But there's one thing that I'm sure of. At one point that night, I was not alone in that building. This happened to me last summer. My mom and brother went to California for a week to go visit family, so that just left me alone with my dad. I had just taken him to work since his license was revoked, and I went home to take a quick nap before I had to go to work myself. I woke up at around 9 a.m. and started to get ready for work when I suddenly started to hear some noises. I sat in silence, and I heard the sliding glass door which is underneath my bedroom, open. I just stood in my room, confused, and listened. I then heard heavy footsteps coming up the stairs, so I quickly went to lock my door. I backed away from the door, and what I heard next had me frozen in place. All of the cabinets in my parents' room began to violently open and close. This went on for a good two minutes, when it all stopped suddenly. I got down on my hands and knees to try and peek under my door when I heard footsteps approaching. And then, to my horror, I saw a pair of mangled, dirty, gray feet stop at my bedroom door. Whoever this was was not wearing shoes, and it looked like they hadn't in a very long time. I quickly but quietly got up and took the pocket knife off of my desk. I then picked up my phone and dialed 911. When the operator answered, I whispered that someone was in my house. The lady told me that an officer was on their way and asked me to wait on the line. I stayed on the line with the operator, but the whole time I was just waiting for the worst to happen. Eventually, she told me the cops were at my house 
but I had to somehow make my way downstairs to open the door to let them in. At this point, I pulled myself together and let my adrenaline take over. I opened my bedroom door slowly, and there was no one there. I slowly crept downstairs with the knife in my hand and the phone to my ear. When I opened the front door, the cops told me to wait outside. After about ten minutes of looking around, they came back out, and what they said sent shivers down my spine. They told me that they checked every room and possible entrance and found no signs of anyone. They told me to call again if anything else happened. I finished getting ready and went to work. I got there an hour late and I told my boss what had happened, and things went on as normal. Later that night, I picked up my dad from work, and for some reason I never told him what happened. I thought somehow I had imagined it or dreamt it. I knew no one would believe me, and they would assume that I was either crazy or making up stories. It still puzzles me that there was no sign of a break-in. To this day, I'm still confused about what happened, and the experience is burned into my brain. It wasn't until a few days ago when I heard a similar story, which made my blood run cold. I couldn't believe how similar the event was, and now I'm left with more questions. I still live in this house, and I hate it. I'm planning to move out soon, because nobody should be so afraid of where they live. Between the ages of 4 and 12, I was friends with a boy named Jack. Jack was always a bit of a strange kid, but being my neighbor, he was my first friend in life. Jack and I used to play outside every day, whether it was football, going to the park, or even tag in the street. You name it, we did it. One weekend in the summer when we were eight years old, it was a scorching hot day, and two of the kids in our street were having a water fight. Having some water guns in our shed, I thought it would be a great idea to fill one up and join in. So as the day goes on, we are having a great time, and a few other kids had joined in with their water guns. This is when Jack comes out with one of those insulated flasks. Without warning, he hurls this flask at me, but luckily he missed. The flask hit the pavement, and as the water came out, I saw steam rising from the ground. Jack's mom came rushing out of her house and screamed at Jack, telling him to get inside. Being eight years old, I didn't realize just how serious this was. A couple years later, me and Jack went to our local park. When we got to the park, Jack asked me if I wanted to see something cool. He then pulled out a BB gun. Jack said that he got it off of his dad, who said that he could shoot cans with it. But when me and Jack went into the forest behind the park, Jack then started firing at random kids who were playing in the forest with us. I told him to stop a few times but he told me to stop being so boring and continued with his crazy behavior. I then made my way home, where Jack would follow, shooting at me every so often, hitting me in the shins a few times. I told Jack to grow up and then told him I didn't want to hang out with him anymore, in school or after. I continued to see Jack in school who would smile creepily at me and would motion slices across his throat. One day I was in my garden with my cousin playing, and we looked up to Jack's bedroom window, and I saw that with a tie, he had made a noose, put it around his neck, and gestured with it that he was going to hang me, all the while with a sinister smile on his face. Jack became very odd, and with our houses being attached, and us unfortunately having the same back bedrooms, I would hear him hysterically laughing late at night, and would hear bangs on the wall at ridiculous hours. Shortly after I turned 11 years old, Jack and his family moved away, and life was so much more peaceful. I continued to grow up and lived out my mid-teens with great friends, and Jack became a distant memory as I eventually moved away to university. I'm 22 years old now, and when I visited home this past summer, my parents informed me 
that Jack had been admitted to a mental institution after he attempted to kill his mom. This shocked me, and I didn't quite know what to say. But these old memories began to flash back to me, and I recalled the event with the water. My dad actually told me that Jack's mother had told him that the water he threw at me that day was scalding. That day, Jack attempted to throw almost boiling hot water at me. I have no idea what was going through his mind, but I'm glad that he's getting the help that he so obviously needs.